been bad you put smiles on everyone I think of you and of all I should have done you told me the thing would shape all forms of joy place you all from a struggle and a strife, but don't you agree with beating hearts for still alive, there comes a time when all you have is who you love, Struck down in the middle of it, I built up something to destroy. I tried out and I saw that I didn't know what I was waiting for. Mm -hmm. I fell down by the river, I was screaming just to hear a Side, I was asleep into my very soul. Can't play with the pieces of our broken bodies. Can't play with the pieces of our broken bodies. Summer dream, I was lonely, was far from home. And in a stranger's embrace, you can feel all those things that you wish you could feel on your own. And although I've never met him before, I was kneeling just to hear his voice. So he fell down beside me and suddenly I wished I was all alone. Can't 
We'll look back and we'll say. You said don't play with the pieces of our broken body. I did nothing wrong at I said nothing wrong at I meant nothing wrong at I felt nothing wrong, but he cried. Heal me, heal me. He cried. Heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. Can't play with the pieces of a broken body. Snowflakes are coming down. Collapse into water when they hit the ground. I hear the sound of empty streets. Yesterday has gone to sleep. So all that's left is you and me. I can promise you're the only thing I see. Voices in the night. Time is running out of sight. A lonely wind is passing by. Tries to carry all the whispers that it finds. The walls are listening when we talk. Drinking, drinking. making echoes as we walk. There's no one left but you and me. It's like a made up place that only we can see. Hold my hand and hear the words I say. Music down. Okay, somebody gave Mrs. Silver a microphone. Okay, good morning, good morning. We're on? Morning. Good morning and welcome to day two of Love Tutoring at Bet. We have been inundated by really glorious feedback from day one. And it's all centered around this sense of belonging that we've created for tutors. Tutors have been coming up to the room and saying, it's so lovely to feel like we have a place at BET. So thank you to the BET team for inviting us in. But more than that, to be able to bring tutoring out of the shadows and at the forefront of education is what we're doing in this room. And it feels like a very special moment. Our first speaker today is just one of those people. Um, from the first time that I met Fiona, um, with a great big smile on her face, she was pushing the boundaries of what's happening in schools, but always with charm and grace. And so I'm going to hand over to Fiona now for our first session, but I'm gonna tell you that there's a reason why Fiona always wears a pink dress. Okay, so, um, so Fiona talks about the use of technology in the classroom and making sure that uh, technology is in service of outcomes for learners. 
And um, of course, our pedagogy as teachers, our approach to teaching and learning is at the heart of that. But um, Fiona once spoke at a talk and somebody came up to her afterwards and thought, I said, I thought that ed tech was going to be a boring subject. But if a beautiful woman in a bright pink dress can talk about technology, then it's something that I want to learn about. And so, again, it's this conversation around rebranding and taking ownership of what's going on in education today, not waiting for it to be done to us, not waiting to be instructed, but actually taking a lead and being proactive about what students need, what the educators in the class need also, what the families need, and actually bringing helpful solutions that are in service of the people. So, with all of that, thank you so much. Over to Fiona, thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, for such a warm welcome and good morning to you all on this bright and frosty morning. There you go. So we're going to talk this morning about finding your heart as a tutor and about exploring the idea of pedagogical alignment. Um, and I'd really like you to join me in some uh, interactive activities, nothing cringy, don't worry, um, just to really dig into what that means for each of us. Now, just by means of a bit of background, um, I am a, what we might call a portfolio worker. So I work in an, um, mainly with schools and trusts, as Julia said, um, and that's partly about providing professional learning, partly about providing um, support for school leaders, um, and always thinking about pedagogy, the role of digital and leadership within that. I also work a lot with all kinds of people in the education ecosystem, thinking about impact studies and support and advisory, really championing the key role, pivotal role that pedagogy plays in all of this. And then I have an academic role as well as a postgraduate lecturer um, and research supervisor. So all of that comes together in the material I'm about to share with you with two golden threads. One is digital, but the most important one is pedagogy. And this is the book that I'm going to share some um, snapshots of in this session, um, co-written with Professor Peter Twining, who worked very closely with me um, as my supervisor on my own doctoral journey. Um, fantastic, fantastic researcher. And it's got some really, really good um, endorsements there. So I want to introduce this idea of ped tech and why does it matter? Why should we be interested in this? Particularly in this context, an ed tech trade show, that's really, really important. So first thing, historically, when we've talked about education technology, we've had these conversations long, long while ago about all these great tools, let's use these great tools, that's brilliant. And then it's evolved into this space about OK, let's use these tools to support teaching and learning. And that's great evolution. That's brilliant. Now we're evolving globally into this next evolution of thinking about digital technology. And that's rather than thinking about how tools can support our teaching and learning, i.e. tool first approach, we're thinking about what are our pedagogical intentions? What is our educational vision? And then which tools can help us support that? And they might be digital, non-digital, offline, online, doesn't matter, pedagogy first, that's the key thing. It's actually a very subtle distinction, but it is a very specific distinction, isn't it? And it's really, really important in terms of impact. So why does all this matter? Well, educators, whether tutors, classroom teachers, providers, connectors, anyone in a role supporting education is constantly being provoked to do something. There's always someone telling us, do this, do that. You should know about this. You should try that. But, but who is it that defines what that something is that we're all supposed to do when we've got this cacophony of noise coming at us? Well, I just want to unpick this for a moment and I want you to think really deeply about what this means to you. So in the book, in chapter five, we introduce something called the funnels of influence. And this is a, a model. It's a way of thinking about all the different things that influence the way we each personally think about what happens in the moment of practice. So that could be a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds, like right in the moment, all these things influence. So I'm going to take you through this model now. And what I want you to do is conceptualise this as a constantly spinning, constantly evolving funnel of different influences, all coming down to the bottom. So if you have a look at the diagram, what you see on the right hand side is the funnel of influences from the context. So things that would be broadly stable and broadly similar for everybody in a particular context. So that might be things like um, global events, mass media, laws, policies, budgets, economics, the culture in a particular context, what it means to be an, an adult or a child in that space, um, norms and processes and routines and things that are, that are happening that are broadly stable, broadly similar for all of us. 
Now, in parallel to that are the funnel of influences from the self. This is the stuff that is unique to each one of us. And these start right at the moment we're born, possibly even before we're born. It's the environment that we're born into, the home life we grow up in. In that space, what does it mean to be the adult? What does it mean to be the child? What is a home environment? What is this thing of education? Those sort of cultural undertones. And, and they form the language that we hear and we breathe as we start growing up in our very formative years. And then we go to school as a child or we go to some sort of um, different experiences um, as a child and we start to conceptualise these things through that lens. So if you think back to your own childhood years, maybe a teacher or a tutor or an educator, somebody who had a pivotal role in your learning. Now, if you think back to them, there'll be somebody that jumps to mind and there'll be somebody that either was really profoundly positive as a role model, as an inspiration, as somebody who really opened doors for you. Or there'll be someone who had the opposite effect, maybe put limits or restrictions or created a sense of, of shame or humiliation in a learning um, space. What, whichever direction that memory is, that will have had a profound effect on how you now think about what it means to learn, and what it means to educate, what it means to be an adult, what it means to be a child, the power dynamics, all sorts of things there. So as an educator now yourself, you'll either replicate all the things that you felt were great, good and profound, or you'll react strongly against the things that you think were exactly the opposite. So either which way it starts to shape how we see this role of educator and of learner. So that's through those childhood years. So then all of this accumulates and we grow up with this lens and that affects how we see our family in early life, how we go through um, schooling and education systems, what we start to do in terms of employment, different jobs, careers, trajectories, and all of that builds what we call, um, uh, Moll calls, funds of knowledge and identity. So there's those pools of knowledge, those sets of um, ideas that start to shape who we are, how we think, what we see ourselves as. So we've got that funnel of influences from the context, the funnel of influences from the self, and all of those collide together and provide this funnel of influences in a particular situation. And that's a, a moment of practice, that situation. And in that situation, we'll be drawing on specific situational knowledge. What do I need to know in this moment? What's important in this moment? What's not important in this moment? What are the expectations I have of others and others have of me and we have of each other in this moment? And, and who am I in this moment? What's my role? How do I fit with all the other people in this given moment? So as you can see, all of those really big concepts and ideas all fuse together and shape in any given moment what we believe, what we intend to do, what we say we think, what we actually do, and then, of course, how others experience that in different ways. So this is the something <laughs> that I was talking about a moment ago. And all of that shapes what our pedagogy becomes. So when we use that singular word pedagogy, if you imagine all of this complexity coming behind it, and that's just for each of us as an individual. So let's just zoom in a little bit further on this word pedagogy. Because it's used lots, isn't it? In lots of conversations about education, lots of spaces around this show, the word pedagogy is there. But what do we actually mean by this? And it's quite often people will say to me, oh, you're just referring to teaching and learning. Oh, no, 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 no. It's way more exciting than that. So um, think about pedagogy as an umbrella term. And there's all sorts of definitions and, and things in the book if you want to really dr drill into this. But broadly speaking, Pedagogy has been typically used to refer to the role of teaching, but actually, technically, it means the role of supporting learning, which can be the role of teaching, but that is one particular theory on supporting learning, right? But pedagogy is much broader than that. And, of course, it incorporates what we believe, our pedagogical beliefs and our, our individual pedagogical stance. It incorporates all kinds of pedagogical approaches and methods, you know, adaptive teaching and retrieval and space learning and interleaving and all of these wonderful things. And that's what we tend to talk about most in conversations about pedagogy. It also involves um, or incorporates pedagogical intentions, what it is we're trying to achieve in our, in our role or actions. And all of our pedagogical practices are our actions, which can be as subtle as eye contact, vocabulary, body language, how we move, what we're prioritising, all of those things. 
Of course, pedagogy has lots of different pedagogical theories. Um, you know, we hear about Piaget and Vygotsky and Skinner and Levin Wenger and all of these wonderful things. So that sits under the pedagogy umbrella. We have politicised pedagogies, you know, ways that we're either directly or indirectly encouraged to adopt particular practices and methods and strategies. And of course, there's always lots of agendas behind those. There are explicit pedagogies, things we know we're doing in, and intentionally, and there are things that are subtly hidden within what we're doing. We may not necessarily even be aware of ourselves. And there are pedagogies adopted by organisations as part of strategies or visions and values. And there's little things that we do um, in our everyday practice. So actually, this word pedagogy, whoosh, great big umbrella for all kinds of different things. It means that it sometimes becomes one of the most arguably misused words in education because it's used to kind of quite often give a, a sense of credibility to just stuff and actually it's far more specific than that. So let's just have a look at what sits under, conceptually what sits under this term pedagogy and this, um, these four domains here, four domains of pedagogy have come from um, Murphy's innovative pedagogy framework which is part of a huge study um, led by Peter Twining, my co-author, um, back in 2017. And it's a really valuable way of really unpicking and thinking about um, pedagogy. So the four domains. Number one, learners and learning. What do we actually mean when we use this word learning? What is it? And when we talk about learners, what does it mean to be a learner? What does being a learner look like and feel like? How do we know someone's a learner or learning? Domain two, teachers and teaching. <clears throat> what should it mean to be a teacher or tutor or educator? What should that mean? What does it mean to teach, to tutor, to educate? What is that? The third domain, knowledge. And this is a fascinating one at the moment because of all the conversations about knowledge-rich curriculum and all these sorts of things. Like, where does knowledge even come from? Who decides something is knowledge? How is it formed? How is it verified? How is it assessed? How is it, uh, you know... Um, uh, recognised. And, and little examples like once upon a time there are lots of people that thought the earth was flat and that was knowledge, that was a fact. And now there are possibly slightly less people that think the world's <laughs> flat. And now that's a fact. And, and I said somewhere the other day now people generally think it's spherical and there was a geography teacher corrected me with a technical name which is... Oh, you're my hero, thank you. <laughs> One of those. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly that. And, and you know, that, that's thought as a, as a fact, isn't it? And, and where did it go from being flat to, to, to three? Did someone puff it up? I mean, you know, how did that knowledge change? What's, who decided that? Was that one person that was in a very important position? Or was that through a community of experts? Or was that through research? Or was that through visuals and people seeing things? Like, who, who decided that knowledge and, and how and why? So actually, knowledge is a very fluid thing, isn't it? And then finally, the fourth domain um, within pedagogy about this role of schooling, role of education, role of formalised learning. Like, how does what's learned, whether that's individual or collectively, how does going to school or being part of a system or, um, or, or um, accessing and, and working through qualifications, how does that relate to our wider lives? What is the role of an organisation that is supporting education, whether that's schooling or tutoring as a group? What, what is that role? So actually, there's lots in that. So what I'm going to do now, you've been listening to me very kindly jabber on for a while. I want you to unpack this and see what this means to you. And I'm going to give you a structure for doing that. Um, Peter and I in this book set out um, four main theories of pedagogy. It's not extensive. There's loads and loads more theories than that. But these tend to be the main ones. Um, traditional forms of pedagogy where um, learning is seen as something that's extrinsically motivated, maybe by... Um, careers, qualifications, pay, rewards, sanctions, all kinds of things like that. And it's about the acquisition of information to be able to conform within those systems. Um, individual constructivism, which tends to be the one that's subliminally immersed in all the, um, in, in the system um, literature, about where each of us are individually constructing mental models of how things work. It's in, it's in there, it's individual. Um, social constructivism, you know, Vygotsky and Zona Proximal Development, all that stuff, where um, understanding is developed as a shared understanding. You know, we have a conversation, we both leave with the same understanding as each other. The role of dialogue has shaped our collective understanding. Um, and sociocultural 
um, theory, which is about belonging to that shared community of purpose. We, we all have a, a common passion, a common purpose, and we're working collectively together for the purpose of developing that community with, with all kinds of different people in it. What we're going to do is an activity that kind of looks about where you might, where your beliefs might align or not align with some of these. And really key point to this activity, there is no right or wrong answer. You will feel that there is because it's a values beliefs based task, but there isn't a right or wrong answer. So if I could ask you just with your phone to scan this QR code, hopefully those joining us online um, can either scan on screen or use their URL on screen to do this. It will take you to a, um, a form. Thank you. Um, it will take you to a form and on that form, there are four questions. That's all four questions. One question for each of the four domains of pedagogy. So the first question is about views on learners and learning, teachers and teaching, so on. For each question, there are four statements. And I want you to pick which statement is the best fit alignment to how you think things should be. So key there is how they should be, not how they are, not what's in place now, but how you think things should be. And it's just a best fit. It won't be perfect because we're reliant on words. Words are never sufficient to carry our full meaning. Once you've completed the four questions, and I'll give you five minutes or so to do this. Once you've finished the, the four questions, if you click on submit, it will email you your responses and you'll then be able to compare your answers with the, um, uh, with the four theories. And then I'm not going to ask you necessarily to share those answers, but we are going to look at some of the implications of that. There is no right or wrong. You'll feel there is as you go through it, but there is no right or wrong. So I'm going to stop for five minutes. Please take your time to do the activity. If you want to chat about it with someone nearby, please do. If you want to just work through it and reflect, that's absolutely fine as well. OK? Such fun. <laughs> I need a timer for a few minutes. So. Cosmo Chris for teachers.
Hopefully, hopefully you'll now have ac or visibility on a copy of your answers and then what each of those answers um, match to in terms of theory of pedagogy. I'm hoping you've got that. Did anybody get the second email? I haven't had my second email. Are you on, yeah, on screen? Yeah, we also did it. We came up with a list of which you go back to your internet.
Yeah, and then flick between the two. Yeah. And you can work it out. I need you both at every oh, session. Yeah. <laughs> got it, got That's it. That's fair. So if you have a look and see, if it, you've Ooh. got had the. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're after. Three social constructivists and one individual constructivist for the last one. So, so my question was going to be, I, I love it when this happens. Um, was first of all, was anyone surprised about what they aligned I with? What they all individually oh, mean now. It's so. sure. So what it came through. <laughs> Skip back. Did anybody get um, something different for each of the four domains? That's what I was worried about. Something different. <laughs> Did anyone? I, I think I've had a different one for each one. Schizophrenic. Yeah, I think, I, I think I've had a different one for each one. Literally, I had an individual, I had a social, I had a traditional, and I had a sociocultural. So the full, full spectrum. And did anyone have the same for all four? That's really oh, no. Bit of a You're in shock, can't you? <laughs> You're in shock. You've challenged us to our call. Does anyone want to share? Anyone want to share so the online crew can hear you? <laughs> so for the for the first three I got social constructivist. And then for the last one, schooling, I got individual constructivist. But I can't remember the definitions now, so I'm, I'm, yeah. But we can we can circulate yeah, the materials and go back and that was, unpack that. I, I, I don't enjoy these because I look at think well I should be like that, but I'm more like that. But there yeah. isn't a right or wrong. I know. That's really really important because <laughs> these are you know values and belief systems, and culturally we can be encouraged to think of some as better or some as right or other, but there isn't. They're they're, they're four parallel different belief systems. Do you think? You, as you change your or shift your cultural beliefs, your pedagogical beliefs then shift as well? It's a golden question. So um, Peter, my co-author, and I um, discussed this at great length. And it, in some of that, and there are arguments both ways. Mm -hmm. And some of that depends on where we think our belief systems sit and how deep um, they are. Because we can have surface level beliefs that we can change depending on different forms of stimulus or different life experiences or... Um, you know, getting into it before I jump in the plant pot. Um, or forming habits can often change those surface level yeah. beliefs. Um, can you change the deeper, deeper ones that start? It's Kafka and that, isn't it? So it's the, that, the yellow circles and the blue circles. There's lots right. and lots, lots and lots immersed in this. Yeah. So to, to dig much deeper into this, I'm going to encourage you to read the book um, because it will unpack that. But what I want to do with you is take you through some of the implications of, of all of this now. Um, that code, if you want to... Um, photograph it and share it with anybody if you want to use it again if you want just to go back and do this when you can spend longer on it you're very very welcome to do that um, as, as, as many times as you'd like I'll just give you a chance to do that and then what I'm going to share with you I think if I can remember what I've put next on my slides is just a little snapshot of what this typically looks like um, um, across the spectrum of people because I do this activity a lot and lots of different conferences and events um, and all the the colours aren't great in here. And what I want to share with you is the range. Now, don't worry about which theory each of the colours represents, but, for example, for the first domain, um, we're seeing, you know, roughly about half of those who have responded have had one thought, and the views are shared across the others. We're seeing those figures vary for each of the domains of pedagogy. So there's two things to take away there. Any room you go into, any people you work with, we won't have a shared and consistent view on how things should be. And what's this? What's the pop? Where's what, who? Where are these? What's this? <laughs> what's the split? Where's it? Uh, <laughs> where's the population. So who was? Where's the sample? Come the from? sample size. So this is aggregated from all kinds of different pools, um, which is uh, it's it's. Global, what, is it global? Yes. So global. So it, um, it spans across quite a few different um, countries and cultures and contexts. Um, across independent schools, um, across state-funded organisations, across those working with um, learners who aren't part of an organisation, a whole mix of things. I wouldn't worry too much about the specifics. Um, so this data has all been gathered in about the last six months. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the specifics of the percentages because it does vary depending on which group you know, with and, and so on. But broadly speaking, the trends you're seeing here are pretty stable within any group of people. 
Um, it's fascinating, actually, when I go and work in a one school where there's a shared teaching and learning vision, shared values, shared approaches, and you'll still find that same range of beliefs. Um, so it's, you know, it's very um, separate to the system which is, it sits within. But... Sorry, just a question. Have you ever asked students these questions? I love that question. Um, I haven't done this activity with um, very many students, a, a small group um, of sort of secondary age students. Um, but I'm going to take that way as my, my post-bet action to do that, because that's a great... What made you think of, of, um, of that? It's something that we incorporate quite recently in our service, um, just about getting students in question agency. And part of that is getting students to also be aware of what pedagogy is, so that prior to that they have an opportunity to say, what type of learning or teaching would you like if you have the choice? I so love that. Incorporate them to understand, I guess, the abstract purposes to different methodologies. Because you know, I get why you're doing this, and we find it enhances, I guess, the efficacy of your learning. I absolutely love that. That's brilliant. And then bringing closing that gap between what the educator intends and what the students not just experiencing but internalising. Yeah, it's about, I guess, the the, 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 the power. Sorry. Yes, yeah, so, so I guess it's about understanding the power dynamic that can exist in learning environments and trying, in some ways, for students to also be. I guess receiving some sort of empowerment from being like, I know what you'll do, I can then reciprocate it. I think teaching is an important part of learning and encouraging that in students can just be quite easy as asking them what's pedagogy, what, what type of learning or teaching would you like? What does it look like? What does that mean? Yeah. I love that. After this session, can we have some more conversation about this? I'd really like to learn more about what you're doing there. That's brilliant and such an important question to always come back to in any session, isn't it? What does this look like and feel like for the learners that we're all here to serve? That's made my day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to take us to that point, not, not as uh, eloquently, I don't think, as, as, as you've just put it, but this thing about pedagogical alignment, you know, what our beliefs and our ideas and what we want to do, what, what does that mean? How does it translate for our young people? Um, so we're at an EdTech show. I'm going to use some EdTech examples for this. Um, lots of educators um, use all kinds of different tools um, to kind of check on student understanding and student knowledge, often, you know, self-marking quiz tools. And we often talk about the benefits of those, you know, they're auto-marking, they're quick, they give instant feedback, personalised pathways as a result, um, and then we can intervene, you know, to add value to those um, individualised personalised pathways. Sometimes we stop and we think about the, the teaching strategies, the pedagogical approaches they're built off, things around retrieval practice and um, individualised instruction and space learning and interleaving and all these things. The bit we don't really talk about is the fact that those tools are independent, independent, <laughs> I'm making up words now, underpinned um, by individual constructivism, that, that they're built on the belief system that learning is predefined, that we know what a learner is going to learn before they've been through the process, that learning is sequential and cumulative and builds you know like a like a wall over time and that learning is individual it's all happening in one person's head you know without that kind of sense of of, of dialogue and community that's not to say any of that's right or wrong it might feel it to you if it might feel right to you if that's what, what aligns with your belief systems it might feel wrong to you if it doesn't but we don't think about the beliefs that are permeating through our use of these tools oops um i want to give you one other quick example um, and that's around the use of access I'm having trouble today. Accessibility features and tools. And the way that four different belief systems might conceptualize this differently. It's not perfect, it's just to give a guide. So an educator who has a traditional belief system might see accessibility tools as okay, learner X has got particular need, therefore I'm going to give them this tool to help with that. It will usually be predetermined, pre-identified, and usually based on quite a formalised type of need. A, an educator with an individually, an individual constructivist um, belief system might similarly plan those things in advance, but would also identify those as they arise. So I would identify particular needs and then provide that tool to respond to that particular need. But it's very much that existing needs, you know, sort of formalised mindset. A social constructivist um, educator might look at what's happening within the point of learning and identify a particular barrier, maybe that's visual or um, hearing something or cognitive overload or whatever it might be, and then might offer... Oh, thank you very much. It's gin. Um, <laughs> um, and then might offer a particular tool to help overcome that barrier in that, in that point of time, in that moment of learning. But it's the, the need arises through the dialogue, through becoming aware of what their learning need is. 
And then a socio-cultural belief system would just see accessibility tools as part of the community, almost like a, an additional person within the community that's for the educator as well as for the learner, that's for those others who are working with the learner, not just in the specific organi um, organised activity. So one tool, one very simple tool, like a screen mask, screen reader, whatever it might be, can be thought of very, very differently depending on our different belief systems. And that's why when we're in conversation, we mustn't assume conversation about a tool is being perceived the same way with, as the people work that we're with. Um, I just want to give you a quick... Um, oh, thank you, Julia. I want to give you a quick um, example of where this can be quite contradictory. I'm sure it's less so um, in a tutoring context. This is a very common one in a schooling context. Um, where, oops, go back one stage, where um, educators will often talk to me about wanting to encourage intrinsic motivation in our learners, you know, really encourage them to be intrinsically motivated, to want to learn, to be passionate about what they're learning about. Um, and then we'll introduce times tables, competitions or leaderboards or merit systems or, you know, loads of extrinsic motivation. And it's like, well, those work short term, but then going to completely undermine the idea of developing intrinsic motivation longer term because they're built on these embedded strategies about recall and compliance and pace being a priority and about externalised reward systems. That's all underpinned by those traditional behaviourist approaches, you know, rewards and sanctions. So it's, again, dig down into what the beliefs are that underpin the strategies, that underpin the practices. Then we can really see if they're actually aligned with what we're actually trying to do, how we think things um, should be. Oh, so many questions. Um, so you can have a commitment to extrinsic motivation, but if you have a student who is trained in sticker charts, then when you first get him, you may well need to create a process and wean him off those sticker charts. So you, you have to go to where he is, don't you? Um, and the pedagogy, if you're in, your intention really is to serve the child, and, and that process could look like you're using strategies that aren't aligned with your pedagogy because you're in a transition. Absolutely. And, and what, we, what we do isn't always going to be synonymous with what we believe. Ah, oh. So we're going to, over time, what we want to do is bring closer alignment between what we're doing and what we believe is the right thing and what the student believes is the right thing um, nice. for them. Yeah. And, and I think the point you're making there, which is brilliant, is about when students are used to working in one yeah. way gradually moving them to a different way, if that's right for them. If that's right for them. If that's right for them. But this whole concept of an external, um, an extrinsically motivated mindset comes back to two things. One, it's what the learner is immersed with already, because they'll already have ideas about what it means to learn and what it means to be an educator. And secondly, is the ways of working between the tutor and the learner, and what's the alignment in there. And it's, it's matching up this whole process. I think John Hattie, Professor John Hattie, puts this beautifully, about if we use tools that help us to be the educators we want to be, then both ourselves and the tool become more effective. And we know that that has a massive impact on, on achievement. It's so beautiful because there are, I'm so sorry, let me pass you this. No, go ahead. I was just going to remark, it's, it's quite interesting that he says teachers and leaders. Do you think pedagogy is important to leaders as well? Oh, profoundly, profoundly. Leaders of all, um, all contexts, so students as leaders, Educators, tutors as leaders, organisational leaders, group leaders, um, you know, the suppliers and the, the product leaders we've got out here. Because everything that we do that is either directly or indirectly supporting education in some way is ultimately affecting the choices that can be made by the educator or learner at the point of learning. So absolutely. Thank you. Right. Brings us beautifully onto this point. That if we're clear on our pedagogical beliefs and values really clear on those so keep we'll keep going back to them over and over again then we can be really precise in our pedagogical intentions what do we want to do <coughs> and why do we want to do why do we think that's the right thing that means that we'll be able then to seek out and choose and implement the most appropriate pedagogical strategies to help us achieve those things from the evidence base that there is um, available to us and that means the actions that we carry out right down to the individual words we choose, how we look um, when we're working, all sorts of you know, really precise in-the-moment actions. That will mean all of those things are, are aligned. We don't get the contradictory pedagogy, um, 
the, the contradictory pedagogy. And as you rightly pointed out, all of that is ultimately what creates that learner experience. And all of that is what's going to create um, an understanding internalised by the learners that we work with. And it's that internalisation that will really, really impact their learning and their lives, isn't it? Not just the experiences, but the internalisation. So there's lots more on that um, in the book, but I am mindful. I don't know why that's in there. Um, um, I am mindful of time. Uh, yes, no, we're good. So what I wanted to do is just stick with this thread of um, ed tech tools and just share with you a really brief snapshot um, of what happens when we get this right. Um, now, these examples are from school contexts um, um, at scale, um, but I just want to whistle stop tour through some of them. So when we have this beautiful pedagogical alignment between beliefs and values, intentions, carefully selected strategies, and then actions where they've got great alignment. These are the sorts of impact measures that we see, and these are at, at scale. Because what's happening, the reason we're seeing higher attendance, lower behaviour issues, greater progress, greater results, um, all of those sorts of things, is because the student's experience is consistent. It's not being contradicted where a teacher is saying one thing, but the eye contact says something else. It's being consistent. It's meeting... Um, the needs of the students as a, as a collective, so as an individual student and collectively um, as a system. So they're really, really profound things. Um, those particular, uh, no, some of those, um, each one of those actually is from a slightly different study, but um, some of those um, we're going to in a presentation on Friday at 12 in the main teaching and learning theatre that will take you through a huge impact study that they're from, if you want to know more detail about all of those things. Well, I, I'm really curious to know, so... In a school, th this is lovely. But in a in a school, you, th that idea of um, the, your your words are saying one thing and your eyes are saying another. So what you need is cultural alignment in the whole organisation. So is that part of your that must be part of your recruitment process, part of your onboarding process, and then the entire supporting and teacher development all has to be aligned with whatever that chosen pedagogy is. Yeah, exactly so that. it's not a question of right or wrong, but it is a question that alignment is a requirement. Yes. Right. So that that's that's where the right or wrong sits. It's not that we have to it's not that we have to choose the correct pedagogy. It's that we have to place ourselves in a context where we can deliver the pedagogy that's aligned with our beliefs. Exactly that. Right. Beautifully put. So who's making the decision about which of those four to align ourselves with? Thank you, Yukon. Who's making the decision about which of those four um, a school or there is to align themselves with? So they, so they. Oh, sorry. So they tend to be. Um, so in this particular context, it's an organisation-wide journey over a long period of time that is partly done all of those things about involving all of the people working in the organisation, but partly, as, as you're alluding to, Julia, that um, sort of recruitment about bringing people in who are aligned with that. Um, so that over t it's, a, it's not a quick thing to do because it takes a number of years for that kind of natural attrition and uh, re-recruitment and all of those things. And then shaping everybody together so that there is that cohesion. And if it will look different in different organisations. And if you're going to recruit to your alignment, it presumably will, re re will shrink the pool of people that you're going to be attracting. Helpfully. You would helpfully well, yes. shrink it yeah. because you would filter um, I actually had a, I have a case study of this. The school that I worked in was a um, faith school, and we recruited based on ethos. And so lots of other things weren't in place, but there was a really solid, consistent alignment through the whole school. It, it really, really matters. It's really interesting. It really matters. It does, but it does take time. It does take time. Sorry, can I get mic? Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering about when you think what success... Because if, if you go back to the, um, the, the testimonials we were talking about, success yeah. and progress and results does that not turn on or what we see as success relative to the particular pedagogical alignment for instance depending if you have a traditionalist or social culturalist um or constructivist whatever it is what would be success with different for instance if it's traditionalist you knowledge you're passing on then for instance that could be better reflected in results for instance if you're a social constructivist then perhaps results wouldn't, like the grades that people are getting might not necessarily reflect the success of the pedagogy since that is an essential aim. Yep. So yep. how then do we judge the success then of, of, of this whole the entire thing? I just want to co-present this with you. You're asking such <laughs> really good questions. So I absolutely agree with the point you're making. And it's this thing about the evidence iceberg 
And so we tend to find when any kind of evidence around um, education is looking at impact, we focus on that kind of top of the iceberg, you know, what are the numbers, what can we measure? Um, and this kind of slightly over-dependence on quantitative data, you know, that's all measurable stuff um, for accountability measures and all these sorts of things. And actually, we know that the learners in our school, they're human beings, and any kind of measure and any kind of impact is sort of like a stone in a pond, it ripples out, doesn't it, and, and to all the different things. And that's actually what this report covers um, because the headline measures, great for grabbing attention, great for kind of providing some headlines and stats, but the stories behind them are actually the things that are changing, changing lives. And these sorts of things here start to pick up on the, the point you're making. Um, so, for example, um, one of the things the report did is looked at what happens when you digitise um, a, a learning activity, a really simple thing, and we did lots of different versions of digitising a traditional learning activity, like sorting, um, ordering, timelining, whatever. Um, and there was a great statistic that came out of it, something like um, the activities are 23% more efficient when aggregated over time. Like, you know. But actually what was really interesting is the process of digitising made it more efficient the efficiency then developed capacity, and in that capacity, the learners oracy developed. The way that their oracy developed was that they asked higher order questions. The higher order questions led to the development of higher tier vocabulary, and the higher tier vocabulary meant they're opening up opportunities to explore and probe into higher level concepts. So you had much more greater depth learning, and therefore, not only is the attainment rising, but the greater depth, the higher attainer. Um, arising further but it's all through the function of oracy which you can't measure in quite the same way which you know and that's that's that whole social constructivist piece about the the role of talk is the bit that opens up those learning opportunities and there's there's 185 pages of examples like that um, in this study I mean that's just one you know simple role of talk and all those doors it unlocked um, there are others in terms of um, uh, sort of the ways in which um, learners were accessing different types of activities so quite often a learner they'll be doing something and then they'll be thinking okay I'm, I'm a bit stuck where do I go for some help and they might have a a word sheet or a, a worksheet or a, a worked example or a book with the explanation in it or something on screen or some notes so they'll have different places they'll go to find things or they might have a person they're asking but actually sometimes the cognitive load for the learner is then spent thinking where is it where do I go do I ask this question or do I use that sheet or that tool that, and, and a lot of the energy the cognitive load required for learning is simply spent working out where the stuff is um, and so one of the things in this report that say if we have a sort of one-stop shop scenario where all the help and support there you know video short instruction from a familiar educator worked examples that are from their own educators annotation so familiar writing familiar visuals um, uh, success criteria or whatever it might be guidance um, that's just been spoken about and it's, you know it's been captured in there all in one place and has the familiarity of, of the same educator they're used to working with um, then it means the student's cognitive load has got one place to look to find the stuff and they've got an increased capacity to actually immerse themselves in the learning so like real simple things opening up the opportunities but as you rightly say it depends on what, what is impact? What does good look like? What is it we want to, to open up and release here? And it comes back to this wonderful point. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Professor Neil Selwyn, but he uses this great phrase. We're all pedagogical gatekeepers. Every decision that any of us make, all of us make, whatever our role, whatever our context, if it's a decision relating to our role in education, then it is ultimately a pedagogical decision. It might not be a teaching and learning decision, but it is a pedagogical decision. And we default to leaving those gates closed a lot of the time. And what we want to do is think, actually, what's this action I'm doing? How's that opening up opportunities for learners? How's that moving those gates open? And the direction those gates are going in, that'll be different for each of us. Um, but we want to, to think about those gates a bit more. So my three takeaways, and then I must stop talking. Um, first of all, unpack your pedagogy. We did that activity earlier on. Please go back and, and do it again. See if you get the same answers. See if as you reflect on it and think about it, um, you kind of bring to the surface more thoughts of your own. And, and revisit it often. Keep coming back to it. Do it with family, friends, colleagues. Get those conversations going because they're really powerful conversations when you dig into these big ideas. Second one, be really precise. 
So when you're thinking about planning any kind of learning, whether it's for a student, for colleagues, for organisations, when you're thinking about um, any conversation around pedagogy or any of these four domains, be really, really precise. Do you remember that jumble of terms like beliefs, methods, approaches, styles? Of, like which bit are you talking about? Is it a belief? Is it an approach, strategy? Is it practice? Is it politicised? Is it implicit? Is it individualised? Like which bit of pedagogy are you talking about? And then the third one, and this is the most important one, is to what extent what we're intending to do, what we're trying to do, actually being A, experienced, but more importantly, internalised by the learners that we're working with. Because if it's not, then there's no point in us believing it if we're not making it happen in reality, is it? And that's the, the most important point there. I think that's probably a good place for me to stop. I'm really happy to take any um, questions at the finish, but I do have to go in a few minutes to be somewhere else. Um, so just this final thought, and I think it can't be understated enough um, that 2024, as we move forward, it's not just about what we do, it's not just about the roles we have, it's not just about the actions we take, but it's about the choices that we're making for the learners that we work with. So thank you very much for having me and thank you for being part of this session. Thank you so much. Do we, do, does anyone have a go on, Lucy? Yeah, thank you so much. I thought it was so like useful. And I think from a tutoring point of view, um, something that I think links into all of that is that um, understanding that we are um, working in a one-to-one -one way. Learned helplessness, I think, is one of the most important pedagogical kind of, um, you know, things that we need to all emphasise in our own practice and be aware of because there's so much there where if you're working one-to-one, -one, like you said, the, the students are searching for like which resource or which we can be another resource um, differently, like obviously to a classroom with the teacher because there's many more students in the class. So I think um, that was a big thing. And then um, the other thing that I think we hear from, from my hat of um, working with SEN students who are outside of school like and, and struggling to get in, um, we go through this point of, pe of parents saying, oh, we're de-schooling. And I think that when you were talking about the intrinsic and the extrinsic motivation, that's exactly what... It, and when you talked about, um, you know, how we often go against the negative experiences and move to the total opposite end of the spectrum, I think that word of de-schooling, it's not a word that I ever use with, with families, um, but I understand where they're coming from. And I think where you said about the extrinsic and the intrinsic motivations, it's that's what they're doing, isn't it? They're saying, like, that didn't work for us, all these external things and so we have to find the you know the love for learning again and so that really resonated so thank you thank you beautiful thank you any other closing statements or insight yeah Eunice thank you thank you for that and thank you for saying that pedagogy is one of the most misused words in education um, I'm not an expert at pedagogy at all but I just wanted to ask you when you think of pedagogy do you, do you sit it under education or above education if you're looking at it like an umbrella? Like, do, do you think of pedagogy outside of education as well or inside of it? I'm just curious. What a great question. <laughs> what a great question. So you I'm love that. You don't want to leave us. <laughs> I'm going to go full-scale academic on you now and sit on the fence. Um, I think it all depends on what you mean by education. <laughs> <laughs> so schooling from education, right? is I think schooling is a separate concept to okay, education cool. um, because schooling is a particular way of working and a particular system of cool. things and education would be broader than that but if we if we think of pedagogy as supporting learning then that's it depends what counts as learning what counts as education and what the relationship is between those two things because from your presentation I took pedagogy as a way of life like it's everything it's not just restricted to human interaction it's the way yeah. you parent it's the yeah. way you interact at work it's all of it it's it's pedagogy yeah. that's what i took from your presentation oh, yeah. Thank you. that's a great question so a um, room full of people ask great i questions. know that's because we really care that's it why we're shows. here i'm feeling it right feeling it. um so i want to thank you fiona thank you, for, thank you for, for caring about tutoring and bringing your expertise to us i feel like i went to university today um yes except in a pink dress so it's accessible <laughs> it's accessible it's not scary and it's really really wise um for me tutoring because of course there are so many right ways because there are so many right students and so many right tutors. This idea of alignment 
is what we talk about in tutoring as you've got to niche down, right? You've got to be really, really clear who your student is. Who's that person that you can help the most? And creating that through and through understanding of who you are, where you're coming from. That's why in Qualified Tutor we always talk about start with why. And then aligning that with the needs of the student and the family um, and creating a really clear language of how you're going to help and how you are, will consistently help. Daisy, we were, like, we were talking about that yesterday, right? About knowing exactly which student and exactly which goals you are born for and then and then and then nailing that and then like Arthur says smashing it right having that real sense of because because that smash that smash is really it's really alignment it's really I all my energy is going directly from my intention to your needs and I think that that's a really really beautiful thing and the fact that we're all coming from a different place then doesn't become a problem. It actually becomes our asset um, because there's a different student that needs all of us. So those are my reflections on your session. And thank you so much for participating with us. Thank you so much for being here at Love Tutoring at Bet Day 2. And we will be reconvening at Hannah 1045 um, to hear from Selena Samuels. Dr. Selena Samuels created the biggest tutoring marketplace in Australia. So she'll be zooming in. It's the end of her day today. And she will be sharing with us how she built tutoring at scale um, in a really, really complex space. And I cannot wait to learn, to learn from her because she's another awesome person in this great space. Thank you. Thank you. And in a stranger's embrace, you can feel all those things that you wish you could feel on your own. Ooh. And although I've never met him before, I was kneeling just to hear his voice. And so he fell down beside me, and suddenly I wished I was all alone. Pray with the pieces of our broken body. He said, Don't play with the pieces of our broken body. I did nothing wrong at I I said nothing wrong at all. I meant nothing wrong at I felt nothing wrong, but he cried, heal me, heal me. He cried, heal me, heal me. Heal me, heal me. I can't play with the pieces of a broken body. Snowflakes are coming down Collapse into water when they hit the ground I hear the sound of empty streets Yesterday has gone to sleep So all that's left is you and me I can promise you're the only thing I see
voices in the night Time is running out of sight The lonely wind is passing by Tries to carry all the whispers that it finds The walls are listening when we talk Hi, Selena. Can you hear me? Good evening to you.、Uh, I'm not getting any audio from your side. Can you try to? Can you try to? Just repeat what you said. Hi, Selena. Okay.、Um, would you mind? Are you? How is that? You can hear me now. Is that loud enough? Good. I can't hear you. I think there is something going on into this. So, oh, now is now is going up and down. Selena, can you hear us now? Hello. Ah, okay, terrific. So you can hear you can hear us as I speak to you now. A little bit. Okay. How about now? Is it getting better? I'll keep talking, and you let me know when is comfortable. For you, in terms of volume, is it okay? Is it getting better? A bit more. A bit more. It is getting better. Okay. All right. A bit more. Let's go up a bit more. How does it sound now? Is it okay? It's still very quiet. It's still very quiet. Let me just try to. Um, I'm gonna try to do this. And turn up the mic to about max. How about now? Does that sound better to you, Selena? 
if you can just check your own uh, device volume to see if your Mac is also Uh, how about how about this? Oh, now I can hear you. Oh, ho ho! Voila, voila. <laughs> okay. Now what I'm gonna do is I might just tone it down a little bit. Might just tone it down a little bit. Yeah. How how how's this? How's this? Okay. Beautiful. Perfect. All right. Andy. Okay. Uh, Selena, I'm gonna pass over the mic to someone else and. Adrian is here to guide you through the process. I think your session is about to start in about 10-ish minutes. Julia is going to get everyone to come into this room so you'll see the seats start to get filled up. Um, and then we're going to be good to go. Hi there, hi there, Selena. It's Adrian just here. Just If I could just hold you for two, two... Hello there. If I could just hold you for two more minutes. Beavering away in the background, just uh, just making sure the audio is good for you, good for here. Um, so, if you could just tell me what sort of Terrific. time is it? Where, whereabouts are you t this evening or this morning? I'm in Sydney, and it's 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 about um, twenty to ten. Oh, crikey! In the evening. Yeah, yeah. On a very hot night. Oh. It's a very hot night. Oh, here. Hopefully, you've got the air conditioning cranked up and uh, <laughs> all ready to start. I'm just gonna. Not where I am. So if I start to melt, you'll know. <laughs> we'll understand. We'll understand. Well, it's very cold here. I can tell you that. So <laughs> and foggy. So. I know. It's always that weird thing. London weather. Some beer. Um, Tom, are yep. you happy if I let Selena? Yep. Selena, if it's okay with you, we're going to mute you from our room, but please don't mute yourself. Um, and the next person okay. you'll see, I'll leave this camera on here so you can see the room fill up. And Julia will come in, she'll introduce you, and then it'll go, go straight over to you. You're controlling your own slides, are you? Um, so I understand. I I can see a slide up. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to try. Yeah. So, and are you can... you're controlling those your end, are you? Well, I can't. I oh can't right, I understand. Okay. Anything. Do you have slides? Have they been emailed to us? Yes. Yep. Fine. That's I've no emailed problem. them to you. Definitely. Yep. That's great. Hannah's got those, so I'll let, get those loaded up. Um, how will you tell which slide you're on? from your view how can I tell yeah well so I what I'm seeing right now yeah is um the the um love tutoring at bet yeah whatever it is that you've you've probably got on yeah, the screen I'm not right sure now how that's I can't, I can't find I can't, any key on from there well, I can I control toggle. them in the room but I don't know who's controlling them on the on this screen here let me get back to you with that and I'll find out for you. <laughs> okay. Won't be a minute, Selena.
Yes? Is it on? Can't hear it, Tom. I'm so sorry I'm talking across you. I don't mean to. No, it's not. Still can't hear it. No, we're, we're not on Wi-Fi. We have a special pack. Walk with me. Let's leave the past behind. Walk with me. There's something else we need to find. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. So, um, Selena, Dr. Selena Samuels in Australia yes. is just about to arrive on the screen. So, if I could trouble you, please, to come and take a seat, um, then we can get the next session started. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Daisy. with us. Good evening. Good afternoon. What time is it? It's um, quarter to 10 in the evening. Oh, thank you so much for staying up for us. And you've had a really complicated couple of days, right? Did you say, is it Australia? Day? I sure have. But here I am. Is it Australia Day? Was it's Australia Day tomorrow. But what it's the, it's the day we don't really talk about. Oh, complicated. No, you don't say anything. We just don't say anything. <laughs> I don't know. Can we dial back 50 seconds then? Can we just pretend that never happened? We have cups of tea. Do you have a glass oh, of wine? Good. Uh, uh, no, I've, I've got water. I'm, I'm all good. Amazing. So um, the last speaker, Fiona, who you've not had a chance to meet yet, um, she was knocked out by the questions from the group in the last session. And the reason for that is that everybody in this room really cares. Um, and there's been a real sense of moving forward together. There's been a real sense of shared learning over the last day and, and a bit. Um, and so I, I want you to really appreciate that the people in this room are, are here for you and really, really ready to learn from you. And now I'm going to introduce you. So. Hello, hello, good morning. Welcome to our session, second session of day two of Love Tutoring at Bet. We are so proud to be able to invite my good friend, Selena, Dr. Selena Samuels, who um, was one of the founding people in Cluey, which is the biggest tutoring platform in Australia. Um, there are lots of complications with building uh, systems in Australia, education systems in Australia that Selena will probably be telling us a little bit about. But what, what I know for sure is this is a person whose commitment to teaching and learning to improving outcomes for children and for tutoring pedagogy sits right at the heart of everything she does. And so to build out this platform will have been a journey, an adventure that will be combining, as we're all doing at our own levels, combining our commitment to student progress with our need to build interesting, viable businesses that are of service. And from what I know of the people in this room, we are all doing that at our own scale. And so we're each coming with different things to learn from what Selena has to teach us today. Selena, thank you, and over to you. Thank you, Julia. Good morning, everyone. For a bit of context, it is um, almost 10 o'clock at night here, and it's 29 degrees. Um, it's we're having a heat wave in Sydney. It's very humid. It's very hot. It's just weird. I always think this is funny. I know it's cold there. It's hot here. There we are. 
So I will, um, I've got quite a lot of information here. I will speak to it um, rather than read the slides, or I will endeavour to. Um, and of course, I'm very interested in an opportunity to answer questions, have a, a general discussion. Um, and I'll try and be uh, vigilant about time. Julia, do keep me informed if I'm just blathering on. Um, of course, if everybody falls asleep in the room, I can only see a sliver of the room. So if everybody falls asleep, somebody please tell me, because that would be very embarrassing. Good. You're awake. I can see. Arms are waving. Okay, here we go. So I'll tell you a bit about Chloe Learning, because I think without understanding the context, what I say is not going to be perhaps very meaningful. But before I do, just a, a brief introduction. I've been in education um, for over 30 years. Well, actually, I mean, I've been in education my whole life because I was being educated beforehand. Uh, my first gig as an educator was as a tutor straight out of school. And I tremble to think about how little I knew then and how much I thought I knew. But, you know, that's great joy of youth, isn't it, really? But so, I mean, I've always been teaching people. Um, and Chloe is a, a very much larger industrial scale version of, um, of my earliest experiences. So Chloe Learning is Australia's largest online tutoring company. I should I specify we're not the largest tutoring company, but the largest online tutoring company for school students in years two to 12. And that sort of essentially primary and secondary year, year 12 is our final year of school. We also provide online tutoring services for students in New Zealand, which is in, in for years three to 11. They actually, their final year is 13. So that gives you some context. We have built um, platforms for one-to-one -one tutoring and small group tutoring. One-to-one -one is by far the most popular of our services. Um, and we developed the online platform. So we haven't sort of cobbled together Zoom and various other things. It's, it's our own platform which includes audio and video, interactive, an interactive whiteboard and, and all the academic programs. And I'll show you a, a shot of what that looks like. And it was very important for us to make it as user-friendly, as simple, um, seamless, so that students can log on with one link and it, they're in and, and everything's there. Um, we also developed all the curriculum. Um, that is to say all the programs, I should say, probably really not the curriculum because actually um, ACARA, the national curriculum in Australia, and each state in Australia develops its own curriculum. And I can tell you fun, interesting things about the Australian uh, education system at any point if you're interested. Um, and the key is, again, I'll talk about in a bit more detail, is that uh, the, the, the learning programs should be personalised and adaptive and mapped to what every student is doing in class. So we're not... Uh, Students will take their own path, of course, but we are also supporting and, and standing alongside them um, and alongside the school, alongside the parents. None of this should be unusual. All our tutors we recruit and we train and we provide them with ongoing professional development. We match every student with a tutor and we also provide pre-assessment, weekly reports, progress reports written by the tutor, um, individual practice activities, and all our sessions are recorded for revision uh, for students, so that students can access them for our own quality assurance and child protection. So it is quite an elaborate thing, um, and there's a, there's a fair amount of tech involved, as you can imagine. Now, just very quick history. We were founded in 2017 when I started with them, um, although I'm not a founder in the traditional sense, um, launched in 2018 with our first students. We grew 66 times over COVID um, and we listed on the Australian Stock Exchange at the end of 2020, very fast. It was crazy, um, very, very crazy. In the last financial year, we delivered almost 600,000 tutoring sessions and we've you know we've worked with tens of thousands of students in Australia uh, well of families really because they may have multiple children in Australia and New Zealand we've had many many uh well uh, many thousands of tutors over the time and we've cross mapped the curricula across Australia and New Zealand we don't national curriculum in Australia tops out at year 10 so every state has its own um year 11 and 12 matriculation curriculum 
And in 2021, we acquired CodeCamp. This might be familiar to you because CodeCamp operates in the UK as well. Um, and those are technology-based camps after school programs. Now, just to give you a sense, for my role as, a, as the founding chief learning officer, those are all the things that I was responsible for. Um, like any startup and anybody who's ever been involved in a startup knows, it's extraordinary the things you end up doing. And um, luckily I wasn't, I, it was actually not that lean a team, but there was a lot to do. I think the areas that I found most unusual, um, a lot of it of course is familiar to anybody who's been in education. I really have loved working with tutors and, and developing them and making sure we had programs that were fit for purpose and ongoing. And, you know, this is where what Qualified Tutor does. I mean, I, I really, um, I feel very aligned. Also, the partnerships with organisations like universities, we've got an ongoing partnership with the University of New South Wales, um, departments of education and schools and charities. The Smith family is, is one example. It was very, very important and very dear to my heart, although I have to be honest with you, working with departments of education, it's a whole level of frustration. But anyway, that's yeah, for another day, maybe, maybe when we're in person and I've got a drink in my hand. Although, I mean, if you had a drink in your hand, it would be strange, me not so much. Yeah. Um, and then of course, PR, PR and marketing. And that was what I didn't know I would be good at. Um, the PR and marketing side was new, but it's something that I've done a huge amount of. It turns out that I can walk, talk under wet cement and sound bites and all that shebang. Um, it's not that hard when you're an English teacher, really. So that's history. Now, you can imagine, I, I got this from a prospectus. It, it's, it's, it's glossy. Um, it, some of it is deliberately fuzzy. Don't try and strain your eyes. You don't need to change your prescription. <laughs> The, the key point is that there is a plan. <laughs> and I would say this is one of the, the key issues. As you get bigger, you've got, you've got to plan harder. What you can do as an individual, what you can remember when you've got a handful of kids, is it, it just doesn't translate at size. So you have to have a system and you have to have a process and you have to be able to explain it to people. In our case, you've also got to explain it to investors and shareholders and all of that side of things, which is not the fun stuff, to be honest, but you know, you also have to survive. So as you can see, if you you can start anywhere you want, which is obviously the plan, the idea, a circle, hallelujah. But if you start in the top left quadrant, we've got lesson plans, and that was of course really important to make sure that we've got them mapped to the curriculum, but that there are also different pathways that students can take. And I will say that. The categories of our students, if you're wondering who our students are, they're, they're roughly aligned to ABS data, the Australian Bureau of Statistics data in terms of whether they come from public schools, private schools, Catholic schools, um, where, where in Australia they come from, that's all as expected. But we have around about 25% of our students who have a diagnosed additional learning need, um, which doesn't mean, you know, it could be anything. And of course, that all of those are, are spectrums. So just gives you some idea. Then, of course, we had to create the content that would support the plan so that there was material for students to work on with their tutors. We have skilled tutors, of course, very important, very important. Um, all our learning sessions are live. They happen in real time. We're not recording videos that students watch asynchronously. It's all synchronous. Then there's targeted practice, which is, of course, asynchronous, which is linked to the work that students have done in the sessions and to the curriculum. They can, as I said, that we record all the sessions, they can review them. They receive a progress report written by the tutor at the end of every session. Um, we also provide them with data around the coverage of the curriculum, their levels of mastery, to do with how many practice questions they've got right and that sort of thing. Now, that is easier to do for some subjects than others, and we're really working at, on building out more comprehensive um, feedback and mastery data around subjects like English. So that gives you a sense of the, the idea around it and what we're trying to provide. We want to provide more than what happens in an hour session. So what people pay for, they pay for an hour session. We want to provide more 
for students than that what happens in that session. Um, that's what the platform looks like. Um, this is a that's a group session. Well, it's a, it's a simulated group session. The, those those children are not necessarily people who are all in that one class. You might notice that some of them are older than the others. But that is coming from an actual class. Um, and building the group content was very interesting because we had to make sure that up to five students, we have no more than five in a, in a class because research tells us that's the optimal or the, the maximum number, I should say. Um, and it's important to us that all that students are always interacting. They're doing something. It's not a passive experience for them and that they're interacting with one another. Um, so there are quite clear protocols. Every student has their own colour so that when they're working on the whiteboard, the tutor knows which one's doing what. And the students know who's doing what. Um, they also students can, particularly in one-to-one -one sessions, this is valuable, they can upload their own questions. So if they've got a question from school, they're working on uh, an assignment task, they can upload that and the tutor can work with them. So we, we assume that it's not just going to be content provided by us. Those are some of our tutors. And I'm happy to say that I know many of them myself. But I think at the moment we have 1,500 tutors on our books. I don't know all of them, and I wouldn't pretend to, but um, a number of these tutors have been with us since the beginning. So I think the important thing, uh, I mean, Julia touched on this, to me, I've talked about the business side of things and, and the decisions you make when you build a big business, the kind of thing you have to have in place in order to promote it, not just to, to customers, and, you know, I know it always rankles with educators when you call parents customers, but you kind of are. Um, they're also, of course, our students are our customers and it all gets a bit fuzzy there. But I really want to reiterate and, and reinforce that for every tutoring business, education business, if you don't understand what you're trying to achieve you're really not going to get where you want to go, even with an individual student. But the minute it gets bigger than that, the minute you're moving on to the next year and the next year and the next year, you've really got to have a system in place. So there are two things. I mean, obviously, every child is different. And tutoring, far more than classroom teaching, allows you to adapt to the needs of the student, to follow the student's interests, and to be really authentically valuable to that individual, no, no question. But at the same time, I think you have to have a pedagogical approach. And I, I, I believe everybody does have, even if they haven't articulated it to, it to themselves, it's something sort of intrinsic as, as an educator. Now, I have to admit, it took us a while to get to this um, acronym. It was a huzzah moment <laughs> because the ones we had beforehand were a little off putting. But um, we kept coming up and saying, we can't possibly. So with Raptor was one. And I kept saying, you know, that's a bird of prey, don't you? You do know that that's not a good acronym. So now when we got centre, we had to play around a bit. It was a very happy moment. Um, so first of all, we need to understand who the customer is. And by customer, we're talking about student here. What do they need? Generally with Chloe, parents come to us. They will either have a conversation with us. They will enrol online. We need to understand their what they think their child needs. And then, of course, we have to filter that through the lens of our own observations. Um, and I think you'd all agree, parents think one thing, they may or may not be right about their child. But nonetheless, again, we have to be pragmatic. If a, if a parent says to us, my child needs help with writing, and you don't do anything, you don't mention writing in that first session, you don't say anything about writing, they're going to think they didn't listen to me. They're not providing me with the service I need. You, you have even if you know actually yeah well it is writing but actually reading comes first there may be any number of things that you know as an educator but you also need to bear in mind that they have a view and you need to respect it so context is really important we also need to understand any diagnoses that students might have of course where they are up to in their in the courses they're doing we want to match what we provide them uh, with with what they're doing at school, although we can do that in session. So we don't need to know that ahead of time. We can create, we, we can find content, we can search content 
in, in real time. Then we need to evaluate the students' needs, as I said, through the lens of our own observations. We do provide pre-assessments that students can do if they want. Um, they don't always want to, funny that. A lot of kids, of course, go to tutoring because they don't want the sort of pressure of assessment. And we're very mindful of that. Uh, it, took us, it took me a long time to be convinced to do that pre-assessment, to be honest. I felt that we needed to be a zone that wasn't so obviously assessy. But at the same time, for some kids, it's the right thing to do. What we tend to do, particularly with our younger students, is what we call a kickoff activity, which is a way for us to understand where we need to start with, you know, where, to meet the students where they are, where we start, whether the students need some remediation, whether we need to go back um, a year level even and move, move them up to get them to where they need to be, whether we need to extend them. So that's something that's very, very low pressure that gives us quite a lot of insight. Um, and there may be something that we need that just gives us that sign of where they need to be. Then we have needs-based program selection. We select, we will select, we'll start them somewhere. But as I said, tutors can make changes on the go, on the fly, if it turns out to have not been the right thing. Or if, you know, last week we were doing one text in English, this week we're doing a different text, we can make those changes. Um, sequencing is really important, um, more important in some subjects than others. Really important, I think, we'd all agree in maths and sciences, which are much more sequential, perhaps less with English. And by the way, just to, to reiterate, actually, I don't know whether I mentioned this, we do maths and English and senior sciences. We don't do the other subjects. Um, then, of course, the tuition cycle begins. Every session starts with session goals established, co-constructed with student. Um, that, that they have to actually, we keep a record of this so that we can make sure that we we keep going, <laughs> that we know what they've done. It's not just we could have talked for an hour and not have necessarily got anywhere or documented it. Um, it's quite a structured process. There's con continuous assessment, which is, of course, the assessment, both in terms of actually questions being asked during the session, the answers recorded, but that formative assessment with feedback provider, which is just the natural course of any tutoring session, whether it's face to face or not. Um, and we always end with a learning reflection. And this is something that's very much part of our tutoring training to train tutors to, to make sure they leave enough time to allow the student to speak back to them what they've learned. And that measurement is really, really important. Um, it, it's a consolidation for the students as, as well as being a way for us to measure the, the level of comprehension and, and where to next. So that's a really important part. And because, again, we're in an industrial scale, we need to put in place these clear structures. Un undoubtedly, students have been working with the same tutor for years. They probably don't go through that process in very laborious detail. They've probably got their own rhythm, which is absolutely fine but it's important to establish those patterns i think from the beginning for new students then there's the process of review we provide reports to parents we we provide parents with a lot of information because again we're trying to give them more than most schools do um and it's important that we react to the feedback we get from parents as well we give them plenty of opportunities and from students students give us feedback at the end of every session um and that i mean I think, again, when students have been with us for long enough, that they stop doing that. But in the very early days of their, their experience at Chloe, it's important for us to understand how, they, how they're going, of course. Um, and all, all along, there's that educational oversight from the education, the educators at tutors is to make sure that everything's the way it ought to be, that the tutors are managing, giving the tutors feedback. They're randomly sort of, we do quality assurance and... Um, session reviews to give them feedback according to a very clear structure. We have um, lead tutors who do that work, um, who are themselves very experienced tutors, of course. So it's a very human. Um, and the, the idea is that we want to personalise as much as we can within the superstructure of, of a fairly large organisation, as you can imagine. Now, I'm just going to barrel forward. So if anybody has any questions, please actually, feel free to interrupt me. I actually think that I'm really, really glad you paused here because, uh, thank you, my dog. This is a oh. really juicy slide and um, it, it's really relevant to so many people in this room. So if you're happy to pause here for a little bit of Q&A, 
um, or shared, shared insights. I think that would be super. Who would like to kick us off? I can see that you guys were taking screenshots. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, is there anyone who, who but go on. So when you're evaluating uh, a student's needs, if you've got the group of five uh, maximum and you are then determining that they've got different needs, how do you build that in then to the uh, program? Uh, I'm a maths, so that sequential learning is yeah absolutely key. But if you determine that a student needs to work yeah. on fractions and the rest of the group don't, do you then set them some work and go and work with the one or how do you manage that within a group context? Most of our, most of our sessions um, are one-to-one -one sessions. So the group, we do have group sessions, they're mostly the, what we offer with our institutional partners, like the, the Department of Education and, and Smith Family. And they've actually, we know what, where they're up to because we, um, we partner and collaborate with schools. So we don't have that problem. Because I agree, that that's a big problem. No, no, it's it's good, it's good, it's good. Because that way, that way, Helen, uh, Selena can see you. Okay. About there. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Is all right? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can see you. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Yep. Um, so my question actually isn't about this slide. Is I think one of the beginning ones. You said that you matched um, students with tutors, expert tutors. What's the criteria that you're matching them on? Nice. Well, tutors have their own profile. So when they come to us, when they they um, apply for the job and then they're interviewed and we recruit them and there's a certain process, we then work out what levels, obviously, the, their preferences, but where their expertise lies, um, whether they are have the right um, experience, qualifications for students with additional learning needs, whether they are better suited to extension students, and we do that process. Now, there is also a real, some of the process of matching them is going to be based on their timetable as well. So there is, there is the practicals as well. So if a student only can only do a session on Tuesday evening at five o'clock, that will restrict the tutors as well. So it's, it's a combination of what we can practically supply but also the, the skills and the profiles and preferences of the tutors. To me, there's a really strong um, thread coming through of these two things that you're balancing, the practical and then the philosophical, and it's sort of coming through again and again. The industrial and the human um, uh, seem to be coming through consistently. Hi, Selena. Um, I'm a little bit more intrigued about the last letter, E, uh, in terms of educational oversight, because um, uh, your presentation slide, one of the previous slides about your platform really caught my eye. And my question is, um, because for you to operate at scale, uh, the robustness and also the managerial oversight would be very, very key for your organization to keep up your mm -hmm. uh, reputation and have a streamlined mm -hmm. internal ops. So how did you build up that platform and what are the most important um, managerial features that work for you on that platform? That's a really hard question to answer. Um, we built the platform with, I suppose, some design principles of simplicity and clarity um, and usability. Uh, so the idea was that we needed to be really easy for students to navigate and for tutors to navigate so that it wasn't a hurdle, didn't provide any barriers, because already there's a screen. So you want to make sure that whatever else is really that you're using is really easy. In terms of oversight, it's interesting, we gather a huge amount of data. So that's a good Australian accented word, isn't it? What, data. What you, what data. Um, data. <laughs> Data. <laughs> well, we call it data, so I'm sorry about that. Um, it's, <laughs> um, we gather a huge amount of data. So we, we gather something like a thousand different data points in a session. And that will go from who's talking at any one point, who's controlling the cursor, who's, who's really dominating that session. And we can extrapolate a lot of information from that. Um, 
In terms of my oversight, I guess what's important to me is the um, being able to do these reviews of our tutors, making sure that we are reviewing them early on, providing them with feedback, and then reviewing them intermittently with feedback. The feedback is the important part, of course. Making sure that we that we're connecting up again. You know, as Julia said, this that the human with the the machine. So we actually understand how these kids are proceeding. Um, I don't know. Understanding how students are progressing is is a real challenge. Um, and we're we're building out more features and certainly trying to make great put greater structure around formative assessment checkpoints and that mastery measurement is really the goal at the moment which will allow us to have even more oversight of how students individual students are progressing as it is of course we've got a tutor there it's not as if we don't have any insight but also being able to triangulate the data that we we um we, we, we gather there's some... I don't know that I've answered your question. You, you've answered lots of the questions. You can, did you want to follow up? Uh, I just have a follow up because, um, so your platform is in-house build. Is that correct? So uh, how do yes. you, as yes. an organization, how do you balance um, your focus on the one hand for educational services and on the other hand for IT development? Yeah. Um, not always well. <laughs> if I'm really honest with you. I told you you'd love Selena. <laughs> um, I, it, it's um, it's very hard. There was an echo there. Yeah, there's a um, little problem it's a real with challenge. <laughs> All right, it's um very challenging to do that balancing act, um and. We don't always get it right. Um, you will hear from me always that I don't think we put enough emphasis on the educational side of things. Um, and you probably hear from anybody involved in the tech side that tech rules. So there you are. But um, I think there is, from the beginning, that the tech was designed to serve the student. Uh, and and I don't think we've I don't think we've deviated from that too much. But it is always a challenge. It seems to me to tie into the previous session that we just had on finding our pedagogical alignment and choosing the ed tech that serves the pedagogical, uh, pedagogical goals that we've got as opposed to trying to get the ed tech to fit those things. So using the tech to grow the student rather than the student growing because of the tech, sort of. Julie's just having a little bit of a... Uh, absolutely. Yes, nailed, nailed it. it. Nailed it. And that, that's exactly what I was I, I, I absolutely think that's true. Yeah. The tech, tech, and I, I'll talk about technology a bit more, but tech is the connector. And I, that's really what I see. It enables a connection um, at, you know, across great distances and um, it, it provides access. For us, we can match a, a tutor in Hobart with a student in Cairns. And if your geography is any good, you'll know that that's a huge distance. Um, we've got a very large rural, well, Australia is one of the most urbanised nations in the world. So I wouldn't say we have a very large rural, remote, regional community, but we do have a sizable community of, of kids who live in quite remote areas. And every year, NAPLAN, our benchmarking assessments in years three, five, seven, and nine, tell us that the, the biggest distinction in achievement is between students in metropolitan centres and students in regional, rural, and remote areas. And um, that you have rural and regional areas in the UK, but it's just the distance is enough. It's just, it's not the same. So for students to get access to education, they have to have technology. So it becomes a great connector, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't stifle or limit what they're learning. It ought to enable it. And, but that's always going to be, I think, a, a bit of conflict. Geography in there, because I really feel that there's something about Cluey that is defined by your geography um, and the way that you've connected students and tutors 
um, in that commitment to the online and accessibility? Yes, I, I think that's true. I mean, uh, there are, of course, online tutoring companies larger, I think, than Chloe in, um, in the UK. You've got a larger population, you expect it. Um, and certainly in, in the United States as well. And as we know, until perhaps recently, there were very, very large tutoring companies in China, and there are huge in India. So it's not unique to Australia by any means, but it adds a layer of impetus, perhaps. Um, and it certainly serves, it, it becomes a, m perhaps more obviously a, a question of access. That's right. That's yeah. I think you can move on to the next slide. Shall I? Thank you. Okay, good. All right. I haven't got a huge amount more. Um, one thing I want to talk about is self-efficacy, because I think this is something that all tutors think is, is important or should think it's important. And uh, this is the, the sort of takeaway from the tech side of it for a little bit. Now, you're probably all familiar with what self-efficacy means and possibly with Albert Bandura, so I won't explain all of that for you. But what we found early on was that parents, and we still find, the parents largely ask what, what they profess to be interested in is that their child be more confident. Now, we can debate whether they really, that's really what they want or whether they really do want academic, oh, of course they want that too, but they want their child to be more confident. And I kept thinking, about well, how are we going, I mean, confident? I mean, I don't really know. We can tell them they're amazing and they'll be more confident, but, you know, that's a bit of a problem. So it really came down to self-efficacy, um, that idea that they can get better at this thing that, so that it's quite targeted rather than assuming that we're going to be able to measure whether they've built, they've grown in confidence. So self-efficacy was a really important part of that process, particularly as we come to the point where we're really wanting to measure that. It's very hard to measure confidence, to be honest. But to measure self-efficacy around particular tasks became a much easier approach for us. So that's something else to sort of throw into the pedagogical mix um, in terms of working with, again, a large number of kids, something that we can measure for all of them, with, which is regardless of what their actual level of achievement is. Because in the end, if the child feels more, has greater self-efficacy, they're going to do better, not just in the subject that you're tutoring them in, but of course, right across the board. So that was was a really key part of the thinking for us. We had a conversation yesterday, Selena, about um, the relationship between attainment and motivation um, and how kickstarting motivation by actually achieving some attainment, you know, creating some quick, some quick wins actually jump starts that cycle. Quick wins. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Oh, so that's why uh, we have that um, kickoff session. Um, we have a question in the room. Sorry, can I? Yes, go on. Um, just a question about self-efficacy. I mean, I do really resonate with the idea that I think confidence is way too open-ended. Um, but I guess from a mm -hmm. business perspective, a tutor's perspective, the difficulty of self-efficacy in being more specific is that then it becomes, I guess, more difficult to measure. Um, I guess because confidence is open-ended, there's therefore many different ways in which we can say a student's become confidence. How exactly then do you assess whether or not a student has become like, self-efficient? Well, self-efficacious. <laughs> yes, um, it's <laughs> efficacious. Yeah, I know. Oh, it sounds very wrong, doesn't it? Um, I, I think it's, it's actually about can you do this yourself? It's actually quite simple because you're asking a specific question of course, you, you're asking them to imagine themselves in a different So, I mean, there's a, there's a degree of a leap. But um, are you more confident, as you say, it's so open-ended? I don't know. Am I more confident? I mean, I, I walked into a stranger's house and I cope with that, so I feel more confident. But you really, you know, but am I any better at maths? No, really, not at all. But it, with um, self-efficacy, you can say, okay, so you've learned this concept. How confident, you might use the term confident, are you that you can apply what you've learned today when you go back to school tomorrow? Um, it, it's very specific, actually. 
and then you're beginning to train the kids not just to, to be able to measure their own level of, of self-efficacy but to actually start in start understanding the learning strategies right i'm going to learn this now but i'm going to have to apply it at another time and that's really what learning is isn't it the ability to translate what you learn in one context to another so um that's really why i think it's easier to measure so there's um, a great deal of focus on skills in terms of self-regulation and metacognition here. So students being able to understand Absolutely. what's working well for them, what their learning gains are. We're going to take one more question, but Selena, we've only got four minutes before we have to wrap up. So is it, are you- I'm worried about this. I've got other stuff to say. I, I don't know, know what I'm going to do. But, but I promise you, you want to hear from us because we're, we're, we're awesome. Go ahead. Great. And there's a question online as well. I think we need to do another session. And because <laughs> I just want to say hello. Hi, Selena. It's Kirsten from. Oh, hello. Hello, Kirsten. How are you? <laughs> Very well. Um, I have two quick questions for you. One around that self efficacy. Do you have an age limit of the kids that can work with you? Do you think there is a cognitive development stage that they need to reach in order to get there? Um, and then part two is. You mean a bottom um, age? Okay, a bottom age. age. Yes, yeah. a lower age limit. And do you share the evidence and data points that you're collecting to prove that they are meeting certain benchmarks whatever yep. with Good the questions. schools and this thing and and yep. is that changing schools perception of tuition and and you know independent learning in a way that is actually changing the industry or is in Australia is it still quite a separate thing I, I could talk to you all, all day. Things, <laughs> um, okay, I, I'll be quick. First thing is, I don't think it's a question of, of cognitive um, skills for, for, for students. The reality is that the platform we use relies on a laptop. And I don't believe that students under the A, under sort of year two level, so that's what, eight, seven, eight, um, are capable of using a QWERTY keyboard. Um, so there you are. I just don't think it's meaningful. And, and we made the decision not to offer what we do to younger students, largely for, for that reason, that it would become actually too much of a hurdle. It's, it's not worth the cognitive load. Um, in terms of whether we share, uh, we do share with schools that work with us and they really appreciate it. Um, we're happy to share our data with any schools that would be interested in receiving it. There is still, quite a strong, um, it's changing, definitely changing with all the evidence to, to demonstrate the benefit of tutoring. But I think there's quite an anti-tutoring sense still, it's still seemed to be elitist in Australia and Australia is a, a um, rabidly, well, we see ourselves as hugely egalitarian, whether or not we are is another matter, but that's the perception. <laughs> um, so I, I don't think it's changing the, um, I don't think it's really changing. I mean, it's one of those weird things. Huge numbers of kids get tutored. We know that. Huge numbers of teachers tutor kids from other schools, but they still don't like the kids that they teach at school being tutored by other tutors. I don't know how they work that one out. Um, and parents who have their children tutored are seen to be, I don't know. I don't know what they're seen to be, but and yet many, many, many do. And it seems quite normal in lots of environments, but there is, and there's a racist overtone too. It's problematic. Um, I would be delighted to share any number of things, but you know, I'm not often asked to. Yeah. <laughs> Selena, all the layers. There are so many layers in this conversation. Please, we're, we're going to let you continue because we must wrap up in three minutes. Okay, very quickly. Obviously understand your impact. Now, I think I've actually covered that, but we, I think feedback is really important. You need to know as a tutor, whether it's you and your small number of kids, whether it's a big organization like Chloe, we need to know whether we're having an impact. That is really hard for us to do, much easier for you to do. But I'm, I, I think it's just really vitally important. Um, okay, this is important, I think. Size is not everything. Um, we say this all the time, don't we? And scale can really blind you to more important metrics. I, we, we did, a, we, we scaled, that was our aim. It was always the aim, but don't feel that you need to. And I've said this to many people, 
build get to the size that you can manage that will give you the life that you want to have as a business owner which is what all tutors really are um, but don't feel that you have to get beyond that because with scale comes a whole load of complexity um, but even if you're a small thing you need to define what product you are selling and that means you are your brand and you can't really get away from that that's me on channel 10. Um, that was the only screen grab I could get where I wasn't pulling a really weird face. It's just a slightly <laughs> weird face, but um, it was it took me ages, and I, I don't know why I didn't iron my shirt. I mean, go figure. It's very strange. But I um, mean, they, they put a lot of makeup on you, but nobody offers to iron your shirt. It's very strange. Um, I think you need to think about building your personal brand because, in the end, that's what people are buying. Um, particularly the smaller you are. I mean, in a way they were buying my brand or still buying my brand with their buying clue and I'm not tutoring their children. Um, so it's kind of a bit wacky, but there it is. It, it is about trust and it is about, that's why we had to have, pedagogy has to be central because it's my reputation. Um, and I'm kind of, you know, well, I, yes, I think it was, um, was it, uh, that's Othello, isn't it, reputation? So it, it's very important to make sure that you are building a, a, a clear uh, brand. And I think finally, technology, okay? As I said, it's the great connector. And generative AI, it would be remiss of me not to mention that because of course everybody's, I'm sure you've been talking about it already in the, in the last couple of days. Um, tutoring is a relational business no matter what it's about developing relationships. I think technology is a way not just to connect, but to build rapport. So for example, we're, we're using um, GPT, we've plugged GPT that allows us to strip out of the conversations, the recorded conversations that we have with our prospective customers, our parents, so that we can actually translate all that information to a usable form for our tutors so they know what it is that the parents have said that they want. So things like that make a huge difference so that we can actually address the students' needs and meet them where they are. So it's it's making sure that technology and humans work play nicely together rather than that technology replaces humans. Yeah, I've done. <laughs> On time. Um, <laughs> Selena. <laughs> I do love a session that ends with, I'm done. <laughs> um, can we, uh, reflective practice, yes? Students reflection moment. In my mind, that was a, a, an incredibly generous presentation. Um, it's almost like you've just mentored, uh, mentored us all in the building of tutoring businesses. Um, mm -hmm. So can I capture from the room, please, some insights or feedbacks or shares what you who have been, of course, Selena's learners here today have learned from her presentation. Jonas, I know I can count on you first. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. Be kind to my feet. I was just going to say, you've got comfortable shoes. Uh. I don't. Oh, she's <laughs> in socks. She's in socks. Oh, it is. Hi, Selena. Um, mine is more of a question. Um, I think I really benefited from your presentation and thank you for sharing so openly with your sort of, um, you know, your framework that you shared with us. But I just want to know, alongside you, who were the key people that you needed as your inner circle in order to deliver a project at this scale? <sighs> and what roles did they have and how important were they? Well, first of all, we needed founders who actually financed, bootstrapped it. They're kind of important. Um, and that they, they, they are the true founders. Um, there was CEO, CFO. Um, we had a chief technology officer. Um, chief uh, product officer who helped his team build the product. We, it was quite a big, it's been big, big uh, chief organ, um, operating officer, chief um, customer officer, all of those things. In my own team, I had heads of department for each of the departments, um, uh, head of tutoring. Um, and so it, 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 was, it wasn't by no means just me, no way. Um, and I, I'm sorry if it, if it seemed like I was trying to suggest that it was just me and I am a really amazing person with 500 arms. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, many people involved. Thank you for being so authentic and answering that so honestly. Is there anyone else who would love to share with Selena what they've gained from this session? No, then I will. 
Yes? Hello, dear. <laughs> uh, I just think that this is such... And I know that I know Selena from years back, but it just shows how profoundly human and experienced technology can be, that we're physically in a space in London and that you are that far away from us and it feels like, we, like you really are in the room and that's really encouraging for us in the hybrid learning that we are facilitating because if we can feel that connected... It, it all just got very meta. <laughs> I love that very much, thank you. So we've modelled this connectivity, we've modelled this relationship between the human and the tech, which is awesome since we're at VET. Um, and I would love to also point out that there's been really consistent threads about know thy impact. There's been really consistent threads about using um, our pedagogical alignment in service of students and their families, um, about pre-assessment. There's been strong focus on um, reflective practice, the student and of the tutor. Um, and for me, I think, Selena, it sounds to me like you behave like a school leader, like the head teacher of this great big Cluey school. Um, and that that's what the oversight is. And that's why your brand and your pedagogy is is coherent through it. And so that message of coherence and being through and through is something that we're all totally committed to in this room. And we very much appreciate you sharing your perspective and the how of that. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Well, have a lovely rest of your day. I admit, I'm going to go to bed now. Good night. <laughs> Lots of love. Um, so, bye. Um, bye. We are, bye. So we're moving on now to our third session of day two of Love Tutoring at VET. We're going to be taking a short break. And when we come back, we're going to be having the first of our three panel discussions on alternative approaches to education. The first conversation we'll be having is about emotional-based school absence with the clear focus on it's not that they won't, it's that they can't. So we'll see you in 15 minutes.
Just wanna love you, just wanna hold you, just wanna be with you till we grow old. You tell me you'll stay or take me away. I want you for myself every single day. You set my world on fire. You set my world on fire. I just want you. I just need you, I don't know what it is to do, I just want you, I just need you, I don't know what it is to do, I just want to love you, just want to hold you, just want to be with you till we grow old, just tell me you'll stay or take me away, I want you for myself every single day. So got your pearls hanging by my bedside Still got your lips so paper in the trash now I never knew love could be so sweet I never knew it would sting I never knew love like this would leave I can't believe it's already over Too late to talk and fix whatever's broken I always thought love like ours would last I never knew love could pass Tomorrow comes and you are not around
but leave the past behind. Walk with me. There's something else we need to find. Say you'll go. Don't make me wait. There's no need to hesitate. Let's make footprints. Let's leave the past behind. Walk with me down the road. There's sunshine and light. Say you'll go. Don't make me wait. There's no need. Thank you, Tom. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much for filling our room for us. What a joy it is to be here. Um, when I saw out one of our earlier speakers this morning, we went down in the lift and there was somebody else who was, I'm sorry, I have my back to you. There was somebody else who was coming up. He, honestly, he was just looking for the bathrooms. And I brought him in here and I showed him what we're doing. And he said, this is what that should feel like. It should feel like lots of interesting things happening all over the building. And we had some feedback yesterday. There were some people who were here, they went downstairs, they came back and they said, oh, this is the nicest place in Bet right now, which gives me such joy. Um, when Odette and I were walking into XL this morning, we pinched ourselves because of the pleasure it is to come here today. And Diego and I were just talking about the fact that when we worked on Love Tutoring Festival 1 and Love Tutoring Festival 2, during lockdown, just bringing people together was the goal. And at that time, not just because we were in COVID times, but we had become quite entrenched, hadn't we? And we had been used to being quite isolated, hadn't we? Mm. And so this opportunity to sort of come together has grown and developed initially as an online program, as a week-long online program, as an online program that you could expect to come back in six months' time and then six months' time after that. And we built and we grew and we developed these ongoing relationships. 
And some of us have been meeting together in hybrid sessions, in online sessions for months and years now. And so what we've built are these continuous relationships, these genuine relationships where we're genuinely growing together as colleagues. Somebody described us, somebody who visited us yesterday, described it as the nicest staff room, which is, which is great because I've been in some less nice staff rooms as well. So the nicest staff room where there's tea and coffee on tap and a culture of kindness. So we had a lot of conversations yesterday about how we cope with change, how we adopt technology to serve our pedagogical intent. And all of it has to come down to a culture of kindness, because otherwise, firstly, what's it for? And secondly, we'll get lost along the way. The humans will get lost along the way. So I'm really, really proud to be able to present to you this panel on alternative, on alternative provision, sorry, mental block, on alternative provision and emotional-based school absence. Some of you know that this is quite close to my heart at the moment, um, and that's not remarkable because many of us have children or family members or students that we work with who are struggling with attending school right now because of depression and anxiety. It's real, it's close to us, and with my mommy hat on, I can tell you firstly that the people in this room have helped me, and secondly, I can tell you that it hurts, it's not easy, and it takes a village. So this is the village. Um, and Arthur, I'm going to hand over to you to do all the introductions and all the heavy lifting. Ha-ha! <laughs> you just take us a I nice <laughs> cup of tea. It's absolutely fine. Uh, thank you all for joining us um, here today and online. Um, very quickly, you don't want to hear much from me. Uh, my name's Arthur Moore. I'm an online maths tutor. I was a secondary maths teacher for a number of years um, across the UK and internationally. Uh, I also run a couple of educational podcasts, team teaching and also tutoring tips, where top tutors share a top tip. I've been practicing that for many years. <laughs> um, and I'm here to really just ask the questions that we all kind of want to be asking. Um, so feel free to put your hand up. We'll get some questions going. But firstly, we're going to introduce the people who know a lot more about this than me. Um, so I'm going to ask you free to introduce yourself, and I'm also going to ask you to why is this an important topic for you? Why is AP, why is emotional based absent an important topic for you? So Kirsten, do you want to say hello first? Yeah, throw you straight there in. You go. <laughs> hello, I'm Kirsten. Um, I uh, was a geography teacher uh, in a secondary school, um, but I've had a varied career. Uh, but the most important bit that's brought me here has been my children's emotional school based. What are we talking about? I know. I know. We're now on absence. <laughs> yeah. Because avoidance was the term that was coined for a while. And if you have been a mother of a child that doesn't want to go to school, and it's not, that's, it's not avoiding it. It's not skiving. It's not bunking. It's, there's a lot of things that um, go into that. And it's very emotional. So doing something about that encouraged me to set up Gaia Learning. So we've been going for uh, four and a half years now. Um, we run as an alternative provision, but we're a Cambridge accredited international school online. Um, and we also work with <coughs> local authorities, with um, maths, with schools to support them to get kids back into the curriculum. And uh, by mirroring the school's curriculum and offering hybrid learning spaces and different contexts for kids to feel more comfortable, build their confidence, and go in when they're ready. So. That's me. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Diego? That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, how do I do that? That's why I asked so, him for that. <laughs> very wise. Jeez, I, I, I don't know why I've, you've picked me, Julia, but you know, it's a go. But I mean it. Um, so I'm Diego. Um, I'm, you know, not from this uh, country, believe it or not. Um, so I was raised in Brazil um, and had a very interesting experience of school. and entirely misunderstood throughout the whole process. But it's, it's not to blame anybody. We just didn't know what we didn't know back then. And, um, and that kind of left me, you know, a bit confused. Do they really love having me around? Or am I just a pain in the ass, as they describe it? You know, so I think that's how people feel at, at the office, to be honest, most of the time. <laughs> Why are you laughing? 
Yeah, they've, they've been paid to do, to laugh and clap. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get some sort of encouragement. So bribing is a good technique, are you? We're here to Amongst teachers you. and <laughs> parents, right? Safe space. Extrinsic ways. Nobody's ever right? done any bribing, have you? I don't think you have. <laughs> not, not ever. So anyway, so I, I, you know, went through my whole life trying to make other people's lives better. But what I didn't understand was that I was in that process trying to figure out how to redeem my own experience of childhood. So from youth justice to, um, you know, sort of health projects to private schools to CAMs and Bernardos and you name it, you know, I was, I was there being that really irritating kid around the block that was pointing to the elephant in the room that nobody was willing to name. Um, and it got me into lots of trouble. Um, like, I don't remember a, a, an organisation that I worked for that I didn't get a, some sort of um, written warning. <laughs> Does it sound like ADHD kids in school as well? <laughs> right? I didn't Have really... Have your diagnosis yet? Oh, yeah, many multiple times. I just needed to triple check that they were right. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the anxiety that comes with it. But, you know, so I kind of grew up with this really... Um, in, in this world where I, I love it, you know, and, and I've d done all sorts of amazing things with my, with my, with my life, and, and, and yet it didn't quite feel like it was worth living, you know, it was, it was, it was complex. So I spent a whole lot of time, and the last um, thing that I kind of started was an organization called Nurge Educa Education. What I noticed was uh, way before this became, a, you know, a sexy thing to talk about, this was like seven years ago, uh, I noticed that the problem wasn't um, exclusion. Do you remember when exclusion was a thing? Exclusion rates. It's like but underneath that valley, I, I remember as an assistant head teacher of an SEN school, I was like, this is a bit, you know, more, um, you know, hardcore than most people kind of see or want to see. And there was a lot of enthusiasm from the schools where I worked to have me to begin with, because. You know, it was ideas, enthusiasm, plan, intelligence. I'm not bragging here, but as soon as they saw the energy that came to deliver on that, they just didn't know, you know, what was going on. And, you know, if I had a little bit of, you know, emotional maturity, which kind of was a bit of, it is a bit deficient in me since, since uh, with the history that I've had in my childhood, and, um, or kind of a bit delayed, and whichever way you look at it, it's all the same stuff, isn't it? So, you know, I would have probably done well with those schools. So nudge then began to uncover a thing called chronic disengagement, which is not a formal term, but it sounds a little bit like a severe persistent absence where the government talk, talks about, or uh, numerous, of other, numerous others or other organizations across the globe that are talking about chronic persistent absence, you know, but it's, it's not just the usual, um, I'll go to school once or twice um, a month, you know, the other days I can't make it. And these, these are kids who haven't been to school for a very long, long period of time. And actually, they become, um, they become a source of energy for a very capitalist world that tries to almost retain them in that space um, of where they are recipient of this particular um, input, but it doesn't quite hit where it's scratching. So my, my thing, and I know I've gone on for a bit, my thing is about giving a voice to those young people who are completely voiceless. And this isn't about just, you know, the odd case of going on holiday because it's cheaper, because that makes complete sense, and I'll totally endorse that if I was a head teacher. That's probably what I'm not. Uh, I'd probably get out of sack. Probably, I almost did as an assistant one as well, <laughs> so it's... You know, but this is about kids whose lives are so... You know, without dramatising this, so not worth living at the age of three, some of our cases, um, at the age of six in some of our cases, and putting a sheet of paper, I'm sorry, or a really fancy screen in front of them is actually about negating their humanity and what they're about and their potentials. So Nudge does this on a really large scale at the moment, which is great to say, but a very big pain in the ass sometimes to manage all of that. And, uh, as you can probably imagine, man managing a, an operation of that size with ADHD comes with challenges for me and for everybody else. <laughs> so I would love to, you know, to answer some questions. My thoughts are pretty, you know, out of the, the ordinary sometimes because I'm, I'm in a space where it's not about those who are already engaging with your tutoring and those who are not even quite finding life worth living. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. That's me.
Yeah. Now, the, all the issues we're going to solve in the next 20 yeah. minutes, I think we'll fix it. Uh, Lucy, sorry, before we yeah, go. Yeah, no, if, thank, I mean, how do you follow that? Um, I think looking around, you know, my name's Lucy, I'm looking around, I know lots of people in here, but I also, there's some <coughs> unfamiliar faces, and I think the cool thing about us all here as tutors is we've all probably, if we think about the question that we're here to talk about today, realised that the current mainstream curriculum offering isn't working for many students. Um, the percentage stat that I always use to start this conversation off, because a lot of people say, oh, is it just st suddenly <coughs> stopped working now? 80% of autistic adults, I'm, I'm a specialist in autism, PDA particularly, um, are unemployed. 80%. So it hasn't been working for a long time. And I think when we think about us all as tutors, because um, that's why we're all here, whatever, whether you're an independent tutor or a, 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 you know, running a large um, like business, um, alternative provision is us realising that the learners need something different. And we've talked this morning about agency, advocacy, you know, all of these different A words, they all seem to start with A, um, alternative, you know. Um, but I think what we do um, at Education Boutique is we reintegrate learners. And I think that's not back to always the setting that they've come from. That's actually really thinking about, I, I'm not always the biggest fan of using the word tutoring for what we do because it's, it, tutoring uh, gives the, it's got a connotation for a lot of people in the education sector of historically this like tutors and teachers against each other and that's something that personally like my mission has always been to change that and to see um, tutoring as not just a funded, government funded part of the education system, but something that really has sustainability forward to the future, because that's what our young people need. So um, we reintegrate. I think my area of specialism is probably the funding aspect of it as well, um, which I think sometimes um, is an interesting thing, because obviously for us to put these amazing things in place, we need to position the offering really carefully um, to be able to attract the right bits of funding that allow us to put it in place. Um, so although as tutors and as educators, we don't like talking about money often, um, it's actually an integral part that we all understand how we can provide a great service, yes. But first of all, how it, who's gonna pay to have you and your amazing education, the opportunities that you have and you offer the students actually in front of them. So I think, yeah, I'm really excited for this Very conversation cool. today. So I think what's really interesting is you're coming from slightly different perspectives. We can hear each of our panel there are coming from different perspectives, but I think this is something we can all kind of understand. We've all worked with students or organisations where we've kind of acknowledged kind of what's going on here. Um, and I think what we kind of want to delve into first, before we talk about kind of how we can work together to kind of come up with some solutions that can potentially help some of these students, is I think we first need to talk about like why this is happening, why we're seeing an increase in maybe this happening um, more recently. So Kirsten, if I could come to you, just from your experience, everything else is from your experience, like what's your experience of why these students kind of are emotionally being absent from their education or why they need um, a different method of education, a different style of education? Um, well, I think like what Lucy was saying, this isn't a new problem. It's just we've highlighted it more from the pandemic. And we've had, we don't really recognise the impact that that's had on kids emotionally and families. And is the difference between parents that have seen, oh, this is what my children are learning and are they interested in it? And is it relevant? And that, that brief period of time where parents were working from home and looking at the curriculum and just, I think, a lot of people said, well, is this you know, started to question the curriculum. And then there is developmental delay. So ADHD comes with 30% executive function delay, whether or not, you know, that, that's your base point. Then we had a whole lot of kids for a period of time that didn't get the social interaction that they needed for development. So they are delayed as well. Combine that with the disconnect between parents and schools and then this crazy idea that the rest of the world has gone on and evolved and become hybrid and embraced technology and sustainability and things like that. But school, it's like school went like claws deep into trying to get back to 2019 and like, I don't know, 
it's almost medieval in the sanctions and the just trying to get a grip on things because it's so unknown and so scary for everybody. So just the ludicrousy of uh, personal experience that I'm dealing with today on my parent app. Um, my daughter has been through the trauma of uh, you know, abusive relationships, families coming out of that, dealing with that, being supported very well in school by external um, pastoral care and all of that. When she's gone into secondary school, it's been an absolute nightmare. <laughs> we know what the fallout of these things are. Uh, she's developed an eating disorder, which she has specifically and self-efficacy-wise gone to her teacher and said, I'm ready for help with this now. I want, I want you to help me. So she goes into school to get pastoral care and therapy around this. On Tuesday, she was late for a lesson because she was vomiting in a toilet. There was a gastro going around in the school that day, but there's also, I don't know the reason why she was there. And the emotion that comes around that, she also has ADHD and the rejection sensitivity. Now I'm late for my class. I'm in a school of 2,000 kids. She gets lost between all of her different lessons. And now she's in a vulnerable state, either having made herself sick or mm. caught this gastro bug. And a teacher went in and found her in the toilet cubicle and has given her an hour detention, which she's supposed to serve today. So although she was supposed to be with her dad today and I'm up in London working, trying to do something about the thing, and she messaged and she said, Mum, I can't go in, I'm going home. So she's walked herself home to a house that is empty. I know she's there by herself. And I've messaged the school and the, about it and they said, no, they're not gonna remove the detention because those are the rules. And I said, there is no way I can get my child to feel safe and come back into a space where that's the only place she can get or I can afford this therapy and support for her in that safe space. We advocate for reintegration into schools, but like Lisa's is saying, I think it, sometimes it needs to be something else. Once that breakdown happens, it's like, an, it's like a divorce. It's an irre yeah. place, irreversible, yeah. irreparable whatever, um, damage that's been done. And, and so, but I like, that's just today and that's just me. And it's this other thing about what we look at society and we think, I struggled a lot to talk about the things that I was going through because you know she's a teacher and she's you know middle class and white British South African widow. It, it doesn't look like what it looks like, but it affects all of us mm -hmm. um, as teachers, as parents, as kids. Mm -hmm. And it and I think hurts. one thing that you've just <laughs> talked about there, like you know, to talk about, I mean that probably to some people in here that will be like a shocking story. <laughs> To us people up here, we're probably like, okay, yeah, this is the reality. It's not glamorous doing this work. Um, and, you know, one of the things I struggle with, um, just to very quickly put some data against what you've just said there, is that only 5%, we've, as a company, we've got 100% reintegration rate. But just to be clear, that is to a suitable educational setting that does not have to look like school. And in some places, um, that might be, I mean, five, only 5% 5 of our, of our students go back to the school. And that is, even then I'm like, wow, gosh, how do we pull that off? Um, and, and, but the, the, the key thing there is that it's not like after six weeks, you know, because we see so much of these managed moves. Oh, let's send them to this other school where they know no one. <laughs> They know no one. Let's send them there because they don't want to come to the place where they've got social s s friends yeah. and things like that. And they know teachers and they have security. They're not coming here. So let's send them for six weeks somewhere else and that will <laughs> sort it all out. Mm. I mean, it's crazy. Like, it is literally crazy. And so what we do in this situation is we have to go multi-agency and we have to work with social care and, you know, all the things. So when, you know, one of the key things I would say about, like, the answer to your question, um, Arthur, about what, like, why alternative provision, why is it, like, now being such a problem for people, it is exactly that. The students are not absent because they just can't, like the name of the thing. It is literally that these, these like settings, these environments, I guess you'd call them, are literally giving the students no choice but to remove themselves. Yeah. 
Because it's not, it's, it's the understanding of cortisol, it's too much to talk about now, but if we understand the extreme sort of effect that cortisol has when you're in that fight or flight on a person's body, it's all the things we see in terms of poor executive function, poor self-esteem, high rates of depression, everything like that. And actually, what we, the big thing, and I am making my point and then I will stop, I'm so sorry, um, is that trauma is vastly misunderstood. Because we all sit here and I think a lot of people, and it's not a problem if you do think this, you hear trauma and you think one big event, right? It is not. It is every single little time that you have to change who you are to fit into a situation, masking, you know, from an autism point of view, you know, that life is a big mask. You know, I'm sitting here in front of all of you now doing exactly just that. Tonight, I'm going to go home and stroke my dogs and put a face mask on, you know, um, for, for hours. <laughs> um, but that is why it's so important that anyone working in this space, anyone interested in this space, understands that trauma is not like one big massive event. Yes, it might have an impact on like some of our students, but it's actually this like fully understanding that the space you're going to does not understand you fundamentally as a person. And if we could change that, everything would be sorted. I think one thing that's really interesting what you're talking about, we talk about alternative provision and what that sounds like. It sounds like this singular thing. I, this isn't working, therefore I'll do something else and that will either work or it won't work. Yeah. And what we're talking about here is it's really alternative provisions and we're trying to find the one that works for that student. And it's not so much of, I don't want to go down the route of talking like about schools and about teachers because th th it's incredibly hard and challenging in those environments and like everyone who's been, environment yeah, everyone who's been a teacher Watch will me. know like there's, yeah. there's so much going on. And what we're talking about is these alternative ways that we can support, whether that's as individuals or those here who work as organisations um, or those whose work as groups. Um, we spoke a little bit there. Can I just, um, yeah, do you mind if I just jump onto that topic? Is that okay? Um, I, I'd, I don't know. The question is, why is it such a big thing now? You know, and I think, you know, whilst it's very true that, it, you know, the pandemic highlighted this or... Um, I think taking a view of a child in, from a developmental perspective is really important. Um, and it doesn't answer the question, what can alternative provision do? But I'm telling you, you'll answer a question of what kind of human being you want to be to a child that you may tutor. Because there lies the answer. Um, you know, a child isn't a product of parenting only, of, um, I guess ideas of society and schooling and ambitions and difficulties in learning and developmental milestones. A child is, is a product of all of that together. It's not okay um, that we have lots of alternative provision. I don't think it's a good thing that we can think of our, our own businesses um, in, in, by means of finding purpose and prosperity. I can put in some, you know, more, you know, very sharp terms if you want. I think it's needed that we do what we do and I think it's fantastic as a um, stopgap in, in, in an environment that is entirely toxic and it's not, not only toxic for the child, that's just, we should see that almost as a godsend, quite literally, way, a message there for us that with the way that we're living is creating toxicity on that human being. Now there is a point for me uh, around survival and that's very biological and I feel like what we're doing is a fantastic human response to save our species. You know, we are responding to that emotional pain, neurologically speaking, at the same level that you'd respond to seeing a child with a broken arm as, as carers, teachers, whatever, tutors. So why is it that it's becoming a bigger problem? I think it's because we need to do some checking in with ourselves, ourselves first politicians, teachers, bankers, tutors, everybody, and how we are contributing. You know, a toxic culture, and I've read quite a bit about that. It's, it's, if you think about a lab, do you know those lab little things that you see on the television where people do stuff? That's called a culture of some sort, where they put certain ingredients there to create a healthy culture where an organism can grow and develop, so you can study that. Now, if that doesn't work, that organism is gonna grow, not how they planned it to, or it won't grow at all. And I think that's where it's at. I think for me, we are somehow 
And this is the challenge, though, for somebody who's a CEO of an organization that works in every corner of this country. By the way, I never knew there was such a role of a CEO until three years ago. Somebody said, it would be a good idea if you you know, function more strategically. I thought it was exciting because I didn't know what it was. It's the classic ADHD, isn't it? Oh, that sounds good, I'll go for it. I'm first, I'll go. Yeah, I'll take that jump, you know. And it looks like a deep lake, but it's nice and shallow and you break your leg as soon as you go in and you have to kind of find your way back up the hill again, trying to jump to a place where it's a bit cleaner and safer. Um, but I think we've, we've, got to, we've got to ask some real turf questions about whether we genuinely care. And it sounds very drastic and dramatic. And it's a bit like a tango dance whereby you matter, but you really don't matter. What matters is what we're doing to this generation that is yet to come. Can that generation be, not trauma, be a gimmick? Because sometimes we talk about it these days in ADHD as if it's a gimmick. And I find that the work that we do, it's a bit like a pressure valve in a system that is over you know, super pressurized. And I think we need to blow that lid off that pan and see what's inside. And once we look inside, there's lots of good humanity that we need to engage with. Lots of letting go of self and more of others that we can, that we can apply. And I'm telling you, that's called compassion in some, in some environments. You know, it's the ability to feel with someone else's pain. Empathy is a different thing. It's like, oh, it's not so bad, but I won't work with you if you don't pay me that. You know, and it's a real tough thing to ask us ourselves like that. But I think if we get better at being humans, and I'm not talking about education or tutoring here, is I think you'll find that we'll get better at you know, being tutors and teachers. And, and hopefully, as I say to my team, and they'll tell you, I can't wait to the day that we're going to become bakers, shoemakers, I don't know, building makers, because they don't need us anymore. And it's like, praise heavens for this, because we can't sustain our own professional, this is a quote, by the way, that I keep thinking about all the time. We can't sustain our own professional purpose and prosperity at the cost of a broken society. Mm -hmm. Do you get me, what I'm trying to say? So I think it's bad because I think we've, we've, we've become a little bit almost um, hypnotized by some of these flashing ideas and the latest. We hate the government, don't we? But it's all about the government putting 300 million <laughs> Uh, pounds out there for you to go thirsty for that you suddenly don't think like that about Ofsted, right? What is that? I call it a lack of integrity. Mm. You know, we talk about, oh, you know, it, you know, it's this and this and this, but, but yet, you know, what's, what's the financial integrity in the business that you run about how you make your margins? You know, so it goes on about, sorry, I, I will finish here. Okay. It's about <laughs> us guys. It's about you. It's about your relationship with yourself and others around you. It's about you being a good village member, to use uh, Julia's um, uh, analogy there. But that's my, those are my thoughts. I'm going to go to Lucy first, because I can see Lucy's <laughs> ready to jump in. I've seen it a couple of times. Um, I'm doing quite well with my pulse control these days. <laughs> just can't stop talking. I'm <laughs> looking forward to Diego de Baker at the next panel. Oh, yeah. uh, sorry, Lucy. No, I was just going to say, I love the idea of where you were saying about the, the culture tray, if you like, and that we put things in for that person to grow but I think alternative provision is almost the outside of that in terms of if you think of us all as in the government the school the system has said this is what everyone needs to grow it's in the school because I remember when I was at school I used to literally sit in my lessons all of them and be like why are these four walls like the best place for me to be learning mm -hmm. this piece of knowledge? You know, it's very knowledge based, isn't it? And we do often find our neurodiverse students asking themselves why, right? And, and so I loved your thing about the, the culture trade because I think when that doesn't work, if you get someone who's existing in that like given ecosystem y thing that's meant to work and it doesn't, then we, we're outside and we would then be the person who would go, well, let's try this. Let's move them to a different setting. Let's try, you know, and so I think yeah. it really like resonated I, I, with me a little do bit. Do you mind if I just offer a different view here? Yeah. Because I, I don't know if genuinely, and I think that's juicy and interesting, that's when the likes yeah. on Facebook go, really? yeah. <laughs> I don't agree with you. Are they gonna fight or something? No, no, no. <laughs> but I just think, I don't, know, I don't know if the evidence, and I'm half, you know, halfway through um, a research piece that I'm doing with, a few universities in the UK on persistent abs absenteeism. 
to PhDs. One day I'll be a doctor and I'll go back to my school and say, see what I got, sir? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do things for revenge. Ah, no, no. There's no revenge, Mum. Don't look, don't look, don't look for that. that. <laughs> no, I'm not. I just casually bump into him and say, oh, here's my card. <laughs> you know, I don't know, I don't know if it works. You know, I don't know if, you know, if we're honest. If what works? Alternative provision, nudge education, all of this. I, I think there is something that it's become almost utopian and people think, what on earth are you saying? Because I think it's about the whole village together. You know, it's not, it, it's an ecosystem that needs to function where teachers and but that's tutors. that's what it is though. Because you've just talked about yourself and you said, I don't know if it works. So you're talking about one person in its like one business, one offering. And that's what we yeah. talked about. Multi-agency is the it's... only way it can work. It's just, isn't it? the purpose of education and our roles as parents and children. And I like that we've gone to the ecosystemy yeah, like... thing because I'll mm. just tell you the meaning of Gaia, the Gaia hypothesis is an earth systems theory that's like, if yep. we just left it alone, the organic and the inorganic components would just self-regulate, they'd figure yeah, it out and those would out, like, yeah. that would die off and Absolutely. that would come up. So if we apply that to education and we say, look, let's le let the kids and the parents and the educators and my inorganic bit, which is the controversy probably in the tech enabled bit, but tech in allows us to connect, share ideas across um, mm. it makes the it UK and, and scalable, doesn't it? That's global. what tech does. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it also allows us to measure it because as educators and governments, we cannot get away from the data. So we want to go, well, what is the impact? Does it really work? Which does it, what's it? But so if we can just use tech subtly in the background mm. to prove okay. that giving kids agency is not going to make the world fall over. In fact, yeah. we, we listen to them and let them lead mm. and provide them a safe space where Firstly, they feel like they can go to the toilet when they want to, that they can find a safe place where they can eat and not feel anxious and want to throw up. Like, mm. we've but got to come right back down to do. our humanity. We have to, there's no other way. Sleep, cuddle the babies. We'll be, we'll be like hamsters on a little <laughs> on a treadmill, guys. Otherwise, we'll just be chasing ourselves until we retire and other people do. So uh, the reason why it's I don't, not like the reason why I'm not the sure. <laughs> The reason why I'm this not... This is the most raucous <laughs> yeah. ever. Well, let, let me just say... <laughs> I just, I just, I just have, I just have, have one more minute. And then <laughs> literally, literally, <laughs> I promise right, you, 30 right. seconds. I'm, I'm having a great time. Like, there's data that came out of government, <laughs> uh, the Office for National Statistics recently, <laughs> and the reason why I don't... That's why I don't know if alternative revision really works. It's because the highest number of pers uh, severe persistent absenteeism, which is 50% or plus, which is, like wildly wrongly categorise the whole set of data. I'm doing some work with universities on that. Um, I think that says that the highest percentage of young people who stop going to school are those who went to SEN schools, alternative provision. And for me, it breaks my heart because I'm like an avid, you know, a supporter of things that we do together, this community here that we are. But I'm just coming into this awakening and beginning to ask, what is it that we can do in those alternative provisions? It's not a new program. That's cool and needed. If you don't innovate, it's our own, it's ourselves that we need to work and change. You know, so that's that's where I'm at. Lucy, I'm going to let you come back but next. I can see you now. I'm going to jump so in. So many. So yes, I would uh, I would ask the question: What are you talking about in terms of alternative provision? Because as we know, they vary wildly, and I think what we've not touched anything on, that is not mainstream. Yeah, but even within that, so let's look at Ofsted's. Uh, you know, if you're an alternative provision service, right? I am a service. I'm not a setting. I don't have a physical location. Similarly to you, mm -hmm. um, you must find the same thing. When you go through the local authority vetting and the local authority tenders, you don't fit any of the boxes. You yeah. don't have a fire They're safety. Gray. Thing. So what I would say, I would agree with you. There's some weird the, policies. Oh, exactly asked. right. <laughs> yeah. But we don't fit. We're all sitting here as alternative provision services, and I don't think we can finish this conversation without saying there is a wild difference between an alternative provision setting and an alternative prov provision service. That's hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that. And, you know, firstly, it's catching it upstream. That's not done quickly enough. So I would argue that if anyone has failed when they've been given alternative provision, maybe it's been way too late, the trauma's been, and it's not being coupled up. I'm sure you see it a lot as well. With You need good therapy at the same time. Kirsten, you've touched on that as well. You can't just go alternative provision, education, here you go, everything's going to be okay. 
it's everyone speaking the same language. So I, I do agree with you in the sense that we have to always question, is it really working? Because if you don't do that, you're never gonna continue to innovate and do better. But I would just say that if people make sweeping statements like it doesn't work, that's also dangerous because then local authorities go, oh, if it doesn't work, we pull funding and then what, what do they do? See, I'm and you see you get that, yeah. <laughs> just, just because of, funding just because of time, the last thing I want to do, and this is going to be difficult, so I apologise. <laughs> you only have four minutes. Mm -hmm. This is, is perfect because I'm going to give a minute each. We're going to focus on the you in this. There's a you in this sentence. So I want you to talk to the people here, the people online. Uh, we all come from different backgrounds. I want you to give them a minute of your thought. What can you do? So I want you to talk to the individual. Like, what can you do? Because I don't work in this alternative provision world. Like, I tutor online maths for GCSE. Like, so t I want you to talk to the people here. What can you do? I want, so it can be a question, it can be a thought, it can be an idea. Who wants I to don't go mind going first? Lucy, go for it. So Not I think a minute, by the way, because I'm You chat. have to understand that if you ever hear anyone who's saying, the school system just isn't working for my, you know, my friend's son, so signposting. Like, even if you are not the person who's going to deliver that tutoring or is the expert in that particular profile of autism, you have a responsibility as being in the education system to know who to signpost to. 30 seconds done. Boom. Signposting. <laughs> Kirsten? You have a responsibility to stand up and say if something's not right, um, even if it is against your profession as a tutor. You know, if tutoring is not right, I don't think tutoring should patch up a system that is wrong as an education system. Um, and yeah, listen to the children, listen to what they, they need. Be brave to shout out that it's, that, that it's not working. And Diego? You set setting himself a timer? Of course I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning stuff, guys, you know, like time management and pulse control. <laughs> no, I've still got time. <laughs> You can have my 30 seconds, I know how fine. to do my stuff, <laughs> trust me. And that's all we've got time for, so... <laughs> it's not true, it's unfair practice. That's... Right, I've got 40 seconds, I'm going to tell you some, something really straightforward. Make sure, and that's it, all I'm going to say, make sure your cup's full, so you're yeah. not giving it from empty. I think that would be do amazing. Do a face mask. Yeah, face mask and dogs help greatly. <laughs> that, was, that was three seconds, by the way. Well done. Oh, <laughs> so you can do it. Um, Thank so, you. there are three things that um, I think we can all now talk to ourselves, go away and have a little think. Um, but I think we should say thank you to our panellists. And I love how we have discussed and questioned each other, not just said, aren't we all brilliant? Although, we are all brilliant. Um, uh, so, I want to. Didn't feel like that this morning, I'm telling you. I was going to say, it doesn't feel like that when you see the emails you get in about children that are not. But it's something I spoke place. about yesterday. Sometimes we have to look ourselves in the mirror and go, course, yeah. you are good at what you we're do. We're doing as good a job as we can and we're trying to make going. a difference. Yeah, Don't yes. let perfect be the enemy of good. Like, if we do um, something yeah, good, that. share really the positive like that. that's oh, enough. I like Julia. That. Arthur, that's a great you point. smashed it too. Because you yeah, held the you. space, you let them have their thing. It was a little <laughs> bit chaotic for a minute there, like an early years classroom. It was like being an NQT again. I loved it. It wasn't like an early years classroom. If we've all got autism and ADHD, it's probably yeah. it is like an early years classroom. It's so, like a really um, early years classroom. You, I, I, published a, <laughs> I published a blog this week that's really close to my heart about canaries, phoenix, and dove. So the canaries are those people who are so sensitive, they can't cope in our restrictive environments, in our toxic cultures. And yesterday, the wonderful Kenny Hannigan spoke about stars that have their sparkly bits lopped off so that they fit into square boxes. Um, those are our canaries. And I think that you've noticed that these awesome humans here could easily have been canaries in a classroom, struggling wow. to cope, struggling to find purpose and sense, struggling to bring them their whole selves. But these people are phoenixes because each one in their own way, and I know each of their stories personally, have built themselves up and reinvented themselves and brought themselves up out of the ashes, out of potentially traumatic experiences, big or small, and built themselves up into a regenerative, um, functioning human again. But the fact that they're here on this panel also means that they are doves 
because they are pointing the way and illustrating hopefulness for what could be in education next. And to me, these continued conversations that we have are full of hope and they're full of beauty. And you guys bring your whole selves, <laughs> your whole messy genius selves. And that's <laughs> what we are so proud of. So to be able to faci facilitate this conversation means a great deal. I would love to let you know that right now we are going to have a very small welcome from the team from All Cam. Jennifer and Chris are going to be talking to us about assistive technology. So if you think about this segue between children who are struggling in the classroom and how we can help them, um, the All Cam tool is one of those ways. Um, and what we're going to be doing is All Cam are actually hosting lunch for us today, and they're going to be wandering around the room, giving us a chance to play with the All Cam reader pen. But you will hear much more about them in a minute. Thank you so much to our. Thank wonderful. you. Nice. Enjoy. Good again, Sue. Shall we? Nice. Thank you. My bum's gone numb. <laughs> are you mic'd up? You have. Can play with the pieces of our broken body. We ready? Oh. Yes. oh, whenever anyone gives me a microphone, I generally break out into song, but I promise I won't do that today. I'm normally, <laughs> I've normally had about five gins by now, but today I'll save that for tonight. <laughs> um, but uh, obviously, thank you. Um, I'm Jenny. I'm from All Cam Technologies. Um, I've got my colleague here, Chris, uh, alongside me today. Um, as we've been introduced, we are exhibiting today down in the main hall. Our stand is SF40. Uh, we have loads of hands-on um, opportunities for you to come down and try that today. But ultimately, Chris and I are here today to give you guys the opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one, um, go with the device. So, Orcam Technology. So, uh, for those of you that may have not heard of Orcam before, we are a international global um, assistive technology supplier. We supply um, solutions to support students with re uh, low reading attainment, reading, learning difficulties, um, EAL students. Um, the device is a simple handheld device, and again, you can all have a go with it during the lunch break. Um, uh, fundamentally, the, the device is designed as well, so it's a point and scan, so very, very easy to use. It will scan a full page of text at one click of a button, so no scanning lines and lines. It allows a student to be able to read that text along with the reader itself, follow it with their fingers, highlight it, or just sit back and just enjoy the text reading itself. It has many other functions on there as well. You can read back to the device, so trying to encourage independent reading, independent fluency, um, and also comprehension as well. So the device has also got the capabilities to question the student on the text that they've just read or the text that they've just heard back as well. It can translate into 20 languages. So again, from an EAL perspective, any English text, it will translate that back as, as well. It has a built-in dictionary mode as well. So the algorithms within the device will um, point on any specific word, give the, the, the meaning of the word again, so helping the students really understand what they're reading. And a new function that we've uh, just launched is the summarization function. So the device has the capabilities to scan a full page of text, and it will read that back in a snapshot summarization for you. So if the student's having struggles with accessing lengthy text or overwhelmed by lengthy text, again, this is the perfect solution. So like I say, it's a solution that um, encourages independence, develops confidence, self-belief as well, and really gives the students the opportunity to be able to do things on their own, but without obviously the support of, of tutors yourself. You know, it's not, it's not a replacement for teachers, it's not a replacement for tutors, it's just really giving those students that independence access to the full curriculum and access to text. So obviously, we're going to go break for lunch. Chris and I are here. Um, we also have an incredible portal as well attached to the device. So as tutors, you can monitor and measure what the students are doing independently at home as well. I can't access it on here at the moment because all of our ca all of our laptops and computers are logged onto our screens down in the show. Um, but please do come down and see us on the stand. We will talk you through the, the application as the web app um, and again, show you exactly all that wonderful information that you can draw back to help you support your students moving forward. So thank you. Like I said, I could do death by PowerPoint, but realistically, it's hands-on. Come and have a go. See how it works yourself, but also as well, if I don't get around all of you today, then please do come down and you know, welcome you to the stand later Is on Is there today. gin and tonic downstairs on your stand? Oh. 
I think I've drunk it all. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to break now, but please do come up to Chris and Jennifer and ask for a play because there's lots of relevant applications here. Brilliant. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for lunch.
Just wanna love you, just wanna hold you, just wanna be with you till we grow old. Please tell me you'll stay or take me away. I want you for myself every single day. You set my world on fire. You set my world on fire. I just want you. I just need you, I don't know what it is to do, I just want you, I just need you, I don't know what it is to do, I just wanna love you, just wanna hold you, just wanna be with you till we grow old, please tell me you'll stay or take me away, I want you for myself every single day. Still got your pearls hanging by my bedside Still got your lips and paper in the trash now I never knew love could be so sweet I never knew it would sting I never knew love like this would leave I can't believe it's already over Too late to talk and fix whatever's broken I always thought love like ours would last I never knew love could pass Tomorrow comes and you are not around
Let's leave the past behind. Walk with me down the road. There's sunshine and light. Say you'll go. Don't make me wait. There's no need. our bags will be on our way the night was long as I waited without a sign 
the ones that you could no glimpse of doubt but where are you now years have passed and restless legs have set up but finally hung down is up we've been at the top Losing who I call myself today in this world of illusions, didn't dare to sing my name. That was when you came along, and I Carrying me for miles, here's where I belong. Life can be unfair, I just couldn't handle it. Still smell the bitter taste of misery. just need to love you like I do Cause I don't know where I would be or where I'll go if you weren't standing next to me Your arms have carried me for miles Here's where I belong I've been running away from now and everything, everything I've seen, recalling the things I won't remember in, remembering your feel, I can't deny it, just want to hide it and let it go away, but you 
have shown me that I can be free and face the world again. And I don't know where I would be or where I'll go if you weren't sitting next to me. Your love will carry me for life and I have carried me for miles here's where i belong where i belong here's where i belong here's where i belong I was never the one to write up a song for just anyone I, I was always the one to find myself lost in old conversations oh, Cause I've always been told that things will unfold if you keep on waiting But then you came along and proved me wrong, I was so mistaken Cause you glue all the pieces back together Yeah you, you take all my wrongs and make them better yeah, you, you're making me want to try forever And I feel so free Oh, my sweet baby I was never the one to give up the ghost No, I was so stuck I kept on playing my part Wanted to give up cause nothing was changing but with you it's so clear and now that you're here i see colors in every spectrum guess i finally learned my lesson cause you glue all the pieces back together yeah you you take all my wrongs and make them better yeah you you're making me want to try forever and i feel so free oh my sweet baby And I'm thinking out loud We won't need nothing else For the rest of our time And I know it so well I will always be by your side Cause you glue all the pieces back together Yeah, you, you take all my wrongs and make them better Yeah, you, you're making me want try forever and i feel so free oh my sweet baby cause you glue all the pieces back together yeah you you take all my wrongs and make them better yeah you you're making me want to try forever My sweet baby You said it was the last time But you keep coming back to tell me Sorry that you take back the things you said just to hurt me my love just went cold but i'm still burning my love just went cold Tried to build my walls up, but you're taking them down. 
to get over you again You said it was the last time That you keep coming back to show me Sorry you have changed now But it's the same old story My love just went cold But I'm still burning My love just went cold
This is rusty because there's eight of us in here and 48 of us out there. So I have forgotten how to use the voice. But that's okay because you guys will do exactly what you need to do. Yesterday, we had such an interesting moment when we were talking about hybrid learning. And Kirsten was like this. She was texting. And then and, and she posted. She was texting like this. And we were talking about something that was coming up on the board. We had a mentor meet up on the board. And uh, Kirsten piped up and she said, I haven't been texting and avoiding this conversation. I've got so many ideas about what we're talking about. Everything on the Mentimeter, four out of five comments, were Kirsten's, right? So what I wanted to point you to was that there are many right ways for us to learn. As adults, we know that. We know that adult education has to really take, um, show respect to the needs of every adult individual. But I think that we in this room know that the children need the same regard. They need the same consideration. And so these conversations that we have about technology that we have about online schooling, that we have about hybrid, that we have about um, chronic disengagement, all of these are speaking to the fact that we need to have some fresh ideas. Now, there are two people I know who are full of fresh ideas, and that is Kirsten and Carl. So we've just discovered that Kirsten and Carl met at a love tutoring, our first love tutoring hybrid event this time last year. We ran a session on defining excellence in tutoring at the Welcome Collection. And I will tell you something personal. I was terrified when we planned that session because I'd been in my home, ensconced in a safe space, showing up with my game face on and then switching off and feeling very, very comfortable with that. But when Odette and I started working together, she basically kicked my mm. She helped me find my shoes. She mopped me up off the floor. And she said, come on, girl, it's time to get out of this house. And initially, we just used to go to the British Library. And I used to write my book from there while she was working, speaking to tutors. Because that whole process of building ourselves up so that we can build up the children that we're supporting and having that real sense of purpose, I think is a journey that we've each been on. And I was just sharing with my new friends over here that most people in Qualified Tutor have had a good cry at one time or another. And everybody's got a guilty look on their face because we've all done it. Um, and the reason for that is the minute that you find a sense of belonging, the minute that you find that you're in good company of people who understand you, who feel the same pain and feel the same sense of purpose in making things better, all of a sudden you have a sense of ease and you have a sense that we can create spaces where some of us do English as additional language and some of us do science and some of us do maths and some of us do nothing but playing football with the children who really need an adult to spend time with them. But there's a common purpose here and that common purpose is to raise a generation that is healthier than we currently see around us and that we have to be, like Diego said earlier, we have to be the adults that they needed to, us to be. We have to be the humans that they need us to be. And we have to create safe spaces. So this is a safe space. I'm glad to welcome you back to the second half of Love Tutoring, day two at BET. This is our second panel on the subject of alternative education. Yesterday we spoke about tutoring and mainstream education, and now we've come out of that boxiness which knocks all the stars off, the sparkles off our stars, and invites us to think about what alternatives could look like. We looked at alternative provision, and now we're looking at online schools. And we have no two better people than to talk about that than our friends and partners in love tutoring, Kirsten from Gaia and Carl from Online School. Um, Carl is based in Dubai and so is live streaming the Love Tutoring Festival in his office, as you can see behind. And he's very generously partnered with us to help the digital experience of Love Tutoring be immersive and inclusive because some of us still haven't had an Odette to come and help us to get out the blooming house, right? So wherever you are, we are here to meet you just like you are here to meet your students. But this journey of online schooling is absolutely building aircrafts in the sky. You guys are brave because you are building a, a sector inside education that does not currently exist. And you are building it with a sense of need and purpose and commitment and authenticity. So this conversation is a fireside chat. 
This is friends shooting the breeze on what's working well in online schooling, on what needs to improve, on what the government hasn't blooming realized and they need to. And uh, there is a phrase that I picked up from Sir Ken Robinson in his amazing book, Just Imagine, where he says, rock and roll was not a government-led initiative, nor is online schools. These guys are rock and roll. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I think that was a really great way to remind us where we met and just where we were at with what you were talking about oh. at that event. Because I think one of the key parts of the reason we all are here is because we want safe spaces to nurture our children before we even teach them any specific thing. And um, we've got, Carl, uh, in the room here, some people from Melbourne. And I know you're joining us from Dubai. Um, and Italy, we have Italy. Italy, and the, the point, what Julia did Brazil. that day when we were sitting next to each other, I did remember that, was the, when you're building <laughs> aircrafts in the sky, because we are all dealing with this no matter what country we're in, or what you were talking about then was an international framework to keep children safe, to kind of, to allow us the space to build an aircraft in the sky, with some parameters because everybody needs just something to hold on to to go is this how does this we know we need something different but how can we take the fundamentals of what's important into a new space that hasn't been created yet and hasn't been regulated yet and so yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And, and we had this really interesting discussion when we were prepping for this um, around everything from regulation to um, to who we're hiring and why we're hiring them. Uh, and I think it'd be really interesting to kind of explore that that in front of everyone and, and see what people, people think. I mean, I guess a really good place to start might be why we got into online schooling. So... Um, I mean, Kirsten, why, oh, no. why did you okay. build an online school? <laughs> See what you did there. Yeah, you go, you go first there. Um, actually, as <laughs> I'm squishing this ball, because it comes to my answer, I have ADHD. I only realised that three and a half years into building an online school for my son who had ADHD. He was born in Australia, where there was more knowledge around ADHD, but I was absolutely terrified of him having that label. Didn't want anything to stop him achieving all that he could be and have in life, um, especially when I didn't understand what that meant. And I was really interested to see that if I changed his environment and allowed him to run more, move more, squish more, uh, he didn't look like he was a bad kid. He was brilliant at lots of different things, just needed a more flexible solution. So that was my... Um, my reason for it, but I think the the concept even, which maybe we should look at, of an online school, from when we're babies or we have babies, we teach them to sort things into colours and shapes and, uh. you know, even animals and insects and what's a dinosaur and what's a... Well, I was never very good at those classifications, but I think that is something that we we master or are taught to master very early on. So... You want to know which box you fit in and what something is and what the definition of is and how it works. And an online school in 2019 wasn't a thing. We hadn't gone into lockdown. We hadn't tried technology online. Tech was just a playful thing in, that distracted kids in the classroom. And so I think what Carl and I have seen over this period of time is a are working towards defining what an online school is, where it is, because it doesn't actually, in a place-based ideology, it doesn't, I can't show it to you, <laughs> but I can guarantee that as Carl and I talk, we will describe it to you and, and please keep an open mind and try to not be sitting in those boxes of, but is it like this and is it, and how could it, because all of those things, can can fit. So we're, so we're talking my, about staying curious. It's the stay curious. And I think for me, I was born in born in Johannesburg, 
I did my schooling in the UK. I started my career in Australia, where even though I did really well in all the boxes, I did, I tried so hard and I ticked them all and I came out with, we want to talk about this as well, of what, was that school that did that for me or, or something else? But then you go to a different context on the other side of the world and those same qualifications where you are celebrated as a genius are now, no, no, start by making the tea because we don't know what those things are. And we are increasingly living in a global society where we want our children to understand the world, their place in the world, have opportunities to travel. And so this concept of a global education that will equip them to understand the world was part of my driving factor. That is blooming awesome. Thanks. Go on, go for it. Yeah, I think, well, well for me, the, the sort of initial driving factor, well, I fell into education just to, just to start <laughs> off. I, I didn't really ever see myself becoming an educator for all the reasons that I now want to change education, I would say. Uh, I. I loved teaching. It was a big thing that I did whilst I was at university. Education's a big, always been a big part of my life. I was generally quite good at school. I went to study at Oxford. Like it was, it was something that I really valued, and and I, and I personally liked, but still kind of perceived as this dinosaur. I also, I almost thought I was tricking the system. Uh, that that I I, I've, I I know how to game this, and uh, and initially when I became a tutor, I, I kind of thought. Maybe that's what I'm doing. Like I'm not really doing anything more, more interesting than showing someone how I game the system to, to to achieve well within the system. And I remember leaving university and everyone saying, you know, you all you do is talk about your tutoring work. Why wouldn't you become a teacher? Or, or and I I just said I just don't think it's a I don't think it's an interesting career, and 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 that's not what I want to do. And uh, then I became an auditor, uh, which was uh, not a very exciting career to, to, to move into a, a, as an alternative. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I didn't like that. And I, I, I left that behind and I thought, what am I doing? I really don't know what I'm doing. And I actually, uh, I actually came to Dubai uh, slightly in pursuit of my, well, I say slightly, entirely in pursuit of my now wife, uh, who had moved to Dubai, and I was trying to convince we'd uh, we'd be perfect together. Uh, it works. We now have a kid, Carl. so uh, That's what this is <laughs> pursuit of passion. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm learning. There's, there's there's a learning curve for me. And then when when we uh, when I when I so I said, you know, I know I have this really transferable skill. I'm a good tutor. I know I'm a good tutor, and I'm gonna. Uh, I know some agencies out in Dubai. I'm, I'm just going to do that for a bit. Uh, and I really didn't see it even that as a career move. I just thought, oh, I have this skill and and, and I can use it uh, to, to my benefit at the time. And then I remember being asked in the first couple of weeks of, of joining this, uh, this company, uh, all right, homeschool this student, teach them the entire biology curriculum for GCSE. And I thought, oh, wow, I've not actually been asked to do that before. Uh, and, and I really jumped headfirst into it and I loved it and it was this alternative education, this was my introduction into alternative education. I saw the power that it could have to, to, to change students and inspire students to, um, to think about things they'd just not thought about before. Uh, but I also saw it as incredibly sort of prohibitive that actually most people couldn't, couldn't really afford to have this sort of education. And my move into building an online school really came from, from that motivation that I loved this mind opening, intellectually curious way of teaching. And I wanted to explore how more students could have that. And then as I kind of moved more and more into this space, I started to realize that, that, that some of the things I felt like this alternative education was solving uh, had been things that educators were complaining about for a long time. Uh, uh, and that was where then I, you know, I, I have a quite a clear vision on what I, I want to achieve, but it has been massively supported and honed by amazing people around me who who have come in and said, you know, we, we've been trying to solve this problem for years and, and, and maybe we can do it like this. Um, but I agree with you, Kirsten, like it's not really something you can point to. The entire point of the system we're building at the online school is for it to be flexible and agile and sort of by definition 
it shouldn't be this thing that I can just point to and hold a box to and say, it's this. Uh, and that makes it quite complicated, especially as one of the things we discussed about in the realm of regulation and how we get into accreditation and things like that. Well, I think especially because we need customers. Essentially, it's a business that we're building. And I think it's interesting you saying about um, going to Oxford. I'm a proud Oxford reject. Uh, tried, <laughs> failed, but <laughs> enjoyed the interview experience. Um, but that's good. We'll come back to that. Failure is good and sets you on a, on a different path. But I'm interested that then you end up going into a job that you don't necessarily love, but you see other people around you doing, or do we go into jobs for a financial uh, reward? And I do think that teaching isn't necessarily sexy. I trained as a secondary school geography teacher. Caricature is a man with um, mm -hmm. corduroys and <laughs> all of that. I think that why would young kids and the brightest like you were in the system at the pinnacle of what people look at of success in school aspire to go into educating when other industries are way more sexy and desirable like I but I think what online schooling has the opportunity to do is make teaching super sexy this is where machine learning and AI mm -hmm. and the tech is happening branding and like all of the cool stuff that you that is part of every kind of industry is something that you can experience in this but you also need to have a successful business paying customers and solving a problem that they are having that they are willing to exchange currency for and personalized yeah. learning in a human to human face to face scenario is very bespoke, very labor intensive, and understandably very pricey. So has always been the, um, you know, only available to a privileged few, which gives it a bad rap. Technology allows us to scale personalized learning, make it more accessible in more languages, countries, and everything that comes with that. So the accessibility works, but it also which reduces the price point, but you still need a customer. So in the UK, to get Ofsted accreditation allows access to a huge pot of money, government money, and understandably, people should be wary of tuition companies and new alternative provisions popping into the market every day now who are looking for access to that money. We do need a framework like Juliet. Um, you know, it, it's a consultative framework that needs to be global, that needs to transcend boundaries, but it also needs to be legitimate enough to keep our children in our country safe and meeting the objectives that society needs and wants for them. And I think there's a lot of strands that are pulled out in there, but your thoughts? <laughs> well, I, I think, I mean, yes, I, com I completely agree. I do, I agree with this idea of framework. And I think, well, some, sometimes I can be, uh, I can be quite antagonistic towards, towards the system. And I, I just had a post to do quite well on LinkedIn. And I think it was in part because there was swearing in the, in the video, but uh, it was also in part uh, because I because I called out the education system and and I always think that it's you, you've got to be careful to clarify that it's not actually the educators or the schools it's, it's it's sort of the system that's been set up in this way and I think for me the problem is that the system is largely not set up by people who are involved with it they are uh, and and I, and I actually see this as a as a bit of a problem with the the offset accreditation but I agree with the need for a framework like I think. What's interesting is schools themselves actually set up really great frameworks by which we as online schools can look at the best and say, that's a really good model. We're going to kind of cherry pick the bits that we like out of it and that will work in, a, in an online system. So having a framework is always really useful. But I do question a framework that is, you know, within its guidance actively says, 
they don't support the idea of full-time <laughs> online education. Uh, they say that it's only in exceptional cases that it has to be temporary. And I think at one point they accuse a parents of discharging the they, they accuse parents of, of, of discharging the duty uh, to secure an education for their kids through online schooling, as if online schooling is some lesser option. Um, yeah, and just to clarify, I think if in the room here, you're talking about the Ofsted framework. So last year, in March, was it, the um, Ofsted came out with a voluntary accreditation yeah. process for online schools to go through if they wanted to. But it very much, when we looked at it, and I think what those comments Carl was saying refer to is it looked very much like it was trying to replicate what the framework is for schools but in an online context when it is not understood the flexibility and the hybrid approach that are opportunities in that space and disregards a lot of things that make safeguarding harder and different but the real clincher was that it says fundamentally that online schools are not, not, not good, but shouldn't be kids' main form of education. Now, whether or not you agree with that, you can't apply a framework that says, this is a bad thing, we don't want this thing, but this is how it's going to work if it's going to be acceptable at all, because you're not being open-minded enough to be agile enough to move with this concept as it goes, and that makes it really hard to buy into something, a framework like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, if you if you look to somewhere like America, uh, where America has has huge numbers of homeschooling, it's it's, it's not niche by by any means. There's, there's quite a lot of homeschooling there, but it is regulated differently by state. You can find quite a lot of studies that say that increased levels of regulation seem to have little to no effect on student outcomes who homeschool. And so what we see here is that, that there is this, I, I feel that it's being painted as, as if online schooling is, is, is the sort of wild west of education, when actually everyone I know in this space is, is, is there to do a, kind of, a, a, a good job on it. And, and parents are usually you know, aware enough that if they're removing their child from school to do something like this, they they're looking usually for for companies or people they trust. Um, so I agree with the idea of a, of a of a framework. I'm not sure what effect that will actually have on student outcomes. It might make parents feel a bit safer and make the industry boom a little bit more, and we get more of those customers uh, as a result. Although, uh, but argue... who is regulating? I think is very important. I'd argue that we, well, the students that come to us have been let down by a system regulated by Ofsted. So to then choose another provider yes. with a framework that is having the same structure is not, it actually is something that parents, or certainly when we surveyed our parents at the time, it was categorically something they did not want us to pursue. And as a business owner, small business owner at the time, in a fragile market, the government wanted you to pay £10,000 to go through that process that they articulated they didn't know enough about, and they were almost going, it felt, personal opinion, that they were going to learn about it from people that were sort of brave enough to try it, and then they were going to say yes or no, and by that either condemn or... <laughs> Um, legitimize that and so it seemed like you could have an online school as long as you try to make it as much like school as possible so that you got the stamp of approval and that's not innovation so I had a hard time with getting on board with that and back to the geography I'm passionate about that it's place-based community relevance of a lot of these things. As much as this opens up the world and allows us to experience different curriculums and work across the country and internationally, um, people like place. I like being here. I wish you were sitting right next to me here, Carl. <laughs> and we can, by using technology, make the curriculum relevant to different communities. So when we work with a school, 
we have to go through the local authority and we go through their accreditation and their safety nets, um, just like we did when we came on board with Qualified Tutor. Like, you come in, you watch the classes, you look at our safeguarding, you look at our recruitment, you meet the teachers, you interview the customers, and that ensures that you've met a certain level. But it is still up to every school to make sure they are working with safe providers when they can't meet the needs of the kids in their community. And so they can get, be advised by their local authority what process to go through, but ultimately it's on their heads if they're choosing providers who are not quality assured. So every school and every multi-academy trust we work with, they will do that again <laughs> with us. And it's a very laborious process and it would be great if there was a stock standard, bro, you just do this and every time you can do it. <laughs> but I think it's right and relevant that we make it specific to place and we use technology in that way to adapt it to that specific place and what those kids need at that time and then we evolve that together. That to me is the power of tech and what an online school is and I still can't point to it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree and it, I mean, it is interesting. Uh, I mean, I used to run a, a tutorial college in, in Oxford and going through the Ofsted inspection there uh, was always, it, even that was quite challenging and tutorial college has been around for, you know, hundreds of years. And even we, we could not quite fit into the box because of the personalized delivery. And, and, and so I, I haven't got a whole lot of faith that, that, that it will, um, there, there, it, there is something that's coming and it will change uh, from Ofsted. But what is interesting is the international aspect. So we work, I'm here in Dubai right now, and we work uh, with uh, schools in the region here with the Ofsted equivalent, the, the KHDA. And uh, they're, they're actually surprisingly open to a conversation about these things, especially the sort of hybrid models that are, that are popping up. And they're incredibly supportive, but their approach to regulation in this space is, We've seen what you're doing. It's interesting. You're going to work in partnership with a school. Um, and as long as we keep clear and good lines of communication, we can explore the regulation together. And so they haven't imposed anything on us. They've just said, OK, we, we, we need to ag agree a framework. We need to say this is how we're measuring these students' success, the people who are going through this hybrid program. But uh, let's come back in a year's time and like understand and debrief and then actually make a structure that other people uh, can join in. Uh, and I think that's kind of the way this process initially started, but as you said, there were so many barriers to actually getting into that, um, that that was quite challenging. And it's actually why we have ended up shifting a lot of our service here to the UAE, because we get to work with a better framework while we figure out what an online school is and how we remain agile uh, whilst providing more structure. And I think that is an absolute travesty for the UK mm. that companies are having to leave to innovate in what you described as a really collaborative, full of communication process where you've been brave enough to try something different and we can learn along the way. And I think the UK government really need to be open-minded, curious and collaborative with this here in the UK because there is a very, very real problem and there is no benefit to being negative, to shaming parents, to sanctioning kids even more, to blocking access to technology, <laughs> so radical, closed-minded approaches because I'm waving my hands at this beautiful screen that is you are being projected into the room on and the tech, the clever tech that is ingrained in that, at the end of this will say whether I spoke more than you or you spoke more than me and what we spoke about and whether I was brave enough to get up and actually touch the board, but I'm not. I prefer to be verbally communicating to you. <laughs> and I can now share that data. I can share the learning. I can 
I can, we can find out whether the people in this room enjoyed it, got something from it, are going to come back again because they want to be involved in something like this in future. That's what I want to show to the government here and say, try it. Let's look at the data. Let's get the research. But the only way we're going to get that is if more schools and entrepreneurs and all that are going to be brave enough to try it. But my goodness, do not take somebody's creativity and the need to try out of your own curiosity or your desperate need to solve a solution and then try to work out how to stop it <laughs> or shut it down because that would be a tragedy, I think. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's what that we, we, we mentioned customers earlier and needing people uh, to actually to actually take our services. And I think um, that that in a sense isn't like it isn't a huge problem because there is such an underserved um, group of students that 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 feel the difficulty isn't that the market isn't there. The difficulty is that, that how do you communicate it within something that is so ingrained in the kind of public psyche as this is what a school is, and we have the same thing as you we, we we want to augment the experience not just copy paste it and what we see is that parents really struggle uh they, they kind of see it they're interested they're a bit worried about it being online but you give them a trial you let them do it for a time right. and just let them experience it and more often than not that's the best closer uh that, that anyone uh, you know convincing salesperson yeah and can it before you um I'm interested to know who your customers are, who are the ones that are brave enough, because I think there's also in the UK market of uh, the homeschool market here is very fragmented and very uh, divided and very angry and very hurt and very traumatized by the system. And I think uh, the last thing a lot of them want to even consider is to put their kids in front of a laptop. It's like that seems to be a really bad thing that they don't want to engage with. And it's until we say, well, try it, and look what we're doing. And they go, oh, I didn't realize this inspires my kid to get outside more, to do the lesson quicker so they've got more time in their day to explore subjects they've never tried. And yeah. So, so who are your, who yeah, are so brave enough to come to you and what are they looking for? Well, we're 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 very we're very mixed bag as I'm as I'm sure as I'm sure you are. Uh, we have found ourselves increasingly working with students that are um, that are looking for something a little bit more. So we try to we try to elevate subjects like um, entrepreneurship and and things that you would traditionally see as extracurricular uh, to a level that is the same as your maths. So. We don't say this happens at four o'clock when everyone else has gone home. You're gonna do it by yourself, and you know, just enjoy. But it's clearly not algebra. You know, uh, we embed it within the day, and we have this uh, sort of we're focusing at the minute on very entrepreneurship sort of skills, speech and communication, these things that the employers are crying out for. And we've got a lot of students that are just saying, "Ah, oh, we like that idea. We want to uh, we want to balance the curriculum in 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 that sort of different way." I would say be that that's sort of a big subsection of what we have and then and then another subsection is sort of people who are perhaps forced into homeschooling for 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 one reason or another and that could be that could be families that move we get a lot of families that move to different locations and i should say we don't just solely work with kids here in the uae we work all mainly all over europe and you get a family that the family has moved to another country because the dad's got a new job and They've, they've ended up falling between year 10 and year 11 and every school they've gone to has said now nah, go back and do year 10 and so we take them on and say okay we, we, we can take what you already know assess you and just carry you on and get you to the end and let you achieve what you want to achieve um so i'd say that's the kind of other big group that we work with these kind of nomadic families we're going to take Carl, we're going to get the, the room involved now. So I'm going to take the microphone around and we're going to see yeah. what questions and insights we've got from all the experts in the room. Coming to you next. I'm fascinated by this whole conversation, by the way. So I've got a million questions. I'll see if we can just <clears throat> drill down to one or two challenge. Um, I think, first of all, I, I resonate with 
you know, resistance quite a bit. Eight years ago, people thought I was explicitly told you never, this will never happen. You know, you know, it's um, <laughs> it's lots of employment in excess of, you know, this year in excess of twelve million pounds provided by no education to the education sector. So they can stuff that uh, view mm -hmm. somewhere else um, to begin with. Um, so keep going. Um, resistance will be there. So if I take my kind of entrepreneurial sort of hat off and come back as an educator and as a mental health practitioner, I've got two questions. How do you know this is a good thing for children? And the second is what children say um, once they use your, your platform? Uh, so I'll go first in that. How do you know it's a good thing and what they say? When you are dealing with something new and it has a lot of resistance, you want to have a bit of proof <laughs> in, in what you're doing. I felt that as an educator. I also felt that as a mother and going through a divorce and a lot of, a lot of parents come to us know, with one parent knowing that their child has additional needs, ADHD, it's hereditary, it generally comes from one and the other one doesn't believe it. And it has a huge effect on families. We see a lot of families breaking up and dividing over this. And so even from that point of view, my family said I was mad. No one would learn online. This was before the pandemic. And I knew because I'd seen how my child responded in class sizes of no more than 12, when the learning was tailored around what he was interested in, and he had lots of breaks in the day, so he could move around and chop and change, and that he could see the material before so that it wasn't, here's a new thing, I, I don't know where to put that. Just those concepts, he did well. The fact that you can do that online and deliver that, I lost my ball. <laughs> Carl and I are talking, I don't know how many minutes now, but you can, it, technology, enables that, augments that, that in an environment, thank you, <laughs> that's not a hugely expensive private school. Because private schools are the only places where you can have small class sizes, have lots of breaks, have lots of space and sports and music and art and drama. So it's a joined, it, it's a joined up approach. Now, the, to answer the question, this clever screen, like I was saying, has a lot of data points. And we heard um, from Selena Samuels talking about that her platform. There are hundreds of data points that show engagement. And like Julia said, I spent uh, one of the sessions yesterday contributing on the comments. It might look like you're not paying any attention to me, but Maybe someone's posting a thing about it on LinkedIn, or you're just listening because that's all that you want to do today. Or you're going to take the session out into the world and set up your own online school. We can learn in different ways. We, last year, we got a, um, we were recognized at the Tutors Association National Awards for how we were engaging students online. And it is about the data. It is about the evidence. Oh. We're doing that next. Um, behind it. <laughs> and in anything in education, it's the research that allows, I mean, like educators love the research. We want to know what effect these things are, are having on kids. But when we piloted this two years ago in a school in Birmingham, at a very brave and courageous head teacher who took a chance on us because this was prior to Ofsted and he had fought so hard for his outstanding in a special needs school that had four different sites where there was a farm and then another place which was all very tactile and then and then one site where kids did functional skills and GCSEs. And there were still some kids that would not come in even to the farm. And so he heard what we were doing and he said, don't know why, but I'm going to trust you and give you a chance on this. I've got these six kids that I can't get them in at all. See what you can do. And I, the, sto the stories are stories that you know from what you do. Is a girl who had 
was horribly abused, had given up everything, was selling drugs outside the school just because she'd had enough. Um, she came out with six GCSEs, the highest in the whole school, and we got her RS and I think she did statistics from scratch, and we were only given them for three months just before their exams. She went on to do, um, well, she went to a, a summer camp, and her next steps were to carry on her education, to become a lawyer, to stop other girls being abused like oh. she was. Another boy would not come out of his room for anybody, um, and we sent him up a Fitbit to aid the lessons that we were doing. And if he could go to the shops to buy a piece of equipment to do his science lesson with, emotional about this, he, um, we then had the data on how far he'd walked. And we could use that in the maths lesson. And he had gone out and he'd seen the sky. And he was part of the meetings that we had with the local authority and his grandmother. He wasn't allowed to see his mum at the time. And he said he was that building confidence. And you can't measure that on a graph with a thing and a plus and a minus of your... It was, it changed his life. Um, kids that don't know that they know stuff and that they can learn just because they get access to it where they're not bombarded with a whole lot of other stimuli and they can just focus on the question and they can watch somebody else do it. You don't get, you're not normally allowed to watch somebody else puzzle through a maths problem, but he could. And the teacher realized that both of these kids were brilliant at maths. One just had a higher processing speed than the other, and the other needed to express it in a different way. But their narratives on themselves completely change. And that's how, child by child, it's bigger than the data. But the data is what the government want to see and the frameworks that you want to fill. So. Thank you very much. I, I think I understand the product a bit better now, because it's, it's complementary, isn't it, to a uh, school it could be uh, i'm not limiting it to that i, I hear that <laughs> loud and clear it's it's like an insult to an entrepreneur isn't it to limit <laughs> something to one tiny you are just not a this. product it's a it's a movement of I course think. it is i feel it <laughs> julia feels it i'm with you trust me um but but some people don't see it same way as we do so and it's for us to emotionally become aware of that and understand how to communicate that to other people but i love what you're doing thank you very much thanks uh crystal you ready Please introduce yourself first. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Crystal from Crystal Clear ESL. Nice to see you both again. Uh, mine is more of an observation, really, because you said something earlier, Kirsten, about um, Ofsted wanting you to pay them. And I think that they should be paying you for the opportunity to think outside the box yeah. and find an alternative that solves a solution or solves a problem that they have in that framework. They're failing the students who aren't in the mainstream system, and this is a solution you've laid out right in front of them. So I think everybody here would just say, like, well done and keep it up. Yeah, yeah, there should be an and, But it is that collaborative right. process. I'm not saying I've got it all right, or that it's it's a journey to it. And every time we, are, we hit another um, community that we're working with with a slightly different context, and we need to rewrite the policy to suit that Thing. And so we revise it over and over and over again. And Carl and I talk, it's like, what's going on with where you are? And I wonder if you wanted to add some of your thoughts. Yeah, well, just to add to, to I think, uh, Diego's question about um, how do we know it's good? I mean, it, it is it is something, in a sense, that, as, as you mentioned, Kirsten, that is measurable. We can see that students' grades improve. We can see that their attendance improves. Um, but there's all this kind of qualitative data that comes out of it as well, where, where we can see that the the mood improves, their attitude to learning improves. And you ask what the kids say, and we have kids that literally come back to us and say, this is amazing. Can you make me a course on marine biology? Because I just discovered this thing. And we, we, we try to, in what we try and provide, so we're a combination of asynchronous and synchronous learning. And we uh, we make these courses where we try to meet kids where they are. So we, we don't say, 
and we've watched this happen with some of the big name online schools where they have pre-recorded content. And if you if you look, because they are very brand focused, their suits and ties and library backgrounds and you know all, all, all this kind of stuff, and it just doesn't resonate with with kids. And so we said in our in our content approach, we, we won't do that. We'll try and meet them where they are and look at what they're watching. And we've had kids who've come back to us and be like, "Make me a course on the physics of music," and we'll go. This is this is what we want. This is what gets us excited. Students coming back and being like, we want to learn something that's not on the curriculum and we want to learn it the way you want to teach it. <laughs> and I think that is that is both uh, positive feedback from the kids, but also proof that it's working alongside good test scores, alongside the fact they get the qualifications, but really al alongside the fact that they like like me, I get lost. I, I, I reach this sort of pinnacle of education and then I fall into becoming an auditor because everyone else was doing it. I had no idea why I wanted to do it and, and, and you know, and, and it really wasn't right for me. Uh, I think I would have really benefited from someone being a bit of a mentor to me and being like, try all these things with the skills that you know and maybe you'll enjoy them, you know. And to the point about being an entrepreneur and your course on entrepreneurship is this is the way we work today. Everybody here has got a tuition business of their own. You, you don't know what you don't know until you figure it out and then you go, I'm a bit lost. Julia, what do you do about this? <laughs> or you ask a friend or you go, I need a course on branding. I don't, and off you go to, to find that. And it, it's the coaching and the mentoring and the skills around that that are gonna be, that, that's what we're doing right here. Why not equip the kids Come on. Well, that, that's a very good point. And actually, yeah. oh, sorry. Carry, can, carry on, yeah. Go ahead, Carl. I'll, I'll just add, it, it, it's an interesting point what you say, because a lot of the actual courses that, and this is actually the way we genuinely build our programs now and our content and our uh, curriculum, is we have tutors that are really passionate in th about things. We ask them what they're passionate about, and then we do it. And actually, the entrepreneurship side of things was born out of the fact that we just a year learning all this stuff and we thought this is really interesting i wish you would have told me this sooner why don't we just build something that works at a student level um and actually we never ended up we actually ended up finding a partner to do it we did it with eight billion ideas and and and, and said why why would we reinvent the wheel they're the experts you know carl we've got um a couple more questions or comments daisy's very kindly come into the middle so that you can see her as well she needs to stand a bit to the left Yes, there she is. <laughs> um, so I had a question Hello. around. Hi, I had a question around like community <laughs> in terms of like socialization of students because I personally um, spent a lot of time. I mean, I was fourteen, like sixteen years ago, but I spent a lot of time because I couldn't access so the social side of my school in person. I spent quite a lot of time actually in online communities. So my question is: We say that like the online school hasn't got a location. <laughs> like physically, ge geographically, but how do you create like the community of a school Ooh, online? Great question. <laughs> like, how do you, how do you like, how do they communicate basically, the students? Thank you, thank you, that's uh, really yeah, so I think, uh, Carl, i do that, but also everybody, it's the same way that Julia has organized this event. It, it's, we are using- I asked Hannah. Oh. <laughs> Well, Hannah, <laughs> but it's that we have, that, we that's have an what we augmented do. I know, hybrid right, community. We have, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think, no, I, I completely agree. It is, um, I Kirsten actually mentioned it earlier that there's often this, there's often this sort of myth that social interaction suffers at the hand of, uh, of online schooling. And actually what we often do is, is condense uh, uh, programs into short periods of time, which allows students to either, in some cases, explore more learning and in other cases, socialize. And so in the locations where we're based, we're, we, we actually made a real effort to go out and find, you know, really great uh, extracurricular activities. And in some that became really popular, we actually run our own class. So all the other kids that are actually on the online school kids. And um, and so you can build communities like that. You can kind of get them to go out into different places. But I also think there is no reason to think why a digital community is is not just as valuable. And it was something that we put very first when we started building the online school. We made the online school very visual. So your chemistry classroom literally looks like a 
sort of stylized chemistry classroom. This is something you can personalize, but it's also something you can show to other students. And we have an area of the platform, which is all about kids interacting with each other, that's, student mo that's tutor moderated. And so we see this as we want to actually build digital communities and digital skills alongside encouraging them to go to those physical communities because now they've got the time. Um, and I think community, and again, what is community and where is it and where is a safe place for you to access a community? I, mean, I think I had at least a year of my life where I shut out the world and just kept very safe in what I could manage. Um, but the, we've had a new intake of lower secondary school students and when they did their onboarding, I took those classes for the first week and settled them in. Now I don't, and you're going to meet our lovely head of learning, Nikki, in the next session. But most of the teaching is now, I don't do the teaching anymore. Uh, I miss it, but I did, I covered a couple of classes last week, and I was very warm and fuzzy inside to go into the virtual classroom space and the kids chatting to each other like friends, like sharing their jokes, starting off the lesson just just at kids, they're kids, they've come into the class like we do, talking. And that bit of the community that, so my son actually had to do some of the classes recently and he said, mom, I didn't realize what all the stuff you say, it feels real because those kids are like me as well. Wow. And they've also been kicked out, but he's like, but they're cool and they're, they're interesting when they, well, they're pretty or they were whatever it is that he, it's a place to realize you're not alone. And for me, sharing my story and the bits that are hard and not pretty has helped me to feel more part of a community through that online interaction than I've ever felt in the real world. And we certainly felt that from you. Um, we've got a couple of, because of the online community that we are including here, mm -hmm. we're gonna hear from the online community as well and then we're gonna start wrapping up. Hannah? Hi, hello. Ooh. Um, so we had some really lovely questions going on. Um, Can we just talk about them as questions rather than actually ask the questions? Yeah. Let's just hear the questions. Um, All right, and then we're going to... So ask. Helen Reed said that being social is online now in so many ways. Perhaps the whole definition of being social, sociable is changing. Um, and Jeremy said, as a nation, do you think it's possible that there might be a way to open government's minds to new innovations? <laughs> And what are the chances? Jamie's been really active online, actually. Thank mm -hmm. you, Jeremy. Um, and he also mentioned that it's cyclical. The more we are told we could mess it up if we try new things, the more we worry we might not get it right. Oh. Do you want to speak to that quickly about resilience? And Oh, gosh, I, there's no more vulnerable that I feel every single day of my life. And I've, I worry and I don't sleep because it, I don't, you don't, you don't, muck around in the space. It's like, Carl, he could have been an auditor, he could have done any other business in the world. You don't go into this one oh. to mess it up or make mistakes. And so, but, it, but it, it has to change for my children. I have two particular out of the three that I have who are suffering because of the way the system is and the ripple effect that it has on them. So. I don't have a choice. I have to stand up for what they need. And that that's what it is. But I could, go, the government could come down any minute and go, any school that is not Ofsted accredited is now, cannot operate in the UK. That is absolutely a possibility. And it's a very wise decision for Carl to be over in. Just squeeze that squeezy ball as well. In the UK, it gets but, really stressful. but with tech, I can just locate somewhere else uh -huh. because people still need this. And it's the parents who will are the ones that are demanding it. And so they're voting with their feet. They are signing up to our schools because they want something different. They want global lives and to travel and they want the best opportunities for their kids. So this is where they're getting the best opportunities. And Carl and I are not in competition because at the end of the day, parents choose schools because they like and trust and want a person leading that thing. So there is space for all of us in this and there is space to collaborate and share resources because it is still a very human exhausting job and, and Carl and I don't probably get a lot of respite in this. But so don't, we don't all need to do all of it. We need to go, you're really good at that bit. We're really good at this bit. Let's, you know, 
Beautiful. Let's hear some closing insights from Carl as well, please. Yeah, I think that what Kirsten just said is, is exactly right. It, it's actually a requirement that we're all different and we go head first into our niche and don't actually try to um, be all things to all people. Uh, and then it's a requirement that we collaborate to make this space work. I think that uh, what works for my students might w probably wouldn't work uh, for Kirsten's students. And if Kirsten meets a student that, that my education or another online skills education might work for, she knows where to direct them. I think that was brought up in the last session, knowing where to signpost. And I think that we would do exactly the same thing. We would know, well, you won't quite fit our model, but luckily I know other people in this space and I know a model that's really gonna work for you. And I actually think that that's what personalization at scale is. I think if you asked me five or six years ago, I would have said, no, one player can do it. They can personalize to everyone. And actually uh, I've completely changed my view on this. And it's, it's lots of people offering a wide variety of specialisms and then letting parents choose. Yeah, and sharing the, the research to show the impact, as you're saying, because that's what changes policy yeah. and that's what gets governments oh, to collaborate and the world to be a better place. So, we'll start. <laughs> okay, so, my lovely friends, we're going to wrap up here. Carl, thank you so much. Kirsten, thank you so much. You hit all the notes. You hit the notes about that tension, but also alignment between being an educator and being an entrepreneur. You hit the notes about being colleagues and not competitors. And I would actually challenge the phrase collaboration because I don't think you collaborate. You're doing your thing and you're doing your thing, but you behave like colleagues because you're in a shared profession, which is not the same as collaborating, which means I'm going to take this out of my pocket and give it to you. Maybe it's inspiring each other because it's the thing about failure. If more people are mm. brave and just go, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. You, you just keep doing it. If you keep doing it, I'll keep doing it. And then... I will tell inspires you, more people. Diego did that for me. When Diego and I started working <laughs> together. Oh, well, you'll see, you'll hear in just a second. <laughs> Diego and I first met in the deep, dark depths of COVID. You were wearing your yellow jacket. And we, and we, and we, <laughs> and, and we met, we met in, a, in a, one of the bars that was allowed to be open for whatever reason at that time. And you used the phrase, yeah? you use the phrase building aircrafts in the sky. And what you just said to these guys about, I'm turning over real money, which signals to you that there's real children who are getting interventions mm. all day long. You've given us heart. You've given us a sense of um, reassurance. And, and that's really generous because we are all at different stages of this journey. So we were talking just now about the problem with understanding what to do as a tutor, how to be as a tutor, is you can't see it, right? So these collegial conversations are about lifting the lid. In my mind, it's almost like lifting a rock, right? Removing the shadows, shining a light on, and seeing all these beautiful good practices. I'm looking at you, Crystal, because there's so much beautiful good practice going on in this room. And, and for, me, for me, these conversations just reassure and reignite um, and continue that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a short break for Kirsten to take a deep breath. And then she's going to be telling us about not the product, but the movement that is Gaia Learning. I'm not going to tell you anything. Nikki and I are going to show you. Even and better. We're going to hear from our uh, partners in Manchester who use. Woohoo! So we'll be back in 10 minutes, precisely 10 minutes. Let's go.
Okay. Hello, London. This is Manchester Calling. Can you hear us?
and then we'll do some stuff. <laughs> then we'll do a dance. Right, you all know me. I'm Kirsten, founder of Gaia Learning. Very passionate about making learning flexible and challenging where and how learning happens. We have been working with the lovely Newbridge group uh, since, well, September time? Okay, we... Well, summer, summer, summer. Yeah, summer, summer time where they started the conversations and um, started working with some of their students. And only a couple of weeks ago, the space that they are in in Manchester opened. Um, I'm going to let Andy tell you all about it, where it is, but just so you know, for everybody watching, me and Niki, who is our head of learning at Gaia. Uh, we are in London at the moment. <clears throat> Andy and team, do you want to introduce okay. yourselves and tell us where you are about the Nurture Base and then introduce um, our other lovely guests and then Niki will talk at the end about how we engage these students and some of the approaches we take to teaching that's different to traditional school. Take it away, Andy. <laughs> Kirsten, thank you very much, and hello London. Uh, anyone who's old enough to remember, uh, I'm always reminded of the 1985 uh, Live Aid concert when it was the very first time they did something of this sort, streaming from Los Angeles. I wish we were in Los Angeles, but we're not. Uh, we are somewhere even better. Instead, we are in Greater Manchester. Um, we are Springboard Project. Uh, that is a specialist SEMH provision as part of a trust here in, in Eastern Manchester. Uh, as Kirsten said, we are part of a trust called Newbridge Group. Newbridge Group specialises in supporting young people with uh, special educational needs. We support every type of young person with special educational needs within the group uh, and every age. So the trust covers everyone from uh, from year one right the way through to key stage five and age 19 and even beyond. And all our young people in the trust have special educational needs. The trust as a whole serves in excess of 1,600 young people across Eastern Manchester. A uh, bit of echo there, you're in, guys. I think that could be Megan and Charlie who might need to mute because we're getting a bit of feedback. Um, we here at Springboard, uh, we, so we, we work with young people with social, emotional, and mental health needs. So that's everything from ADHD through to deprivation, trauma, school-based anxiety uh, and, and other related issues. Uh, our stated aim is to do everything we possibly can to help our young people achieve the best they can, rebuild their confidence, rebuild their trust. And a very big part of that is the building we're standing in. I apologise for that we've got no chairs. That is because, as Kirsten said, this building literally only opened a few weeks ago and we are still approving orders for the furniture to arrive. But where we are here, this building is what we call our nurture base. So we recognise that a lot of young people really struggle to go to school and go into mainstream school. Um, and for lots of different reasons. Uh, a big part of that one is the environment, is the space. So we've created the Nurture Hub here, which used to be, and I love this, this used to be the Citizens Advice Bureau for Oldham. Uh, and we still get people banging on the door wanting advice uh, from us. And we have to explain that we've changed what we do ever so subtly. <laughs> the Nurture Hub here, though, provides education in a very different way. It's a, it's a major part of our programme. Our aim is to give our young people full-time education and, and we absolutely are committed to making sure our young people have access to four, five, six, seven, eight level twos GCSEs. We're planning in a couple of years time to be part of the T-level program, making sure our young people can go to university uh, and we're having partnerships with employers uh, and universities locally to make sure our young people have access to that. But we recognize for a lot of young people, it's a journey. Uh, and, and a big part of that journey is getting them to feel confident in themselves and to understand that they can take control of their learning in their way and in a 21st century way. When I met with Kirsten and her team and the guys at Gaia Learning, it was very clear there was a massive synergy between our passions and our beliefs for young people and our aspirations. And it was a very easy win to work in partnership with them uh, because they are a massive linchpin in what we're now providing. We have a tiered approach where our young people that really struggle to engage work through a, a tiered level of engagement with us. 
uh, and, and she's vanished off the screen now, but Charlie, who is one of the people I'm going to introduce you to in a minute, is, is one of my assistant heads who works with our adapted curriculum students. These are students who can't access in the classroom. They, uh, they, they do it in a number of different ways. We, we educate people in cafes, in libraries, in their homes, and here in the Nurture Hub. But what Gaia Learning do is a big part of the, of the jigsaw puzzle that's been missing. They integrate with us and they provide those live lessons. Uh, so our young people engage with Gaia using this technology uh, to deliver and to gain that, that, that real learning experience that, 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 that they miss by any other technology, any other means necessary. So they, they still have that chance to do that. The exciting thing here is our hybrid learning hub. You can see the tables around there are going to be chairs. Next door to this, we've got a dining table that's going to be for, the, for kitchen sink ex science experiments as well. Um, and the idea is that all that is delivered through Gaia Learning in this area. So young people can either come into this space and we engage in lessons here using the screen, or they can, as Megan and Charlie are joined from their iPads somewhere else, anywhere else. Megan and Charlie literally are only about 500 meters away in one of our other buildings but they could be in their home, they could be in the cafe, they could be anywhere else going around. That's what we're passionate about, is giving young people every opportunity to engage in learning and gain that confidence and grow, and this is what we're about. Introductions-wise, in the room with me here, uh, I've got Adam, wave, there we go, who is my assistant head who oversees our curriculum. So Adam is very much working with the guys from Gaia to make sure that their curriculum is integrated with ours, that the language we use is, is common across there. Our, our structures, our systems are, are common with that one. Also in the room with me is Mike, my deputy. Uh, Mike is my liaison with our third party partners. So Mike works very closely with our careers advice and guidance uh, and our university partners to make sure our young people are integrated to there. And again, making sure that what Gaia do with us streamlines them into that next place. And then joining us remotely, we've got Megan, who is on screen. Give us a wave, Megan. There we go. Uh, Megan there is, is my careers lead, so she very much is responsible for helping our young people see what their next steps are. And I don't know why her camera's turned off, but Charlotte, Charlie is, is, is there as well. Uh, and, and she, like I say, works very closely with the students that use this space on our one-to-one -one program. Back to you, London. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, Thanks. Yeah, it's really nice to see you guys on the big screen as well. Um, so I am, as I said, head of... I don't usually get this nice big screen, actually. Usually I have my laptop. Um, but we're, we're able to demonstrate it, which is really exciting. And um, so what we just wanted to show you was the kind of what, how we can use this platform and also how we as Gaia use it. Um, so for example, let me just check everyone has permission. Charlie, give you permission as well to draw. Um, so for example, one of the ways Gaia makes sure that we are meeting the needs of our students is every student gets an onboarding. Even if it's a very quick onboarding, it's still some conversation to know what the students are into, so how we can tailor the lessons um, and make sure that we can support them in the best way possible. I mean, we'll get the background, of course, like every other school with the care plan, EHCPs, all that kind of thing, but we want to hear it from the students too. And this is the kind of thing that we'll do. So uh, everyone can see on the board, I hope, uh, that what you need to know about me um, and everybody can write on it. So um, Megan, could you maybe tell us what one of your interests and hobbies are? <laughs> uh, you're on mute if you want to say it out loud as well. You're very welcome. Did you, <laughs> did you just? <laughs> Sorry, I did it. Um, yeah, so my interests are sleeping. Um, I like to do that a lot. Do you want me to write Would it? you like to write it or would you like me to write it? Nice. I can write. Sorry, it's a little bit. Brilliant. There you go. Sleep. Sleep. Beautiful. <laughs> Great, we like sleep. Um, like that. that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and yeah. So Megan's joining in from iPad, laptop. Question. I am from iPad, yes. iPad, yep. Uh, you can join in from a laptop and iPad. And as you can see from the very big space there, um, Andy and Adam and that crew are joining in from uh, a big screen like this. So they can also actually write on the board. So I don't know, um, Andy, do you want to tell us what, what do you find hard these days? <laughs> That's easy. Waking up. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I see a trend going on around here. <laughs> um, We're very tired. Oh, yeah. yeah, it all makes sense. Um, so we will usually just write, I'll write my name in here. That's not a pen. That's oh, well. I've got it. <laughs> um, we'd usually write, I'll write my name in here. Um, the name of a student in and we'll fill this out together so everyone knows it's not it's not just me working with all the students we have other educators who work in a very similar way so once we get an onboarding with one student they don't have to repeat themselves loads of times we'll save something like this doesn't have to be this and we will share that with all the educators that interact with that student so that we know what their favorite subjects are, what their interests are. If we do a math lesson and we might base that math lesson around football statistics because we know that student is very into football. Um, they don't have to tell us every time we've shared that knowledge and it's, it's great. Um, so the basic ability to draw and like sketch up on the board is really great. Um, and we have camera. We don't require students to have their camera on. This is a touchy subject among some people. Um, we like the fact that students can meet us where they're at. So students do not have to speak. They can use the chat. Oh, that is not the chat. The, this is different from my laptop. There's the chat. Um, so these guys were using the chat before we joined. We were late, sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so they can use the chat. They can communicate on the chat without speaking verbally. If they're not ready for it, there you go. Andy said hello. Um, and they can use microphone. They can use camera just like normal. But we don't require any of that. Sometimes a student will turn up and just watch the lesson. And that is more education that they've got than they've had for months, if not longer. Can I just also say how we are a school supporting a school yeah. is like what Nikki said there, that we, we have daily staff meetings, weekly educator meetings. Uh, Nikki and Adam chat a lot and talk Too about the, <laughs> <laughs> the matching the curriculum. And so if there's a particular theme in PSHE, there was a lot that you guys were doing around knife crime and, and things like that, that we also pick up those same themes and make sure that we're talking about them. So we operate like a school and so do they, but we also do together, which is very unique. Yeah, and, and we'll follow, so some of our students, some of your students, guys, sorry, um, will do different exam boards for different things, like your functional skills, the level two is AQA, and entry level is at Excel, and um, the GCSEs are doing our Cambridge curriculum. It's a whole mix, and we can flex, which is quite cool, and we can collaborate, and we can basically provide what the students need within whatever curriculum they need and put them in classes appropriate to that. Um, so we have the ability to draw and to <laughs> the ability to draw and speak and all that. Um, and another thing we like to do is, and this is not unique, but this is definitely how we try to pitch all our lessons, is by making things relevant to the real world. So you'll have seen in our, um, was that Andy? Did you retire when you grew up? <laughs> um, so Andy wants to retire when he grows up, so he'll struggle to fill out a payslip. Um, <laughs> but for example, a nice segue, I, uh, my specialism is STEM. Um, so when I'm teaching students, usually it'll be math and science. And for example, when I get a new student, something that's really useful, even if they don't like maths, they do want a job and they do want to get paid um, and they'll have something even if they want to be an astronaut or they want to be a gamer, a professional gamer, they'll have something they can do. And we will start on percentages because we're going to learn about tax, which is a really funny thing that students actually get excited about learning. They come home and be like, we learn about tax. And it's like, I hope you say that for the rest of your life with that level of excitement. Um, so we'll look at something like a, t a pay slip and what that means and we'll break it down. So for example, what we might do is, um, uh, Adam, what did you want to be when you grew up? Professional footballer. Professional footballer. Well, that's going to be a really fun pay slip. Um, uh, do you want to, we've got a browser up, Adam. Do you want to t see what, if you can find out what the um, average salary of a professional footballer is? <laughs> Are you able to type? Try that. Just trying to find type tech text. There we go. Because you don't have a. Can you type? <laughs> yeah, it's just shared. Yeah, this is brilliant. 
Yeah, <laughs> They're trending searches, not our history, by the way, <laughs> for clarification. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we question the UK search history, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want do you want me to type no, it? Is it <laughs> Me Megan? What did you want to be when you grew up? Maybe you can type because yeah. you've got an iPad in front of you. It's easier. Yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, I wanted to be a paramedic. Oh, I, a I think you're actually just typing on the screen, but I will type it in for you. Don't. Oh, you know. that's all right. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> Para. No, none of these guys are actually our students. So they haven't, these are teachers being students. <laughs> FYI, our students are better at typing it. No offense, guys. <laughs> <laughs> paramedic salary. So um, a paramedic will get a starting, that's, that's depressing, isn't it? A starting salary of 25,655. Um, so let's write that. Oh, I minimized it. 25,665, Megan, um, where we've got our total payments. Ooh. Yep. Yeah. Um, where we've got our total payments, can you write underneath what your, if you were a paramedic, what your starting salary would be? Yeah, on the actual slip. Yeah, right. I'm not on pen anymore. This is much bigger to move around oh, yeah. than my laptop. It's right here, yeah. <laughs> you can write yeah. it. Oh, okay. Uh, right. If it's too small, don't worry. Write it wherever you can write it. Okay, sorry, it's because I'm using my finger. That's all right. <laughs> oh my God, sorry. I don't know why I'm writing like a five-year-old. <laughs> when you're using your finger, it's pretty difficult. All right. Really sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, great, thank you, Megan. Um, so for example, we might do something like this um, and we'll start talking about what these things mean. What does income tax mean? What do national insurance mean? And then we need to figure out what a percentage is. How do we even figure that out? Um, and we'll have discussions about it. So it's not just a math lesson, right? It's a life lesson. And it's a, is this ethical? Should we be doing this? We might go into the breakdown of it, depending on the level of the student, right? So we might have someone that their limit is going to be, we can work out 20% for now, and that's fine. Or we'll start with that. And then we might start looking at the breakdown about higher level taxes and how we break that down. And if you ever, I don't know if you've ever tried to do that manually without like a little tax calculator, it's really difficult. You've got to like minus the other bits from it um, to figure out how much is left so you can see what's 40%. Anyway, um, if, if we were doing Adam's professional footballer salary, we'd definitely get into the higher tax bracket, I imagine. Um, and we'd have to break that down. So maybe a more advanced student would be able to do that and we'll break it all down and we'll write it in here um, typically I'd get a spreadsheet up and they'd also use how to learn how to use a spreadsheet I'm not going to try that right now we're, we're not going to teach everyone how to use a spreadsheet on a whiteboard um, but, but yeah and so they get that skill as well and the idea is we're trying to link everything to life we're trying to make everything useful we're trying to link everything back to what they talked about what they're interested in we might add to this later right they might find out they're more interested in other things as well and we'll add to that and this gets shared so in their english lesson maybe they'll start looking at how to write a good cv bio um, it can connect up it doesn't have to they can have multiple interests and they can have separate lessons and they might literally just be preparing for an exam around the corner and we'll we'll do exam practice as needed but the idea is that we have this option and we can tailor it as much as possible and the technology helps us do so, whether they're in a live classroom like Adam, Andrew and Mike, uh, or whether at one-to-one -one, like Megan, we might just have one-to-ones and no one's in the live classroom, we might just have the live classroom. Um, but it's the combination that makes it so valuable for us, basically. Um, and obviously I didn't quite get to the bottom of it, but we can work out some percentages and do some regular yeah, not well. now but we no, won't no, I won't make anyone do any percentages here <laughs> um, hopefully that's given you a tiny insight into answering the original question that I was on a panel with today how do we engage kids we're making it relevant we're reimagining where and how it can be done but Andy if we, I'm gonna make you a bit bigger here and if you can maybe just uh, do what you did the other day and turn flip it round so that you can show where the cameras are and the, this is the bit where I say making the tech invisible I'm glad Nikki did that because I don't like all the the, the, the touching of, the, of the, the tech stuff all the time so how can we be in a room together and keep being human and feeling all right. 
That's because so that's so big, isn't it? In the room. Uh, we don't have a tracking camera right here, so oh, no. Right, but you were but there theirs is set up for that. We're, we're in the camera in the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so if I was if I was stood here, they would. But that's a pretty inefficient way to teach. Mm -hmm. So we would set that up differently if I was actually teaching on this. Um, but yes. Anyway, the the tech aside and the setup less important. Andy, can you just <laughs> leave us with the impact that this is having? on students and hear from any of your lovely team? Absolutely, I mean, from, from my perspective, I think the, the impact is very much about being able to give our young people access to uh, a proper education, even when they're not in a place to go into a physical building that looks or feels like a classroom. So that ability to actually bring them on that journey and give them the confidence to, to engage in their learning is, is a really crucial thing and working with Gaia and working within this sort of technological space allows us to really continue our, our values and visions as a setting to make that move forward. Uh, I'm going to ask Adam to perhaps give a couple of examples where we've got students that have really started to engage with learning who've never really been involved in that before. Yeah, like Andy said, this has helped us uh, just build on everything that we're trying to do. And without using this, we've got students who are off site who are engaging in maths, English, science lessons, and working towards their exams and without this they wouldn't have had the, the chance to do that and get the quality of education they imagine to get uh, they're building they're attending sessions daily uh, which they weren't able to do in uh, a traditional setting and then the idea is that we bring them into this space where they then start interacting with each other that, that social element of learning while still engaging with the teachers and the technology that they're used to using and then going forward for us one of the big developments that we've identified is, is that really big topics in the headlines at the moment about emotional school-based avoidance, young people that are missing from education who are not wanting to be in these big two, three, four thousand place secondary schools. Uh, and we're looking at working with the local authority to provide through Gaia a, a means by which those young people can still maintain their crucial maths and English and science qualifications within this space, partnering specialist provision online learning providers with the local authority and mainstream secondary working collaboratively together and i think we're one of the first in the country that's starting to pull all these threads together so that's i think where i'll leave it from manchester back to you guys manchester Thank you, you are overflowing Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, you may not retire just yet because no. we need you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Another person would you like to wrap us up? Is there anything further? No, I just want to say thank you so much for doing that and giving us the space to show this. It's not just words. It's not just, oh, wouldn't it be nice? It's happening. Look, they're doing it. And it's having an impact, yep. real human impact on real lives. So thank you very much for and, being and I brave. Think, I think, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, I, I think the other thing that we um, all noticed is that Nikki's an awesome educator. Aww. Yeah, so <laughs> your enthusiasm, your clarity, your encouragement of Megan and her handwriting um, were, were all skills that we already know and live by and are committed to, right? At no point did you make anybody feel worried in the room or, or outside. And so that consistency and that commitment of first being an awesome educator and then using the tools that help you to amplify your reach that, you know, that's fantastic. And we've been talking consistently about the relationship between the industrial size of things and the technological, you know, impact of things, but ultimately the human element and relationship. She can get so much further. Right. And have more impact. On right. And, and, and this relationship also. So this role of the leader developing the tutor who's supporting the students um, and plugging into schools. There's been a lot of Venn diagrams happening here. Mm. I know. What? English is so underrepresented. Um, <laughs> math. OK. That, oh, very nice. So um, I think that all of these conversations here, all of these interdisciplinary, lo I, I think the word is intersections. Mm -hmm. Intersectionality. Oh, I think that that's what's happening <laughs> here. Um, and, and this conversation is going to take all of that to the next level. Dan Rosenberg, where are you? Show yourself. Show yourself. <laughs> Dan Rosenberg is the very, very brave chair of our final panel today because I've given him an impossible task, which is to explore what world tutoring looks like. So 
I sort of started talking about world tutoring. We, we launched World Tutors Day four years ago, 2nd of July. Um, you must pick up a badge before you leave, and you must celebrate World Tutors Day with us because Thank Your Tutor is something that we're really, really passionate about. This year, we're going to be running gl uh, local meetups all over the world with Yukon's help. Um, so we can make sure I'm that interested. tutors feel connected, supported, understood, part of something bigger, and part of this international new profession that we're articulating together. So um, the panel that we have now is really going to explore the boundaries, the edges of tutoring, how this global education that we are all deeply committed to looks in practice today. So we're going to gather our panelists. If I could invite you please to, um, we'll grab some stools and set you up and we're going to go straight into that session. And that's the last session of the day. So let's dig in. Jen, I'm Thank so you so day. much. I so <laughs> really appreciate it. That was lovely. Well, <laughs> Thanks guys. I'm so glad Bye. that you. Nice now we are ready. Now we are ready. Thank you for your patience. 
um, for that little okay. tech change over there. Um, it's a real pleasure to invite you today to talk about world tutoring. I am going to, again, let you do all the heavy lifting here, sure. um, but I will have a microphone and I will be able to move around the room and bring questions to the panel when you're That's ready. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Wonderful. Can everyone hear me okay like this? Yeah. Am I mic'd up? Very good. Hello and welcome everybody to this panel. I'm Dan Rosenberg. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Linky Thinks, which is an education entity that I run with my two younger brothers. And we are all about linking literacy to life skills. So just my little spiel. It's all about taking the best from the classroom or from your formal education and translating that into being able to navigate the world as a grown-up. That's me. Today, oh, I shouldn't do that. Today, <laughs> I'm joined with, by Adam Caller from Tutors International. Hello. Round of applause, please, everybody. Come on. Okay. I have Yulia Kosko from Svitlow Education. <laughs> so for the video, we've got to make out there's like 3,000 people here. I have Lucy Alexandra Spencer of Education Boutique. And I have Thomas Harley of HRB. Education. So we to come up anyway now. Wonderful. So we're going to be talking about world tutoring, education without borders. I li I'd like to think that I've got a whole load of interesting questions to ask, but I'm going to start with a really boring one, which I hope sets the scene. I don't want to rush you, but I want to ask you each in turn, you give me a short answer, and then we can go from there. So let's start with you, Adam, on the end. Adam, to you, what is world tutoring according to you? What does that mean? If I say, what's world tutoring? Yeah, so for us, I mean, I own um, Tutors International, and what we do is that we find teachers for families around the world who are looking for a full-time private teacher to join their household. So for us, that could be, we're, we're completely responding to whatever our clients ask for, but historically, or, or typ typically, it's literally everything. So I'm dealing with a, a family in London who are looking for a tutor for a three-and-a-half-year-old, and I'm also looking for a, uh, a, a inquiry that came in today, for example, from a, I'm not really sure, it's a Spanish company looking for a tutor to go to Germany to teach 20 to 30 adults, right? So it's, it's a, an enormous range anywhere in the world, anything you can imagine, not just school, adults, and, um, and I'm going to say beyond, but I don't know what comes beyond being an adult. But. Fantastic. <laughs> Julia, what about you? Um, yeah, world tutoring for me probably is about opening borders. Uh, so Spitler Education is a charity um, in the UK which um, offers free online extracurricular lessons to children in Ukraine. And it started as a quick response to the Russian aggression, the latest one. And uh, we basically are in charge of, um, well, in the last almost two years, there have been more than 2,000 children that went through our uh, lessons. And of course, because of the war in Ukraine now, or like any other conflict zone, uh, or you know other places, there's this geographical kind of deserts for tutoring or good education, and this is what we do. We open the world to children who are physically, actually, with closed borders. Lucy. Yeah. So from from my point of view, it's about a mindset. Um, so I think we think about geographically, like placing tutors in different places, um, you know, actually getting them in, in person. But actually, for me, what, how can you be global if you're a one-to-one -one teacher working with an SEN student who won't leave their bedroom because mm. they have social anxiety? It's about giving them a global mindset. And, you know, one of the things that we do at Education Boutique is we don't just... Uh, you know, support students with special educational needs. We also do um, support for teachers from fairly <coughs> marginalised countries, and we—that is the whole preface of what we do—is get them to think globally about how they, as an educator, can go into the world and actually inspire students within their own small country to see the possibilities that the globe offers us. Which I think links on massively to then not having borders in our own mindset about learning, about teaching, about education, about school. I think it just opens up, you know, really good pedagogical discussions. And Thomas? Yeah, I mean, for me, what I'd say is that, you know, we live in a society that's now so interconnected. Uh, whether we be here in London, be uh, across the pond in America, or we be in Australia, we're all very interconnected. So when we think about education, especially UK curriculums, they're all very, you know, London focused or very, you know, UK focused or European focused. And there's definitely more to the world than just what we see around us. And so from a, a global or world tutoring perspective, bringing the world to the people, whether it be learning about news that we don't see every day on the BBC, whether it be learning about events that have happened outside of our, our particular narrative, just trying to make the whole world become accessible to these kids. Mm. 
So now on to the controversies met possibly. <laughs> so this whole thing is about education without borders, whether that's geographical borders or about economic and social borders. We've got a range of different types of tutors here, me included. I, I run a business that has tutoring at the centre of our origins. However, can't we argue or can't we agree that really there are borders? If we're talking about world tutoring from Adams to Thomas's to Yulia's, we're only really beneficially affecting a small percentage of the world population of children. How do we reconcile ourselves with that? How do we make ourselves not just without borders, but as inclusive and accessible as possible? Lucy, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you. Yeah, so I think um, I totally agree with you. Um, firstly, collaboration. So it's not just about me running my own lane and doing my own business. It's about seeing how I can maybe, you know, Gaia Learning, which we've just heard from, I might see someone that in their reintegration plan that I'm putting toward, like together, they might, you know, deal with, like, you might be able to help them in a way that we can't, for example. So it's signposting and seeing the opportunities across our really vast landscape of tutoring and education. Um, I mean, also, I think then, in terms of how we look at from an educator's point of view, you know, I've done roles where I've been abroad, um, and it's it's really amazing in terms of collaborating because sometimes, as Adam will probably say, you know, you've got multiple teachers, multiple educators working with different students, and I just think that if we look at how we really like break down those borders and economics and things like that, the more we co-collaborate and more we see the links and also the funding which is my area of specialism is how we actually look to not have everything privately funded but at how we look at and, and analyze all the different types of funding out there and how we can position products to access those pieces of funding that's how we break down the borders. Mm. Julia what's your opinion on that? Uh, well, as being a charity, of course, our services are for free to children. Um, and um, But at the moment, we're exclusive to Ukraine. We would love to then maybe progress in the other conflict zones, of course, that uh, need help. Uh, our limits are in a way that uh, we are run by volunteers in the UK. So all our, our volunteers are native English speakers, which means that we don't have the capacity now to engage children whose level is not maybe at the level of understanding the native speakers. So we're looking into special funding and Ukrainian volunteers who are teachers, English specialists, uh, to offer, and we are piloting that already and very proud of the start um, of the process, but basically we are having like beginners intensive English only lessons and then they, until they're ready to join our extracurricular lessons in English to enhance English even more. Uh, but then, of course, in Ukraine and other countries, I'm sure is the case as well, there are families that don't have um, technology or don't have internet connection. So even if you provide free service, there's you know, all these limits. And it's, it's hard. It's uh, heartbreaking as well to have you know, that, that kind of disadvantage in, in some areas and others. But I, I totally agree that partnership and the communication and uh, just carrying on and knocking on different doors. It, it's not a no until it's a no. <laughs> <That's> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or if it's a no, it could change. <laughs> <laughs> Try again later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Adam, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Oh, so, um, well, I'm a very much for-profit company and um, all of our clients, I think the unique factor that joins them together is considerable wealth. And I actually have struggled with this over the years. I mean, if I'm taking an absolutely superb educator, usually from a classroom, where they're educating thousands, if not hundreds, if not thousands of children over time. And I'm taking them out of that environment and then dedicating this extraordinary educator to one child in one family somewhere. You know, how does that square with me as a, actually as a teacher, I worked in the state sector before I set my company up. So I have, I have toyed with that. I think the, one of the things to bear in mind about the kind of placements we do is that very often a child is going to inherit an enormous family that, that, you know, in the succession. So it may well be that their parents run a company with 100,000 employees, pretty much everybody in an entire town, in, in Italy, for example. And that child is going to take over the running of that company. And if my tutor can somehow make that child into a, a better person, they're going to influence and, and look after the support of hundreds of thousands of families with all of the descending benefits of all of that. So I, I think that's my, my kind of 
I take on, on the, 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 the it is an inequal, it's an unequal world, isn't it? Well, if I may press you a little, so that's the benefit of high net worth private education. I'm asking about accessibility to those who don't have that high net worth. Well, I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm struggling to defend my position on it. I know. So, um, so we, we all we, we are benefiting from. I mean, we're in a uh, from, society, from affluent I'm, people here. Yeah, I mean, I'm catering to the people who can afford to have everything they want. Thomas, sorry, I've left you till last. Yeah, time. no, I mean, to kind of build off that on our, on our, on our way, um, obviously as an individual or as a company, we only have a certain sphere of influence. You know, you can never reach everyone. But one of the ways I think about it is like, if you teach a kid, whether it be uh, geography, history, maths, but if you teach them the, the principles of, of being a good human along with that, they can then use that as a knock-on effect and then how they deal with other people then improves. And you can then try to maximize your sphere of influence through not just the person you're teaching, but giving them good qualities. They can use that to you know, change other people and so on and so on. So even if I'm only a one person uh, shop here, if I teach 10 people and they will then hope help two, three people themselves, all of a sudden I can then expand my sphere of influence and try to have a little bit more accessibility to a wider audience. Hmm. What about in terms of, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Sorry. It's all right. Um, I was hoping you'd be a little bit more combative with me. Can I just say one thing about <clears throat> what I think you were trying, is it comes down to funding because hmm. with all the will in the world, if we just had, um, so let's take the NTP, for example. That's a prime example of a piece of funding that has done really good for breaking down barriers. It, getting more students from a disadvantaged background to experience tutoring, now the funding has stopped or is stopping. Now, that now is not a sustainable way of us supporting students in, you know, to, from more disadvantaged backgrounds. So I think what we're sort of seeing here is, you know, as someone who kind of crosses all those borders, because I myself have done, you know, and still do the sort of, if you like, the legacy planning side of like the ultra high net worth industry, but then also have utilized that to bootstrap my company, which is now specializing in re reintegrating students with SEM back into schools. So the, you know, the, the capitalist versus like, you know, that kind of conversation without the without the investment, without the finances, without the understanding. And it doesn't always have to be about getting the money. It's about knowing how to access the money. We need more specialists looking at unlocking that finance. And whether that is from the private sector, whether that's understanding like the, you know, the, the state sector funding from the DfE, for example, or social care, there's so many different things that if we don't, if we don't position our services carefully to know our stakeholders, um, we're not going to do, do a good job at any of it. Mm. Thank you for saving me just then. <laughs> uh, so I have remembered my question. <laughs> so uh, I read a study that said that in 2022, 9% of all UK teachers left their jobs in teaching earlier than retirement age. Now, there are many reasons, possibly different reasons, why any of us are tutors or are in tutoring and not teaching or in, not in teaching anymore, right? I'd like to know a little bit about your reasoning going into tutoring, I know you worked in state education. Julia, I know you've got a particularly unique background, but if you wouldn't mind going one by one, explain why are we in this in, in the first place? Because I'd argue, uh, if I give you all the benefit of the doubt, it wasn't for the private education money, it was for other reasons. Let's start with you, Thomas. So for me, it's always been about education, and the reason I've never gone into mainstream schooling, I actually went straight from university to being a tutor myself, was that I actually want to educate people. The thing I don't know about, about like the school system we have is there's so much stuff around what goes on, the actual teaching time is very limited. If you've got a school day from nine till three, how much of that time are you actually teaching? Mm. Whereas I know with a tutor, if I'm, if I'm going to have a, a one hour session, I can dedicate 55, 56, 57 minutes of that to the actual tutoring. And that way I can actually help people, I feel, on a, on a, uh, a better basis. But then also for me, I do a lot of special needs as well. Same with, same with Lucy here, is that we know that obviously the smaller the group, the easier it is to, to work on a special needs basis. And therefore, I was never one particularly to go ahead and go work with that one on 20, one on 30, because mm. I want to make that difference on an individual level. 
Um, me, myself, I, I really struggled at school. Um, I had a really bad experience at mainstream schooling. And so for me, I think that's kind of pushed me towards helping people the way I know that I can best. Mm. Julia, what about you? How I got into tutoring. Yeah, where did it come from? Uh, um, well, I always wanted to be a teacher. I'm one of those people who never doubted what I want to do. And then I qualified as a primary school teacher. I worked here in the UK. And being from Ukraine and, you know, speaking Russian, there was this community of people who kept on coming to me for questions. And organically, it, it grew into um, consultations and uh, then a company, Education Consultancy, which is still uh, my bread and butter. And we uh, basically work with families who come to the UK and we help them integrate into the system from finding the school or university, tutoring and everything else. And I like, I, I, I just find cross-cultural, topics and, um, you know, just everything about cross-cultural very interesting in terms of, not you don't even have to move countries, but like uh, mixed marriages, children from mixed marriages, different, you know, I think the world is becoming smaller in that way. Um, so I think my specialism would probably be then on working with international families, understanding their background and explaining English. Um, culture, whatever I know about that, <laughs> and um, and that's how Sweet Law Education was um, possible to happen. First, Sweet Law Education was possible to happen that way because obviously, being from Ukraine, having graduated from school there, I knew the system, I knew the British system, and they had this lovely network of tutors who who worked for Educad and then volunteered, and our network grew, and um, I think just lots of wars and um, conflicts happen because of ignorance and because of not understanding cultures or languages or personal um, situations. And if we can try and teach society, children, to be more understanding, to, t to have a benefit of a doubt before judging somebody and to be open-minded about different cultures, I think lots of problems could be avoided. Oh. <laughs> Adam. How I got into tutoring. Yeah. So I was a, a school teacher um, but after seven years. Um, you know, we all know that's everything is a repeat after that. Um, and anyway, as it is, you've already repeated a lot of things. Uh, I think I taught year seven 21 times in seven years. Um, and I, you know, I just didn't want to do it anymore in a school, but I loved tutoring. I'd always done tutoring to supplement income, as a, even as an undergraduate. And that was the thing that I sort of clung to. And then and then I found myself as a full-time private tutor for a, a number of families. Um, I think I worked in Greece and Switzerland, Italy and France, and realized that that world wasn't being done very well. Mm. And that kind of spurred me to do it properly. Lucy? Yeah, so I guess I, when I was, it all stemmed back from when I was at school, I felt that school was such a strange place to me. Like, why was I in this classroom learning? Like, why was this the best place? And then when I got into the being a teacher, which I never thought would ever happen, um, I think when I was in year seven, my like geography teacher wished my mum luck raising me. <laughs> and that's like, she never lets me forget that. Um, like, when I went into teaching, I also, I just felt so like, bordered and like, you know, like constrained, basically. You've got to do this. And I, you know, I taught in Dubai. I thought that might be different. It wasn't really, it was actually a little bit more, um, you know, because in working in a private school, you've got the parent expectation and things like that. Then when I came back to um, England, I taught in a very deprived area, um, but I really, I think, engaged with the fact that what I loved was special educational needs support, spe specifically autism. Um, and what I wanted wasn't possible in the school system. And I ended up getting to the point where I was like, I just quit, you know, I'm sorry, I, I can't do this anymore. And that was because I was treading water, trying to do as much as I possibly could within this these constraints. And that's really difficult. And we touched earlier on that whole thing of trauma doesn't have to be one big event. Trauma can be lots of tiny little events. And I think as there's lots of nods around the room, you know, in terms of teachers that feel like that's why they are leaving or thinking about leaving the classroom. It's because after you've had to change yourself constantly to sort of fit in with something, it's quite tiring. Mm. And so that's how I got into tutoring. And then, you know, obviously it's been a bit of a roller coaster. I've done the, you know, the traveling tutoring, which I love and I still do today. Um, I obviously have um, the special educational needs sort of agency side of things. Um, 
and you know the consultancy side of things you know working closely with local authorities to look at actually like reintegration plans not just putting tutoring in place but how they can do better um, and so yeah I feel really lucky and privileged to be doing that because it's like all my passions and I can mm. do it in my own little way so, yeah, yeah. it seems uh, I could ask any of you in tutoring what were your trajectories and I'm sure they'd all be slightly different uh, Linky thinks our company stem originated from tutoring but my middle brother Alexander Oliver is right here uh, he became a tutor after leaving university and very quickly created Linky thinks not out of a desire to make money or to create a business, but because he wanted to be the teacher or the tutor that he never had, create the resources that he never had. And I think whilst we might have different experiences, we all have that same feeling of, if not being failed by aspects of our education system or being failed by our careers in education, we wanted to find solutions to that problem. So with that in mind, if let's say, well, I heard you, Lucy, talking before to someone outside about how you've heard so many times in the last couple of days teachers being stigmatized, teachers being criticized. And whilst we might not be classroom teachers or classroom teachers anymore, we can pinpoint that as an issue, mm. right? And we've maybe approached that by going, well, I'm not going to be a teacher anymore, I'll be a tutor. But what I want to ask you next is, what are the solutions to that problem that we now outside the classroom can actually provide? Because one could argue we're running away from the problem. Julia. Which problem exactly? The problem is that we cannot teach in a classroom anymore. We cannot. Now, the, the tutors cannot serve, unless you disagree with me, every single child on the planet who needs education. So there is a need for teachers. But how can we, outside of the classroom, provide a solution to the wider problem? Well, I can't speak for the world, but uh, it's I called guess this world is well, <laughs> 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 um, I guess like it's it's probably different way of managing it in different culture and different situation, different countries. But I I think having inspiring teachers, whether it's a tutor, because tutor is not about giving knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Tutor is a mentor, tutor is a therapist, tutor is a, a parent or an uncle or whatever. It's all together. If you have nice relationship and with the child and you know we have tutors who've been with some students for years uh, and uh, I, I am that's a different question in terms of having a long-term tutoring there has to be a reason for that rather than doing homework obviously but if there is that relationship um, then you know they they can be the inspiration to do run the company for the village or you know to become a teacher themselves in sweet law uh, something that I can speak for, uh, we are now looking into teaching our teenagers who, I think the biggest, the biggest asset of Sweet Law is the community that we have built and the mental support that our lessons offer to all the children traumatized by the war. And uh, what we're doing now is that by good example, by our amazing volunteers, and there's some online, there's Christian here, we have absolutely amazing people working with us and we are inspiring get children to give back. So we are now putting, uh, so they all want to be teaching lessons themselves now. And that, you know, we have something from math with, uh, math, fun maths, I think it's called, or something, which, uh, you know, hard to imagine for me. Uh, and we have like <laughs> Queen Band um, fan club because this particular girl loves uh, queen, so you know, we gave her that platform to spread her love to uh, you know with other children. Uh, so what we want to do is to train this um, young people to become tutors themselves, where they can work, uh, you know, and, and make a skill out of it. So I think inspiration, inspiration, and motivation is probably what we need. I mean, yes, it comes down to particular salaries in different countries, but um, it's you know also having those mentors and inspiring people around you. Probably. Fantastic. Lucy, what about you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How do you follow that? <laughs> no, I think for me it's challenging assumptions. I know I talk about this all the time, but, you know, if we challenge... Let's take a teacher who starts in the classroom, right? They are fed the wrong information. Fundamentally, you're not entering the classroom. It's like this conveyor belt. Then you become, you know, maybe a deputy head, then a head teacher. And then when you get off that conveyor belt, you feel like you failed because the whole of the curriculum and everything when you go into teaching it's like preparing you to move up this ladder you know education is not a ladder it's a web and so I think 
one problem is that actually at the beginning of an educator's journey, we are feeding them the wrong narrative. It's all about storytelling, isn't it? And actually, if we empower people to see the benefits that flexible working, tutoring, you know, even going and working in different you know, departments within a school, for example, whilst then maybe doing tutoring to help some of the students, or maybe I was talking to someone uh, yesterday about it, you know, tutoring plays a huge part of, if you think of a school trying to retain its talented teachers, you know, if they go on maternity leave, for example, and they think, actually, I'm gonna take an 18 month maternity leave, Actually, if they've been given the opportunity, maybe after nine or 10 months, they might have wanted to dabble and do a bit of tutoring for the school. Why are we not packaging up education in a better way mm -hmm. to be more accessible? And I think for me, that is just like the thing that I just can't get my head around. That, and, and I hope that we're doing some part, you know, conversations like this. It's, it's no longer teachers, tutors, or schools tutoring. It, it's not like that anymore. And if anyone is still feeding that narrative, like you have a very short shelf life because that's yeah. not the reality, you know, mm -hmm. of today. Fantastic. Thomas, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to build on that a little bit in terms of rigidity. Um, I, and I'm not one to hold my tongue, I think the curriculums we teach are outdated and really just quite bad. Um, that was I think, kind. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I think if you want to get tutors back in the classroom, there are tons of things you could do, but one thing that you could easily do is up update what we teach to be relevant to today's kids. You look at like, I mean, I, I do a lot of geography and business. You look at the geography spec and it's so dry and it's so dull that anybody's not gonna wanna keep doing it because it just sucks. So if you were to actually give people that enjoy the subject a chance to rewrite these curriculums, teach things that are happening to today's society. Mm. I mean, we, we look at case studies in geography from earthquakes and volcanoes 20, 30 years ago. But earlier this year and last year, we've had Iceland breaking up and having fissures and lava spreading across the country. No one's gonna learn that in the classroom because it's not in the spec. Mm. There is no adaptability for us to teach. And that's why I tutor, because I can take a topic and spin it in the way that I want to teach it to make it interesting to those kids. In the classroom, you'd, you'd have no chance. You'd be told, nope, this is what you're doing, this is your path, off you go. Mm. So that could be one thing we could do to actually make tutors potentially come back to teaching, mm. because as you said, that would increase our ability to help more people. Mm. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. Yeah, that was a good answer, really good answer. Adam, what about you? So. We're involved a lot in education systems around the world. We're moving people between f countries. We're inheriting children who have come from different educational systems. And I, I feel like the panel is really just focused on Britain. And maybe that's because we're British, and I, I get that bit. But those, some of these qualities that people are talking about, they exist in other countries. So in America, for example, the curriculum in the classroom is very much dictated by, or set by, and assessed by the teacher themselves. And I've seen schools really, really good schools. Um, physics was my school subject, by the way. And um, really, really good schools where there are two classes doing physics at, say, 18, because it's a, not a very popular subject at any place. And the, the, each of the two teachers in the same department of the same school, in the same school district, at the same time, is doing utterly different material. Uh, now, I don't think that actually makes any sense. But that's what happens if you have a system where the teachers get complete freedom to do what they want and encourage them to bring in whatever they want, and it, it produces a, a kind of chaos. Mm. There's a fantastic school in, in uh, Massachusetts called Phillips Exeter, where widely considered probably the best private school in the US. I once met a teacher who applied to work for me, who for 31 years has been teaching Shakespearean sonnets. Now, that's all. Mm. I mean, there's what, there's 31 of them, 14 lines each? I mean, that's it, that's the entire teaching range because in America they become so specialized and they get complete freedom. I just so I don't agree with that. I think there needs to be a national curriculum. I think the national curriculum needs to be standardized and I think people need to look at updating it. But I'm actually a little fed up with the statement of we need to change the curriculum without anyone contributing to what, right? They need to finish the sentence off. Even the fantastic Ken Robinson eloquently explains what's wrong with the system and unfortunately isn't here anymore to tell us what we can do about it, mm -hmm. right? But it's, it's very frustrating. My clients and what they're generally looking for is they're taking their children out of school or they're supplementing school because they want, they want these things. They want their children to have a global exposure. I got an inquiry from Los Angeles yesterday where, you know, the son's at a, the boy's 14, he's 
brilliant guitarist. He's at a, a, a different, you know, he's at a, a typical American prep school. They give them four hours a night of busy work every single night. And mum's like, there has to be more to life than school. That's what we want for our son. And, and that's, you know, so can we find a tutor to just change up the whole after school life experience and holidays and weekends and so on? So yeah, I, I get it, but I think teachers are leaving the classroom because, and, and honestly, I, I have to be a little bit, I don't understand exactly why. I mean, I, when I entered the classroom, I thought it was normal to have to work evenings, marking, weekends with sports, through my holidays. I don't understand, my son is at St. Paul's. I don't understand how they, they, they bombard the kids with work so the teachers don't have any marking in the holidays. I, that, I don't understand. It was a normal thing when I entered the profession that I was expected to work all of these extra hours. Has that significantly changed? Or is it just the teachers don't want to do it anymore and so they leave? I, and I don't really know if it's got any worse, but the more that leave, the harder and harder it is for the people that are there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with some of what you've said. I also apologize for pitching such a difficult question to all of you. With, again, we're all pointing at a helicopter in a tree going, yeah. something's gone wrong, but we don't know how to get out of the tree, right? But I, I would say that this, it, it is a British problem. We're here in Britain. Well, okay, for, for, I was just wondering, because I, I just listened to what so Adam was saying, and I didn't actually hear anything that was global. I heard you talk about England, and you said we only talked about England, so, and then you did the same. So I was just interested what no, point no, from that I'm I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the fact that global. in some countries, teachers are highly respected. In some countries, the level yeah. of respect for a teacher is comparable to that of a judge. I would argue that we're sitting in a country where that just isn't the case, unfortunately, yeah. and uh, apart from Yulia, the rest of us are British. We're talking. I'm British. To... <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, okay, I apologise. Right. But speaking, I know you even more. No, it's fine. <laughs> no, I, I think it's fair to point at the system in which we operate, or, or historically have operated the most. I know you've worked more internationally than me, but I would argue that if this country was like the countries you've described, you wouldn't have gone into private tutoring and um, uh, gone down that route, perhaps. And uh, I think there is a sy systemic issue. I do agree with you. But I think, as with most people, I don't have a solution to the problem. But it's uh, fun to talk about it on discussion panels, well, no, nevertheless. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We do have some participants in the room who would love Wonderful. to contribute. Wonderful. Yes, please. A solution, you. hopefully. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind coming over here so the people on the other team know exactly. That's not fun. Um, <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to push the boat even more. Um, surely there's a middle ground between we need to change. You, to be fair, you only said update the system. Um, I mean, I would, I would say overhaul the whole thing. I'll, 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 I'll take the fast stance. <laughs> and, and no, there needs to be a national curriculum. Surely what you've said about the respect for educators in other countries, that applies. That applies to what you've said about the earthquakes, for example, that happened a long time ago. If we have a core curriculum that everybody sticks to, but a much narrower one, not every student needs to learn about everything in our curriculum. I'm sure everybody could probably agree with that. Let's um, but surely if we have a court and then we respect our educators enough to give them that freedom, and that, that's what you were referring to the uh, teacher training as well. They don't get that freedom and uh, confidence Trust. building to be able to do that. So surely there's some sort of middle ground there, a smaller core curriculum, and then the respect to be able to, and the training to be able to flex and make it updated. You can teach about that earthquake, but you can also teach about Iceland, and that should still link into the exam, right? You, the, well, Thomas, that wasn't really a, a question. To sorry. Address that. <laughs> if, if it's okay, I'll go from yeah. Thomas to Adam. Thomas, if yeah, you don't mind addressing that, please. Yeah, I think I'm going to try and combine the question and what Adam said together. So Adam was holding up the American system as very, very different to ours, but he's looking at the American system from the the ultra elite from the very, very top. We've got to remember that the bottom of the American system is really quite poor. Mm -hmm. And I apologize to any American viewers if there's anybody watching, but we know that American state education at the bottom 10% is really quite bad. It's the reason why the Americans are way behind in terms of ranking tables for secondary education. Then bring it back to the, the, the question. I think, yes, 100%. You could create a specification where there is a certain level of things that have got to be taught, but with a flexibility to add your own impetus to it. I think that is definitely doable. I think what that would require is the Department of Education to completely overhaul who they use to create these specs, have actual people that are interested in helping them, and use that as a way of updating our system. I don't think we need to have a situation where you've got those two physics classes learning different things. There is definitely a middle ground, 100%. But 
if you ask for one inch, you're going to get a centimetre. I'd rather ask for the whole thing to be changed and then see what I could get from that. OK. Adam, please. Well, I'm, I'm listening to this, but I'm, I'm politely disagreeing. I mean, first of all, the state education system in the US, the, the, the national public level, is absolutely superb. The issues that cause bad education in American schools are to do with the social behaviors in the classroom of the intake of the students. The curriculum itself, though, is absolutely excellent. And any student who's been through the public school system and done everything that was asked of them, and this is true in the UK as well, I think does, I guess, a pretty good education. So I I'm, 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 I'm just don't agree with so this I, I think what we're now is doing is having opinions on things without know, presenting it's okay. evidence and sources. But, but there are, but there are but, big statements, right? Uh, sure, these, right. Are, these are now becoming big statements that we can't really back with, with sources. And uh, uh, putting myself into it, I don't necessarily agree with you at all on that. Um, but I'd also like to give Lucy an opportunity to weigh in on that, please. Yeah, so, Adam, I do agree with you about the curriculum in the sense that Firstly, the curriculum is this top-down, knowledge-based tick list, right? And do we think that there is, say for neurotypical people, something that is useful in that situation? Yes, absolutely. So I, I do agree. I think there's a, me there's a middle point. But I think conversations like this, when we say things like, oh, if we just rewrote the curriculum, coming from uh, the world that, you know, the alternative provision of the SEN world that we live in, um, wildly not helpful. Like, as in, you could rewrite the curriculum and, you know, Adam, you said there about, you know, the curriculum is good, it's about the behaviours. I mean, the SEN educator in me there is going, well, but doesn't that just show that you're in a high, you know, a high control environment, you, you need to learn this, you need to do this, and this is why we're not retaining teachers in the classroom, because they're having behavioural issues, and that's why they're leaving the classroom. But actually, if we look at everything, I think the question, or the statement that we're responding to, is perfectly valid in the sense that there needs to be two phases. There needs to be the reactive phase to, right now, we need to stick plasters on loads of stuff, because a lot of it is broken. And if we were to just look at the long term, it would, like, it, it would be chaotic, right? It would absolutely be chaotic. As much as we'd all sitting here would love that, right? So we need to stick the plasters and then we need the long term planning. And I think conversations like this are really important because we've got people from all the different areas that are putting their input in, but I think just seeing the differences and disparities between the things we think is important is why it's such a hard job. Great. You mind, since I have two microphones on here, if I weigh in also. Can I get Yulia's opinion first? Absolutely. Okay? <laughs> but I need to know, if she's going to get another round of applause, <laughs> I'm going to have, I'm, I'm going to feel very left out. We'll give you one as well. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Then, then after this, I might ask that other people throw spanners in the woods. I think well. we should. I think yeah. we need to start. We okay. need to start mixing this up a bit. Go ahead. No, I, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to add something very clever, but I think uh, <laughs> I think actually one curriculum will not fit all, and it won't fit all teaching styles. It won't fit all children's style learning styles. It won't fit all schools. So ideally, yes, there should be a structure, a skeleton, freedom to teachers uh, and trust to teachers. But in order to have lots of trust into put into teachers, there should be good training for teachers. So it's all part of, and that's why I love you guys for like doing something out of the box, you know, something unusual and combining hybrid and, you know, online and mixing and because it works, because it works for those children who are living their life, like, like quoting you, Christian, it's like we are preparing some children just for their life, for, for like next week or, you know, and that's, and like with Svitlo, you know, we are doing now something that they need immediately. They have amazing literacy levels. They have amazing knowledge. But what they need is practical um, knowledge. They need English. They need support. They need to, sh to know that people care about them. And that's the immediate kind of... I actually, I actually think that you've asked a really triggering question, and I, I a little bit want to call it out. Yeah? Oh, no. <laughs> um, the people in this room have not run away from a problem. Mm -hmm. The people in this room have responded to a problem. Mm -hmm. And then they found ways that they can come back, because we all came back into this room, right? So we, there are people who are downstairs working on stands selling hardware. Mm -hmm. They're former teachers. And instead of 
going back and finding a way to contribute. They're, 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 they've turned themselves into salespeople. The people in this room have found a different way to repurpose their teaching and learning skills and their commitment to helping children. These are not the people who are running the way. These are the people who have circled right back with a new toolkit. Yeah? So we have built ourselves up. And that's taken a lot of uh, courage, a lot of commitment. And what Lucy and I have spoken about many times, about this, this web, this climbing frame that um, Sheryl Sandberg talks about, where the career is no longer a ladder. Mm. You can move backwards, forwards, sideways. You can redirect yourself. And you can find beautiful views from every angle. There is no longer a need to commit to the classroom and be a career teacher because that's not the only way to educate. And when you tell us that we have run away from a problem, you're making the same mistake that the attendance people in my children's school are telling me when well, my child can't get to school. And they're saying, he's running away from school. And I'm telling him, you haven't made a safe space for him. Mm. Kirsten, I know you agree with me. Mm -hmm. If you don't make safe spaces, right? OK, this is getting silly now. <laughs> You're going to have to belt up. <laughs> uh, so if you don't make safe spaces, the people can't stay in the building. And more than that, the people shouldn't stay in the building, right? We all grew up in a space that taught us to be compliant. She's bursting there. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got I've got two microphones. I've got two microphones. <laughs> We grew up in a place where we were taught to be compliant. Lucy, I have a very strong memory of this conversation. In fact, in our first conversation together, mm -hmm. it is so difficult for us to reimagine education because we were raised in this system. And we're trying to imagine outside a box that we have been taught to conform in. Yeah, We're trying to imagine what's outside the fishbowl right now. And that's really, really challenging. I would suggest that we are a transition generation. And we're really just, we're stewards for helping the next generation to reimagine what education is, reimagine the place of technology. But we here are holding space for that. And we're, and we're showing up in good faith. So there's no running away here. I'd like to push back a little bit. Oh! No, no, no. no let's be fair. Wait, wait, wait. I'd like to. I don't have a microphone. I can't. All right. If you pass please the please microphone please. to our friend at Guy Learning, so she has an opportunity to say everything she wants to say in just one moment, please, if that's okay. <laughs> so, where's the ball? What I'd like to push back on is the assertion that I was claiming that anyone was actually running away from teaching, and that's what tutoring is. Yeah. What I am trying to do is trying to say and I hope you agree with me, mm -hmm. is that we've all come to this from different trip paths and trajectories. Right. I went to university to study biomedical sciences and I managed to fail a three-year degree in four years. <laughs> right? Then became an accountant and a financial advisor and a manufacturer and failed upwards many, many, many times. And somehow I'm here sitting in front of you. Right? I also didn't run away, but failed and rallied and evolved. And I think all of us are sitting here because we've evolved mm. to be here, not because we ran. However, I'd love to poke and say, could it not be said that one <laughs> ran away? And you've told me a resounding no, so thank you, please. <laughs> <laughs> if you're earning your money. <laughs> I think I so. Think you, got the way. you got the so, way. <laughs> the brand, sometimes the running away can bring us right to where we are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I do think we should all, because we're in such a safe, wonderful space, here, look at those traumas that we have faced in the education system, like full on and actually deal with them so that we don't keep getting treated like I, the doormats of education in, in a way that we keep wanting to solve the whole world's problems. And all of you up there have, like you said, we only have a sphere of influence. We, as much as I wake up every day going, we're going to change the whole world. <laughs> we can't, and we have, we will, and I have felt this bit. If in that trauma, you want to fix the whole world, but the only thing you can do in that is burn yourself out to the point where you cannot, you don't have the energy to even look after your own babies in your own space, and I have been there. So I think we take a really honest look at what we are capable of doing on our own, yeah. and... It's not, it's not about a, a fixing, but it's about recognizing, and to your point, Lucy, about the funding, this has to be respected outside. And until mm -hmm. we respect ourselves and say, no, that's, that's as far as I can go with the resources and the capacity that I have. And I need to be paid for it well enough, not so that I'm allowed to stay as like those other, the, the ed tech that 
is not positive for education. And me and Kate have an investor journey. Uh, this is a binary debate of good and bad. And um, oh, we're in here to just be good people and just like to, to give a, the charity and the free time and as much as till, till we can't give any more. We stand up in front of investors and say, you need to invest in us because we have bootstrapped this so tightly and we've given, like, yeah. you, know, you give of your own money, your own time, your own, until you can't anymore and then you can't have any impact. And that's, that is very dangerous. The writing the curriculum, just to that point, we can, like your students that are coming up with their own courses because that's fun, it meets them where they are, they're already mastering other yeah, bits yeah. of the curriculum. We're building something called Gaialytics, which is what we're raising funds for, so that we can map and celebrate that in a web that you talk about and keep the curriculum, but allow educators to go, we can do this and this and this and this and this. And I've taught billionaire families as well, and it is a, I had a <laughs> lot of trouble with it initially because I was still in that mindset of, oh, but, you know, they, is that where I should be putting my money? But I did a geography, I'm a geographer as well, so I did a case study on an island that I'd prepared and I'd done my lesson and it matched the curriculum and it was all there. And she said, oh no, we flew on our private jet, we're in another, we're on our island and we zoomed in on it and the boat had cut through the coral reef into that little bit. And she said, oh, we shouldn't do that, I'll tell dad. <laughs> and she said, oh, I now don't have a problem, I, it doesn't matter who. But we you made an impact I, I just, <laughs> on the environment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Round of applause, I'll please. Thank you very much. Very well done. <laughs> Oh, I'll tell Dad. I would, I would just if say I... one thing, though, um, just on that, is that's a little bit like what the curriculum's taught us and schools taught us, because what you were talking about there is wanting to change the world, and you're looking at the end goal, and you're seeing that step as too big a jump. So what you're doing at the moment is you're taking a small step towards you, not necessarily achieving that end goal by yourself, but a step that's going to make you feel like you're on the journey to that end goal. And I think that if the curriculum was better constructed and if it wasn't so focused on exams, I think people like you wouldn't feel that worry about how you get to such a big end goal because you'd have been conditioned from an earlier age to see that as an exciting possibility, which I know you do, but it, it's like you can't, it, it's physically not possible for one person to solve an issue like change the world. But if everyone knows what their lane is and how they can influence it and then collaborate to exacerbate that and you know, as act as a catalyst for even more change. You know, I've had some amazing conversations with you guys today and I'm already thinking, oh, we could send this student, da, 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 we could build that into the, and I think these kind of events are what help us get closer to things like that. Which makes That's us very it. proud. Can I just uh, firstly got... say, I, I, I do agree. I really appreciate your input because I think it's very, very important that we, we're all trying to champion one another here as tutors or tutoring businesses. And we, it's very easy to feel the stigma that's put upon us for not being in the classroom or not being in the classroom anymore. It's very easy to point at solution providers who, instead of teaching, are selling wares. It's very easy. But I think we can champion one another by going, well, what we are right now is a group of problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And whilst we can't look at the world, Gaia, right, the whole world itself, and go, we're going to solve that problem, we can solve what's... <laughs> She's got uh, it. Yeah. There is a Gaia goddess of the world, right, of Earth, right? Yeah, OK, if you believe in that. And I think what we're doing is we're keeping control of what we can control. And in some cases, it's one pupil at a time, and in some, it's 20 at a time. And in some, it might be high net worth individuals. And there's always going to be stigma associated with that, whether it's £30 an hour or £250,000 an hour. There'll always be a stigma. Be Adam likes that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now Don't you've got all, his please. interest. <laughs> <laughs> Articulate you can speak into the microphone so the people can hear you. I'm not uh, particularly articulate, but I want to say, I feel we're all working from the same, uh, you know, we all want the same goal. I do think there's room for the curriculum. And so a lot of teachers are very happy. They've not all left. <laughs> we're just all different. Mm. And in Adam's debate, I don't know you, Adam, but without companies like Adam's um, and bringing in these people, I couldn't afford to do as much volunteering as I do for Yulia. Mm. So it has a huge place oh, that's in beautiful. enabling 
me to do what I do. Yeah, and that's thank fantastic. You do so thank much. You. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Come on, let's have Emma, a bit more energy than that. We've not got long left. We want to do a couple more, right? Two. Two more. Okay. Um, I am circling back to Julia's comment of triggering. Um, as someone who's literally, literally just left the classroom, and Adam's point of the system works for the majority, I would have to argue that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for the majority. And that's why we're here. Because if it worked for everybody, tutors wouldn't be needed. And it doesn't work for the majority of teachers because the stats on the amount of teachers leaving the classroom is exponential these days. Like, it's not working. It's not working for our teachers. It's breaking our teachers. And it's breaking a lot of our students. And that's why we're here. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was hard to do. Thank you. Well, we've talked a lot about curriculums today, um, which could apply to the world tutoring side of things or just the British side. So if anyone's interested, I have a book recommendation. I didn't write it. I should be getting some kind of commission, but it's Natural Born Learners by Alex Beard. It's a brilliant exploration of global curriculum and, and how we could all put lessons together better. But I did want to go back to the title of this talk, Education Without Borders, an exploration of world tutoring. And I thought maybe just a nice question, I guess, to end on. Um, what do you think is possible with world tutoring? Because we've not actually kind of discussed that side of things so much. What do you think is possible with world tutoring? Thank you. Let's go from Adam first, if that's okay. Well, I mean, uh, actually everything. I mean, in, in the end, we ha I think there's a very subtle question that I'm not going to try and answer today, but I can set the question, which is what is the point of schooling? What, are we, what is it that we're trying to achieve by schooling? And then, I don't know what the answer is, but I know what it is within the context that we're involved. And I don't think that there's, um, there are borders to knowledge. I think knowledge is always good. All the things you don't know are worth gaining knowledge in. There's no way of learning absolutely everything. And I once interviewed a tutor who told me she knew all there was to know about everything. Ooh. But she didn't get the job, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, she did. That's what she said. Um, so I think... What a, there is no limit, in fact, to the value of knowledge. Julia. Uh, well, I, I completely agree from the private tutor point of view, but again, going back to Ukraine and the war and any other conflict zone or uh, any other you know, areas in need of opening up um, or being opened up to democracy uh, messages and world, it's, it's a life-changing experience in terms of what somebody who you would have never met especially online tutoring in, in our case, somebody who you would have never met, uh, like children in Ukraine don't have access to native speakers at the moment. They don't have access to alternative education. They don't even have access to their schools because it have, they have been bombed or they're all online or, or whatever reasons. So for them, it's absolutely life-changing experience. So everything can be changed, yes, for sure. It just depends on what works for you in your situation and who you have access to. Lucy. Okay, so I'm going to take a slightly different take on it. Because <laughs> world, everyone thinks of geography. But what about if world meant outside of the education sector? So for me, um, what I think world tutoring or world education should look like is a proper circle where the curriculum, there's different pathways. I think there will actually be a point where um, which I know some people be a bit controversial this, but you know businesses and large corporations will sort of explain what they think is valuable, and there will almost be pathways as you get up secondary schools, which will be sponsored by, fed into, like guaranteed jobs in the future with certain businesses, um, and I think that awareness of neurodiversity is a really big one because 80%, I, I harp on about this, but it's just shocking to me, 80% of autistic adults are unemployed. So for me, if we as a world are doing a good job of tutoring and education, and technically tutoring means personalized learning, right? So if we say world personalized learning, it should be that everybody, no matter what your you know, economic status is when, when you're born, what your, you know, your learning difficulties, your learning dif differences, whatever your profile, that you have a pathway through life where you can thrive. 
And that is not just solved by education. Mm. It's solved by everybody, like the village, as we talk about. And I think that is quite important because I think when we say world, we think geography, but actually we think we need to think everybody in the world. Mm. Amazing. Thomas? I feel like three of the big topics have been taken already. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, you know, we will, we will experience this as, as adults. You know, life is tough, life is confusing, we don't feel prepared for life. I think with world tutoring, if, if we could get to a situation where we give these, these children, these students, an easier transition into the next phase of their life, whether it be preparing them through education or life skills or whatever it, be, it may be, just us ensuring that the next generation has a better position to move on from and grow from, mm. whether it be you know, tackling great big problems to just finding easier to file a self-assessment tax return, whatever it may be, we just want them to be more prepared for the future. Mm. Um, and hopefully with every generation from that, we can build and build and build until all of a sudden tr transitioning from being a student to being an adult doesn't seem scary. Mm. I think one thing that many people have an issue with, or not having an issue with, uh, get wrong, is they imagine that schooling and learning is just about the acquiring of knowledge. Mm. Now you mentioned about the, the, the curriculum being focused on knowledge building, not skills building. Exams, if let's say we br bring on an 11 plus tutor, you bring them on so your kid passes their 11 plus. They're just learning things, but not learning the skills to communicate what they have learned. Well, then they're going to fail. Or let's say you have um, a private school exam or a university series of exams and every pupil who goes for 10 places, let's say a thousand pupils, all get the same grades. Who's going to get access to that next level? Well, it's gonna be those children who have learned or those students who have learned additional life skills, communication skills, professional and social literacy skills, critical thinking skills as well, which I think tutors are best served to help with. And hopefully that'll change as time goes on. Thank you, everybody. I think we're out of time. Please can I have a round of applause for Adam, Julia, Lucy, and Thomas, and, and of Dan. course, Julia and Odette, <laughs> and everyone at Qualified Tutor. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for running the most complicated panel. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> um, I knew I could rely on you to be appropriately mischievous um, and throw us some curveballs. Thank you. I do feel that we have only just opened this conversation and I would love to explore this further with each of you because um, what I think is that we've just nudged the edges of the geography, of the different learner types, of the different stakeholders um, of learning that goes way beyond 18 and way beyond the, 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 the borders of the classroom. But the theme that you and I really pulled out that did come out in this conversation was that every child needs a mentor. Every child needs a trusted adult who is there for them. And this generation, more than ever, we need to show up and be that person. And that's who we are in this room. So whatever that looks like for you, I would love to congratulate you. This is the end of the second day of Love Tutoring at BET. And I think you'll agree it's been interesting. It's been informative. It's been inspiring. And I look forward to welcoming you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.